history, prestige, legacy. Words synonymous with the most coveted title in chess. To be a world champion means your name, etched in the history books alongside greats of the past. Ding Lee Ren, a deserving world champion. Ding is overtaken by emotions. What a match this has been. But for eight men and eight women, it's here and it's now as the road to the World Championship goes through Toronto, Canada. Over three weeks, Chess's elite compete for their right to challenge for the crown. For some, it's a story of redemption. He knows this might be the last few moves of his World Championship. Oh my God. There's experience, there's youth, and for one nation on the rise, fortune could favor indeed. An amazing day for Indian Chess, making their way into the Canada's tournament. Only one will advance. Only one will play for it all. Watch the 2024 FIDE candidates on chess.com. Another day, another round. Some lovely views of the clear blue skies. The city of Toronto, as we see Mr. Napomnishi himself, the two-time winner, and there's Vidit signing some autographs. Not sure who that is. Some imposters making their way into the playing hall. That was, of course, Ikaru Nakamura. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to round six of the 2024 FIDE Candidates Live from Toronto, Canada. The festivities will begin in just over 10 minutes. The stakes could not be higher as the leaderboard begins to get set. And as players start to feel the pressure and the tournament moves toward concluding its first half, I'm your host, Grandmaster Daniel Meriditsky, and alongside me today, a great pleasure to welcome Grandmaster Peter Leko and Grandmaster David Howell. David, I'll start with you first. You were here yesterday. It was a long round. There were some very tough end games, some very bitter pills to swallow for some players, and a great day, a momentum-turning day for others. That's right, Dania. We were there for the long haul. We were there for all six plus hours. And uh, ultimately, just in the final few minutes of round five, we did uh, see a bit of a shakeup and what could be very important for the tournament standings uh, come the end of the event. It was Gukesh who ground out a win in a queen endgame, relying on a mistake from his opponent, Abasov. But uh, ultimately, he deserved it. He uh, worked very hard for that point and he joins the lead. Jan Nepomnishi as well. Dodged a bit of a bullet. Uh, he was up against the ropes from an early stage against Pragnananda, having been hit by an opening bomb. But uh, ultimately as well for Hikaru Nakamura, could be an event changer. He got his first win as well. Peter, uh, glad to have you back in the studio. The significance of that Pragnananda Nepo game that David mentioned could not be overstated. We were spinning one storyline uh, when we saw that incredible opening preparation. And in the snap of a moment, the Queens were off the board. And suddenly, before we knew it, uh, they shook hands and Prague didn't win. It was a draw. Were you as shocked uh, as we were at the turn of events yesterday? And what other games stood out to you? Hello, Daniel. Hello, David. Uh, welcome, everyone. Well, yesterday was a very special day, yes. Uh, you don't see very often that Jan Nepomniachi gets into such a big trouble in the battle of defense. I think there was also some statement from him that he should better repeat his lines. Well, certainly, I can imagine that his uh, seconds were going crazy during the game, uh, but he survived. It's also the, the big question how Prague will handle it. Yeah, that was a golden opportunity uh, stopping Jan, Jan's uh, run in the tournament. Gukesh's win was super important, of course, because he had many chances. Uh, he missed some of them, but eventually he ground out that very important win and he's sharing the lead with uh, Jan. And of course, as you highlighted, Hikaru winning that game will set him in the right, right mood that uh, he will start enjoying life. Yeah, he will just be enjoying the tournament. And normally when you start enjoying the tournament, that's when you get the most dangerous. Yeah, Hikaru, <clears throat> he's broken the ice. He's gotten that first win. He's back to 50%, and with how tight uh, the standings, how tightly they're packed, uh, that's a hugely significant win with the Black Pieces, but he's got some very challenging matchups ahead. Um, but we have a lovely recap video just to summarize the key events from round five yesterday. It was a seven-hour round or so, and I had so much fun commentating, so I can't wait to relive it. Let's roll the tapes on the round five recap video. 
It's a big day today. The players are well rested. Of course, knight f7. Double exclamation mark from the computer. And he's played the immediate knight c5 without taking on h2, which is an understandable Oops. decision. G4 on the board. Jan is relieved, I think, to have this endgame in the first place and more motivated, I think, uh, now to save the game. He comes back to e5, I guess. Hold it, Judah. Objectively, at least, this might be a mistake. Queen takes b3, bishop b2, f6. The queen can drop back to c3, but that end game, I cannot possibly see Vidit. Maybe he goes for that emotionally. Queen a4 on the board, and I think he's going to have to come to terms and pull out half a point out of this mess. Ooh. Uh-oh. Oh, uh -oh. king. Apparently a mistake. Five. Has played Based king, king f5. f5. Oof. Back to a draw. Wow, Sorry. and he gives a check. He doesn't find the draw. Oh, queen e5, and he's going to move the king with check and force the queen yeah. trade. Wow. Kukesh gets up. He knows it. Gets up with one minute and 30 seconds. <laughs> and Abasov just realizing the problem. You can see it on his face there. What a disaster for Abasov. Five seconds on the clock. Got to make a move. Three seconds, two. Okay, that. And he's made it. He's taken on d3. He's losing. He's blundered. Oh, my God. That's it. G3 and the game is over. He just forgot he's walking into a night fork. It's unstoppable. Candidates. Wow. It just always brings out these unexpected uh, moves, results. I must admit, I didn't see knight to f5. Well, it doesn't now, like her last like, move. The momentum was just slipping away from her. All four games have finished in a draw. No, I think the story is, if we take a look at Prognananda there, uh, getting set up for the next game, the story that, that really encapsulates uh, the many twists and turns that we were witness to yesterday, we were trying to predict the amount of decisive results with David, uh, Judith, and myself. We had predictions ranging from, I think, two, three, I predicted one. And at various points in the broadcast, at one point, we were convinced there would be zero uh, decisive results. Then, wait a second, there might actually be three. No, there is going to be two. And in the end, we actually did have two Gukesh won. Uh, and of course, Ikara Nakamura defeated Ali Reza with the black pieces. You can see the standings there. Uh, it was a crazy day, uh, David, where emotions ran so high in every hour, featured different heroes, different smiling players and different frowning players. And in the end, it's Hikaru and Gukesh who get to keep that smile going into today. Yeah, Dania, that's why we were all excited about this tournament and we're getting used to it now. Every day it's a roller coaster, it's up and down, it's topsy turvy. Um, it's really the nerves uh, kind of clearly visible in the players, on their faces, in their moves. And uh, yeah, it has brought some real shocks. I mean, I've been loving the opening battles, but uh, from there it's only uh, kind of getting more spicy as we reach move 40. It feels like the players as well still adapting to this time control without increment. Um, so yeah, it's all of those things together are the perfect ingredients for what's been a really exciting tournament. Well, speaking of the perfect ingredients for an exciting tournament, speaking of bringing smiles to our faces, one man uh, who is a necessary component of every exciting tournament, Bond Master Mike. Mike Klein is on scene in Toronto, taking the temperature, telling us all about the players' mindsets going into this very important round. So let's go over to FIDE Master Mike Klein over in Toronto with his excellent reporting. Go ahead, Mike. The floor is yours. Thanks, guys. After a huge day of nearly six hours of chess yesterday, we arrive at round six, and the statistical pundits have Jan Nepomnishi and Fabiano Caruana in nearly a dead heat tie for who is going to win this thing. Those two will line up today. Jan Nepomnishi enjoying, of course, a half-point lead over Fabiano. Unfortunately, 12 of their 14 lifetime encounters have ended in a draw. We will see if one of them can break that spell today. The Dark Horse is becoming Grandmaster Gukesh, who won a really long Queen and Pawn endgame yesterday. He will play against Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura, who also won using a late endgame trick. That's going to be quite a battle. What about a couple of people that need to right the ship? Grandmaster Vidette came off two losses and nearly righted the ship yesterday with a win, but he couldn't quite find his way against Fabiano Caruana. He was inconsolable both after the round and in the car ride back to the hotel. He's going to play another wounded warrior, Grandmaster Ali Reza Faruja, who is tied for last. Something has to give there. One of them will hope to correct their tournament. Over in the ladies section, Tanjong Yi is still our leader. She still has not lost a game. She's going to get white against Grandmaster 
Grandmaster Ana Musichuk. They've played a bunch of games in their career. Ana has had three enjoyable positions in the last three rounds, but not able to convert any of them. We will see if she can score her first win and bring Ten John Yi's incredible score back to earth. That's the action from round six. Now back to you in the studio. Ooh. Thank you so much, Mike Klein, for your incredible reporting as we take a look at the pairings there. Uh, Peter, again, it's a day of contrasting emotions. Gukesh and Hikaru, two players who are feeling very positive. Hikaru has the second black in a row. And look at Vidit versus Ali Reza. Vidit, of course, also very, very disappointed. A third tough game in a row as he fails to convert a winning position against Fabiano Caruana. So much to manage, including the actual fatigue of the tournament for these players going into the sixth round. Yes, and there is also this very interesting narrative, yeah, that uh, Gukesh had the white pieces yesterday, Hikaru had the black pieces, and now again, the players are having exactly the same color, yeah, this is a very special kind of feature which is uh, only happening when it's a double round robin tournament, and the same applies, I think, to, to Vidit, who is now also doubling with the white, playing against Ali Reza Filuja, there we see Hikaru Nakamura after his fantastic phenomenal win yesterday, he will be waiting and looking forward to some more blood, I believe. Yeah, definitely. David, blood, that's the word that's on all our minds. We want to see blood as we're four minutes away, uh, three minutes and change that is away from a handshakes in the start of this round. Of course, Jan versus Fabi, big game as well. They've made a million draws in their head-to-head -head encounter, but that doesn't tell us anything about this particular game. I think we're all excited uh, for these matchups. Yeah, definitely. And uh, some fascinating kind of side kind of storylines here behind some of the matches. Three uh, matches, we actually haven't seen too much experience between the players, only a handful of games uh, head to head in their history. But of course, um, the big one, Jan Napomnishi against Fabiano Caruana. And here I want to ask Peter, I mean, you know Jan extremely well. Uh, how much risk do you think he's going to take um, in such an important game against one of the other favorites? Well, I think... Well, yeah, this... Oh, go ahead, Peter. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, who you were asking. Yeah, I don't know what to say. Yeah, because okay, I think everybody knows that I have been involved with Jan for the last two tournaments, uh, but uh, now I'm not involved. Yeah, so but still, I feel like I don't want to reveal too many secrets. Yeah, because this is always a very personal matter. It's uh, clear that Fabiano is a very dangerous opponent who is brilliant in uh, opening preparation, and I do believe that Fabi will not be repeating his lines. Uh, what he has been playing, what he did he play e4, c5, knight fc, knight c6, and bishop b5, knight f6. I not see that appear on the board today. Fair enough. And uh, we are only two minutes from the start of the games. Uh, just enough time for me to remind you uh, to vote on today's outcome of each game. We've had some great uh, turnout. There is a $250 chessable course voucher. Um, at stake, as well as many other chessable uh, vouchers, diamond memberships, plenty of prizes across both sections. Really easy to do. Exclaim vote in the chat to get involved. Make sure to put in your votes before the games begin. We want to see maximum fan engagement during the shows, but also outside of the shows. Many prizes being contested and a lot at stake here in round six of the 2024 FIDE candidates. We thank everybody in the chat for, jo for joining us. Uh, for the start uh, of these big games. Uh, Peter, these, this moment, we always highlight this moment one minute before the start, maximum anxiety for the players. They just can't wait to see what uh, their opponents have brought from their home cooking laboratories. Exactly. Yeah, I think that uh, this is the quiet before the storm. The players are sitting there. Seemingly nothing is happening, but so many thoughts are crossing the minds of the players. Yeah, they exactly know that the opponent is coming very well prepared. Who will be able to put his will on the opponent? That's always the very big question before the game. And uh, to my eyes, Pragnananda has been one of the most impressive players in terms of preparation, just the creative ideas. He has white against Abasov, uh, so a big game for Pragnananda. He'll be aiming to win. Here we see the handshakes, though, and the clocks have started. We see no moves yet. Okay, Jan Nepomnishi has made the first move against Fabiano. Vidit, as usual, meditating before making his first move. And uh, it looks like Pragnananda as well, pausing. Uh, before making a decision 
interesting that all the three Indian players here, starting with White, and none of them have made the move until that moment. Gukash beginning against Nakamura. Uh, just a bit of hesitation there. Yeah, in the early going, it does seem like Jan might be managing his risk. We, we have a Four Knights game, uh, but obviously, yes, and a Four Knights scotch from Jan Nepomnishi, which is widely considered to be uh, an opening that you play against E4, E5 if you want to manage your risk. But of course, we should wait uh, for more moves to appear on the board. We know that Hikaru Nakamura defeated Fabiano Caruana with white in the four night scotch. So this could equally as likely be a very ambitious weapon and the precursor to some very dangerous preparation. And a Sicilian, a Sicilian in the top right between Vidit and Ferruja, a Sicilian in the top left, but a very special Sicilian, Peter. E4, C5, Knight F3, G6. I believe this is called the Hyper Accelerated Dragon. Yes, <clears throat> now White has many opportunities. Yeah, White can play the move C3. It's one of my favorite uh, moves, just uh, avoiding the Marozzi bind because after G6 also, White can opt for the Marozzi structure with D4, C takes D4, Knight takes D4, Bishop G7, C4. That's the structure we are talking about when we speak about the Marozzi bind. But now Gukesh has to make up his mind. Certainly he couldn't have been expecting the move g6 from hikaru but uh, if i would be playing from the white side i would be very happy because after g6 there is simply no pressure on white's position and i feel like you can just uh, can simply play chess yeah you, you don't need to remember millions of computer lines here wow exotic sicilian number two david from mr nakamura <laughs> that's right in round one he played a slightly offbeat Slightly suspicious, slightly dubious uh, variation of the Sicilian uh, against Caruana. Uh, he ended up suffering Nakamura, but eventually escaped with a draw. And this time he goes back to the uh, Hyper Accelerated Dragon. He did actually employ this um, in the Grand Swiss last year, Nakamura, the event from which he qualified for this uh, candidate's tournament. And uh, I think it was a game against Esipenko, where C3, which has just been played by Gokesh, was also essayed. Uh, so really interesting, Gokesh most likely has seen that game. Nakamura, though, happy to repeat something he's played recently. Uh, so showing real confidence in his lines. And now uh, on the top left, we see some central tension. Gokesh, does he capture a pawn? No, he pushes forward. Um, so we can see a transition from uh, kind of this accelerated dragon into maybe a C3 Sicilian Alapin type uh, structure. Uh, but there's action everywhere here, Peter. There's uh, total symmetry on the bottom left of our screens. Uh, Pragnananda against Abasov, a classical Sicilian, <laughs> top right. And huh. uh, yeah, of course, the Four Knights, which is really rattling on. We're already uh, at move 10, move 11 in that one. So uh, where are your eyes drawn to, Peter? Well, clearly I'm following the game between Jan Nepomniachi and Caruana because that's where we have the most heated up action, theoretically speaking. Yeah, there are quite a lot of moves happening. And I believe also it was the line that Fabiano has already played against uh, Jan in the in the candidates tournament. I'm already mixing up all these tournaments. I have been involved uh, in in the game preparation, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm now suddenly not remembering. Was it 2022 or 2021? Uh, but certainly it already was featured. The game ended in a draw, but it was a it was a long game. Jan was putting some pressure, so it's uh, very interesting to see how. Fabiano will improve, or who will be the one improving first? And uh, temporarily in this line, white is a pawn up. Um, we'll just maybe, uh, while we have the time, while Jan thinks, his first real think of the game, uh, we'll backtrack and just show the last few moves. We mentioned, uh, Daniel mentioned it was the four knights uh, scotch here, and um, very level position, very kind of well-trodden paths. And after e takes d5, black does castle. So a pawn sacrifice, even a two pawn sacrifice if wants, if white wants to be greedy. Uh, but this isn't really recommended. Taking on c6 now is regarded as uh, too risky because the white king is stuck in the center. And uh, I don't think uh, any top players <laughs> want to touch that type of position with white. So instead, castles, bishop to g4, hitting the white queen, f3, uh, bishop h5. And uh, we see bishop to g5. Uh, I must admit, I'm not too familiar with the opening theory here. I know that uh, taking on c6 is another move, but that would allow black's queen to uh, jump into d4 with the check. And 
that would have uh, led to a different variation. But bishop g5, then, um, what do we make of this? Are either of you familiar with this position? Mm. Uh, Peter, please. <laughs> no, Danya, I think that this is your territory. Reveal us what you think of this. Well, I have a little bit of history. First of all, I'm just, I just want to compliment the diversity of openings uh, that we have today. We have this mainstream four knight scotch in this game. Uh, we have a Rouser Sozin uh, Sicilian in Ferruja's game, uh, which is reminiscent of a game played at like the 1958, you know, Port Erosion or Zonal. Um, I feel like I haven't seen that in years. Uh, and obviously, uh, we have kind of a souped up Alapin uh, in Gukesh versus Nakamura. So we're in for a fun day. As for this opening, uh, fun fact, the position after F3, Bishop H5 uh, was first played. It was played once in a 2012 correspondence game. But the first serious GM who played it over the board is Vidit. Uh, his name is the second in the database. He played it against Wei Yi in 2018. Um, and after that, this started entering the mainstream. Now, in that Wei Yi Vidit game, White played D takes C6. And I think we should show, uh, David, without getting too derailed, I think a lot of people are wondering what exactly happens if you take the pawn here. And to my knowledge, Black delivers the check on D4 and simultaneously wins back both pawns. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, King H1. Bishop takes uh, c3, bc, queen, c3, forking the subsequent uh, rook on a1 and the second pawn on c6. So um, that position has been tightly uh, debated, and I think the current consensus is that white has absolutely nothing. So a lot of players switched to the move played in the game, bishop g5, and now we follow kind of a second main line. More trades, more sacrifices, cd, takes, takes, logical, logical, knight takes d5, and no, Yana Pamnishi is not in fact blundering a knight. Uh, because after queen d4 check, king h1, the knight is untouchable uh, due to a very obscure tactic. I'm sure nobody in the chat has ever seen this before. Uh, the famous bishop takes h7 check. And for that reason, queen takes b2 and bishop c5 check are the two big moves. Uh, this position still uh, very well known. Nihal Sarin versus Vidit from 2018 also reached this position. Um, and after queen takes b2, we're going to get a very, very uh, wide open center. Kind of a nice old school street ball tactical battle. Yeah, and it looks like a bit of a choice here. Fabiano, he looks like he's played a move. Um, knight takes d5. Still the position on the board, uh, but no, queen takes b2 has just been played. So um, one of those variations you mentioned, Dania, and uh, it looks like we might see even more exchanges and white playing for the very minimum here, but uh, maybe black still with some questions to answer um, in any ensuing endgame. Um, how familiar do you think Fabi is with the nuances, the details here? Hmm. Peter, maybe you have a better take on this, but I, I just wanted to provide one more possible line which is rook b1, uh, bishop c5 check, um, king h1, and queen e5. And then white has this move f4. Um, and... Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm having some problems with the mouse there. I meant yeah, yeah, bishop no. c5. <laughs> bishop c5 <laughs> check. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you can use, we can use arrows for now while the board is, is yeah. resetting. Let's use some arrows. Not bishop c3, bishop c5, of course. Uh, king h1. Uh, okay, <laughs> ignore my arrows. <laughs> my no arrows, sorry. Rogue. We'll do it. We'll do it blindfold. We'll do it blindfold, just like in the old days. Uh, bishop c5, check king h1, uh, queen e5, and then white has this move f3, f4, and a good visualization exercise for the viewers. You, you're going to get a queen trade. That's the kind of the point that I wanted to make um, in this roundabout way. Is the queens might come off momentarily, so um, I wouldn't get too excited here, uh, Peter. And I think David's formulation of fighting for a very small edge while managing risk. That might be what Jan is doing. Well, it's sort of lightly testing. Yeah, do you remember your files, Mr. Caruana? Well, my feeling is that after that painful loss against Hikaru, uh, Fabiano made sure and his team made sure that, you know, because the point is that Fabiano is known to be such a strong theoretician yeah, and he can always play, for example, the Bishop C5 Spanish, the Dark Archangel that he has also made a brilliant chessable course on. Yeah, he's... Whenever he plays e4, e5, you have to kind of reckon with that he might go for some ultra sharp lines. And uh, that's why kind of uh, 
is, is a tempting option from the white side that you make sure that, okay, if Fabi suddenly switches to e4, e5, let me play the four knights, nothing can happen to me, and uh, we will minimize the risk. Yeah, this, this is how, this is the message that I'm getting from uh, Jan's uh, opening choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, really interesting that he pauses now here, Jan, because he could have maybe just predicted this uh, this whole line, this whole position, uh, maybe just pausing to recollect something, uh, remember something, or maybe this is a fork in the road, um, maybe just uh, mulling over his options here. But uh, very much, I think, in terms of the tournament standings, very understandable that he wants to minimize risk here. He sees Fabiano as one of his main rivals. Um, yeah, of course, a loss here with white would be disastrous. So why not take any sting out, any risk out of the position? And uh, I think we've all been there when we identify kind of the stronger players in the field and we want to uh, kind of just ensure we get out of that game with the results. And Jan, he's already racked up a couple of wins. Um, it would draw wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for him. So um, yeah, despite the quick flurry of moves, we're already at move 13. It feels like this one um, relatively peaceful for now, or at least uh, still in known waters. So uh, I'm tempted to zoom out. There we go. Back to the mm -hmm. bird's eye view where we see uh, action on the other boards as well. Actually, all of them developing a pace. All of them developing a pace. Good way to put it. Definitely the fastest pace game has sort of settled down. Um, the fitted Ferruja game moving kind of very slowly uh, into that Rouser uh, Bishop C4 Sicilian. Uh, the Gukesh Nakamura game looks like a very tense positional battle, and we have also some very interesting strategic complications in Prague Dananda versus Abbasov, and we will tackle all of that and more. Uh, we will take a quick break, and uh, after that, we will have action from the other three boards here in this pivotal sixth round of the FIDE 2024 candidates. More action when we return in just a few minutes. This April, intergenerational rivalries spill over to the chessboard. Face off against the boomers. Grapple with Gen X and the millennials. Or take on the young guns of Gen Z, Gen Alpha, and Gen Beta. And then the mighty Martin? Play them all on chess.com. Bobby, I've been looking for you everywhere. What are you doing, man? Danny, I was selling the course. For what? I was selling the chessable course. With a sign? I know the cops around here, it's okay. And someone even came up to me and they were interested. Get, get in the car, get in the car. We're, we're, we're gonna figure something else out. All right, yeah, just put the sign in the back. Can't just be flipping signs on corners, man. Dude, I, last time I spun a sign here, I got arrested. Yeah, but Danny, that's because you have a history. They did a background check on you. I thought we weren't gonna talk about that. It's out in the open now. I gotta get out of here. Get back to your sign. <laughs> Bob, what are you doing, man? Danny, the cops are after me. Tell them I went that way. You went that way, officer. That way. Then, yep.
We're back in round six of the 2024 candidates from Toronto. Some very exciting games. A lot of high stakes as the standings continue to get reshuffled. Bukesh and Nepo are in the lead, but they have some very tough challenges ahead of them. Both of them handling the white pieces against two opponents, who, uh, in Hikaru Nakamura's case, has demonstrated good form in the last couple of games, coming off a win against Ali Reza Faruja. Let's take a quick look. Well, first of all, let's take a look at Yana Pamishi and that beautiful camera angle. But that Gukesh Hikaru game, so rich, so strategically complex. I vote uh, that we continue our tour in Gukesh land. We start from the bird's eye view. We know that there is that four night scotch in Nepo versus Caruana, uh, but the both of the players have slowed down. Another Sicilian in Vidit versus Ferruja that we will take a look at in due time. But let's delve a little bit deeper because you don't get this kind of pawn structure Peter, every day of the week. I mean, you only get it on days of the week that don't, don't end in a Y. Yeah, it's a very special position. But before getting into this position, let me first apologize. Because uh, I just realized in the break that due to my mouse, my mouse interfered with David's uh, uh, skills and everything. And that's why poor David was unable to play the codec bishop c5 move in uh, Fabiano's game. So big apologies from my side there. The technical issue is solved. And I'm pretty sure that from now on, we will be in perfect hands. Uh, talking about the Hikaru game, David, I would like to ask you that did you ever see in this position? Because I highlighted that I like to react with the move C3 against G6, but this position feels quite new to me. Yeah, it's uh, new to me as well, Peter. Um, and it's clear it's preparation from Hikaru Nakamura. Um, he spent less than two minutes to get to this point. And just to rewind to mention that moment with uh, C3 being played, if we go back to this key moment, uh, we saw pawn to D5, E5 earlier. Um, the game that I mentioned from uh, Grand Swiss last year, uh, it did feature, if I remember correctly, Hikaru playing the move A6, actually to prevent White from dropping a bishop on B5. And to my eyes at the time, and even now, it looks very slow. Um, it was actually connected with a pawn sacrifice. Black just kind of ignoring this pawn dropping on C5, and the game goes on. And it's harder for White to develop in the optimal way. Bishop G4 still coming, of course. Uh, but instead, uh, Bishop, oh, sorry, Bishop G4 was played, allowing the bishop to land on B5 with a check, and knight to C6, and a quick trade. And... Yeah, I'm slightly surprised, first of all, that Gukesh kind of uh, took this moment to exchange on c6. It feels like there was no rush. Uh, maybe he saw this moment to kind of damage the black pawn structure. But uh, after castling, um, I've seen something similar uh, to answer your question, Peter, but normally it's with a pawn on d4 already. And here, Hikaru tries to take advantage of that uh, by playing the move c4. Uh, now on passant is possible if white pushes the d-pawn and uh, black would kind of recorrect his structure. I'm slightly curious what would happen after queen to a4 now. Looks like a forcing move at least, just unpinning, hitting a pawn uh, with gain of tempo. But uh, of course, Gukesh can play various other moves, b3, h3. Um, I don't know what comes to mind here. Uh, it's a rare position, uh, very unique. But uh, Daniel, I'm going to ask you, um, well... what do you think uh, is going through Gukesh's mind right now? I'm not even going to check the database because, okay, maybe there was like, one game from you know, 1996 in like the Slovakian under 14 championship. But I don't think that's going to give us too much information. It's very clear that Gukesh is uh, out of his preparation. I Not only have I never seen this position, I was already out of uh, my league after the fourth move E5. I was kind of hoping for E takes D5 because I am a full-time elephant player. Uh, David, I know you really dislike full-time elephant players. I don't know any of those. Safety numbers, safety numbers. But E5, I am less familiar with and especially this position, Hikaru's last move was a very significant one. It shows us that he is taking the opportunity to not prevent d4. I mean, d4, maybe Peter has an opinion on this, but I still think is a viable candidate move. d4 on passant, queen takes d3, is a position which has to be evaluated because the knight is unpinned. Uh, the knight from f3 can drop into d4, and that c6 pawn, of course, is a target that Hikaru has to keep uh, safely protected. But b3, as you mentioned, David, h3, I would have a very hard time here if I was in Gukesh's shoes trying to choose a candidate move because I just don't understand what the priorities are in this position. And I also don't really understand what is Black's next move? Is it Bishop G7? Is Black trying to do something special with, you know, Bishop G4 back to F5, clamping down on the D3 square? Uh, it's almost like trying to speak a foreign language, uh, which is related to English, but 
uh, you know, it's like reading Shakespeare. I understand some things, but uh, some other things I don't quite understand. So, uh, Peter, what is your uh, experience, experienced gaze telling you about this position? Well, very, very similar like yours, yeah, that I'm also a little bit lost in the ocean, yeah, that I don't know exactly which directly direction to swim, uh, where, which direction is the shore here, uh, because we are talking about this, this light squared bishop, yeah, this is a monster bishop from, from Black's perspective, and uh, clearly it would be very nice to get rid of it, but if we play a move like HC, then Black will definitely retreat the bishop to F5, and then this bishop can land on DC, that would be horrible news for white. So that's why I'm also tempted to break free with something like D3, D4. But there is also this question that David does that maybe can we try to go Queen A4? Is this a good idea attacking the C6 pawn? Or is it actually premature because black will handle it? And then we have this issue with our knight on F3. Uh, black might be stuttering, bishop takes F3. By the way, just one move before, instead of short castle, I wanted to highlight one important moment, yeah, that if white plays the move queen a4, which to my eyes looked so tempting in this moment, yeah, hitting the bishop on g4 and also attacking the pawn on c6, but I believe that black can simply answer it with queen d8 to d7 and protecting the bishop on g4 and also the pawn on c6, and that's why the idea of queen a4 does not really scare black at all. Yeah, very important point there. And uh, yeah, I think we're all struggling to get our bearings. And uh, that's not good news for Gukesh, who most likely will be spending a lot of time here to get his bearings as well, already seven and a half minutes in the tank. Um, I mean, you mentioned Queen A4 just one move earlier, Peter, but I'm also curious, maybe he'll be regretting not putting his pawn on D4 while he had the opportunity. Um, because yes, it undoubles the black pawns, but now uh, C6 still a pronounced weakness, still uh, possible to hit that uh, hit that pawn later or occupy the square in front of it potentially with a knight. Uh, I've seen similar positions, actually I've had similar positions myself with white where you want to kind of go knight bd2 next move and uh, just shore things up uh, and uh, cement things and uh, yeah, after castles instead, pawn to c4, uh, the game position, it's hard to know where to start, uh, a lot to think about, a lot of candidate moves. Uh, it feels like an opening success for Hikaru who's clearly still in book. Um, yeah, just could we see two wins in a row, Hikaru? I know that's a long way in the distance, but he's going to be feeling optimistic. It's very imbalanced and uh, uh, a lot to play for. for both. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, I think it's important to clarify that it's not the price of a move in this position is not that high. I don't think the difference between D3 and D4 or B3 is that huge. And by the way, we do see D3 uh, by Gukesh, which I think is a slightly forcing version, more forcing version. Uh, of the move d4, so we will likely see this trade on d3, also depriving Kikaru of the ability to uh, capture on Passant, which would have made its way into the recap video. So uh, smart uh, six head thinking by Gukesh. And after the trade on d3, my question would be, okay, let's say Hikaru Fianchetto's his bishop on g7, Gukesh develops his bishop to f4. From a positional standpoint, uh, we should not be blind to the deficiencies of Black's pawn structure on the queen side. You know, that pawn on c6, maybe the knight from b1 uh, in kind of typical positional fashion, cliche positional fashion, can reach b3. David, how did you know what I was about to say? Uh, you're reading my mind. Uh, I, how are you familiar with this maneuver? I thought I invented it. But apparently the eval bar isn't a huge fan of bishop f4, and uh, maybe it's because of queen b6. Again, it's kind of hard to give a clear assessment of what both players' ideas are if you've never seen this position. But we do see the trade on d3. And uh, we will find out, Peter, uh, soon enough as Gukesh uh, recaptures the pawn. Yes, and I think that, practically speaking, playing the move d3 makes so much sense. Yeah, you want to get clarity. You want to understand where the pieces belong. And now, uh, as you highlighted, bishop f4, knight b2, knight b3, put that queen on e3, beautifully uh, controlling the dark squares is exactly what white is looking for. The big question is, is there a clever way for black to, to push the c6, c5 quickly somehow? Of course, at this moment, it looks uh, premature, but uh, maybe somehow some bishop f5 now hitting the queen before white develops that bishop to f4. Yeah, just not allowing white to get this bishop f4, queen e3 set up, for example, could be maybe an important factor. I don't know. Bishop f5, probably white simply plays queen e2 and uh, keeps everything under control. Now it's uh, all eyes on 
Hikaru and Hikaru opted for bishop takes f3. Wow. So he gives up the light square bishop voluntarily. What is this? Hmm. Bishop, yeah, Bishop Pair aficionados are not happy, myself included, but uh, I guess he's playing purely structurally here. I guess uh, in the next couple of moves, he'll play pawn to e6, just everything uh, on the, uh, all pawns at least on the light squares if possible, and then, uh, I don't know, develop his knight, maybe your move, Peter, c5. But yeah, it does feel like black's ah. significantly behind a development. Maybe the knight will come out via h6, although it feels like a bad moment to do that here. Um, yeah, it feels like he's still in preparation again. I'm expecting the move rookie one now. Um, mm. And I'm sh pretty sure black's going to block with e6 and the game goes on. Um, yeah, slightly surprising. Again, just like white earlier, an unprovoked bishop exchange for knight. But the top players, uh, they know when it's possible. And yeah, I'm, I'm, bi bi I'm kind of very biased towards the bishops. But <laughs> nice to know that uh, Hikaru plays the position as it is. Uh, he's not thinking about those long-term uh, kind of silly little details right now. He's playing very much concretely, gaining time to develop. Um, Peter, you were shocked about this decision, but what do you make uh, of what we're likely to get in the middle game now? Well, I was shocked uh, in a sense that I felt like if it's not preparation, you will never be able to make up your mind of giving up your bishop immediately, maybe after half an hour thinking, but not a tempo, that's for sure. And uh, by going bishop takes f3, Hikaru kind of signals to us all that this is part of my preparation. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, this is a reliable setup. And uh, well, it's a very intriguing middle game position because if black gets everything what he wants, e6, knight, e7, short castle, c5, knight, c6, then it will be a very ambitious setup from black side. Yeah, then black can potentially be better. So there is also certain pressure now on white to try to make the most out of the position in the next couple of moves. Otherwise, black has a very high position. Mm -hmm. I agree completely with Peter. And this particular type of structure with the white pawn on e5, it looks very impressive. Uh, but I've had uh, experience with a very similar structure. And I don't want to get derailed too much. We have some interesting developments in the other game. So maybe really quickly, David, if I could ask you to show uh, a quick line, which I think is far from identical structure, but Quite similar. In the Tarash French, which I play with the white pieces, I used to face uh, this very annoying line, and I had really bad results in this line. Yes, again, you're reading my mind somehow. Knight gf3, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight c6, bishop b5, bishop d7, knight takes c6. Nowadays, people seem to take with a pawn, but in the old days, people used to take with the bishop uh, more often. And after bishop c6, bc, the main line is c4. And here, for instance, the structure could occur in a variety of ways. But for the sake of simplicity, if black plays knight f6, the best move is queen a4. But if white pushes e5, um, I got very excited at doing that. But you see the eval bar drops down. And let's say white plays queen e2. It's not exactly the same. You can push the c4 pawn back to c3. And the bishop in these lines is generally not fianchettoed. But that doesn't really change the tenor of the position. One of the problems is that that pawn on e5 is... Uh, as much of a liability as it is a strength you're going to have to constantly babysit it and yes optically black's queen side pawn structure is not great but at the same time you've got a lot of real estate uh for your pieces to operate the black queen can come out to b6 the knight can come to c5 so if we go back to the uh live position you know comparisons can help our understanding they can also hurt our understanding uh i think you can kind of spot some of the similarities e6 knight e7 you have that semi-open b file and uh, if white doesn't keep the c5 square under lock and key, uh, and as Peter indicated, black pushes c5, you could continue that pattern of queenside expansion. So I actually am pretty uh, sympathetic to Hikaru's uh, opening setup. I think the position is probably equal objectively. But if Hikaru has really done his due diligence and understands the structure, then he's definitely off to a great start this game. Well, here I would like to jump in for a second. Uh, before handing over to David, that in my mind, Queen E2 is such an incredibly strong move. And I would like to give this move, and I want to highlight it, that it's a double exclamation mark move, because seemingly the Queen was on F3. It's the only piece which is kind of developed uh, in White's camp, and exactly this Queen moves back to E2. Why Queen E2 compared to Rook E1 or Bishop F4? And uh, I think that this shows why why we are talking and we are praising Gukesh that he is not 17 years old. No, no, he's a superstar. He feels already this incredible nuances. Queen E2 with the idea of going 
knight d2, knight f3 to get perfect harmony. Yeah, this knight belongs to f3, guarding the e5 pawn. This bishop on g7 with the fian cat taught g6, bishop g7 structure. Knowing that black will go for e6, knight e7. This knight d2, knight f3, bishop f4, eventually h4 kind of setup will be exactly what uh, white wants to get in this position. I'm very impressed by Gukesh here. Yeah, uh, completely agree. And I think that solves the mystery of why Hikaru actually played bishop takes f3. Um, again, just to backtrack, um, these are kind of really deep grandmasterly nuances, but uh, these are top uh, players, of course, and Hikaru uh, took this knight on f3 before white could play knight bd2. Uh, for example, bishop g7, maybe the knight would land on d2, as you say, Peter, and now black would be left with an awkward dilemma. For example, does he put his bishop back and risk it getting trapped uh, in the near future, for example, with a g4 type of move, or does he capture um, in this position and allow white to pretty much get similar to what we see in the game, but white would be up uh, a couple of tempi. So yeah, really small details, but they could be uh, essential later on. And if we catch up, again, current game position, double exclamation point, queen e2. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm ex still expecting e6 and something similar to that tarish line that you mentioned, Daniel, that I've got a lot of experience mm -hmm. in as well. And yeah, it, uh, white's bishop isn't necessarily the best long term if we ever reach a queenless position. I think long term black is very much uh, the happier of the two with the uh, extra central pawn here on d5. Um, so yeah, Gokesh's chances lie in the middle game and knight d2, knight f3 is probably the first step before ideally launching a kingside attack mm -hmm. uh, a bit later on. So yeah, this wow. one promising a lot later on, but uh, nice and imbalanced for now. Yeah, I mean, we're going to go back to the bird's eye view here, but um, it's so easy if you just hold the arrow key down to, to miss this moment. But I really appreciate you and, and of course, Peter pulling back the curtain on why Queenie 2 is such an important move, reaching a harmonious setup. So we will keep a close eagle eye uh, as this game leaves its opening phase and moves toward a sharp, strategic, uh, subtle middle game. But we've got other fascinating battles to keep track of. Uh, one non-fascinating battle is in the bottom right. Uh, it's still a battle that we have to keep track of, but with the queens potentially getting traded, perhaps uh, white's got the small pull in that end game. but correct me if I'm wrong, either of you feel free to disagree with me, but I don't think Fabiano is cowering in fear right now. Oh my gosh, I am <laughs> stuck in that post preparation. I might as well uh, contemplate on which move I have to resign. <laughs> Yeah, Peter, it looks uh, very drawish to me, I must admit. I try to get excited. Uh, often I am very excited by these uh, <laughs> kind of dryish positions. Uh, I mean, here he could play for 100 moves, Jan. Uh, very happily, he could keep us here for seven hours, but uh, I think the game will last uh, <laughs> nowhere near that long. Likely at some point the queens will get traded, a set of rooks might get traded later on, and uh, opposite color bishops should signal the draw. But uh, okay, I was going to ask how to guide this game towards safety. Of course, never ever trade anyone at home uh, on your opponent's terms. Don't help them. Uh, queen takes queen would have allowed the white rook to get active. Still probably a draw, but uh, why kind of help your opponent? Instead, uh, white will most likely take the black queen in the next few turns, and black will be very happy to capture back either way. First challenge for the open file. Um, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Peter, predictions. Do you think we'll see a handshake <laughs> in the next <laughs> 15, 20 minutes? Uh, yes, <clears throat> I think so. It's it's a fair assumption. Yeah, black. Yeah, now queen takes d6. The queens are traded. Black potentially also has the g5, g6, king, g7 setup. Just uh, getting that king out of the corner, beautifully uh, regrouping to g7. But there is even nothing to talk about. Of course, white plays g3. Everybody plays. Uh, we, we know that uh, handshake is just a matter of time. If there would be no uh, move limitation, the, the players might even just uh, shake hands already. Like this, they have to make a couple of moves. I also want to highlight that both of these players had quite a big scare yesterday. Yeah? Jan was on the ropes after this uh, crazy preparation by Prague. Uh, Jan not remembering or not knowing the lines. Uh, Fabian, on the other hand, I felt like this is this what we have seen yesterday from Fabiano is one of his weaknesses, I believe, that he is so confident and he wants to fight in every single game for victory that uh, he was taking way too much risk yesterday against Vidit and it almost backfired. So it was so logical for me to see Fabiano going E4, E5, making sure that no adventures, I don't want to provoke Jan, 
I know exactly if I give him the chance, he will use it. And he just shuts the game down very professionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, three years ago, I would have tried to hype this position up. Uh, but now I think people prefer honesty. And there's a 99% chance that this game ends in a draw. There's a funny uh, story that this position reminds me of. I, I really want to take a look at that interesting Sicilian uh, between Vidit and Ferruja. And as we flip uh, perhaps to that game uh, and to Pragnanada Abasa, which we haven't looked at yet, uh, Mikhail Tal shared a funny story, uh, which I've shared before in, in commentary. Uh, as an international master, he uh, was facing uh, the Soviet Grandmaster Ratmir Holmov in a game that he needed to draw in order to secure a Grandmaster norm. And uh, the game went along very drawish lines. Tal basically exchanged all the pieces, but Holmov was a very feared and very respected Grandmaster. And Tall knew that Holmov in the final round had to face David Bronstein, an even more respected and even more feared Grandmaster. So Tall was a bit surprised that Holmov uh, was so amenable to exchanging all the pieces. So eventually they reached an opposite colored bishop endgame with the rooks, much like the one uh, in the Caruana game. And Tall uh, looked over and said, Ratmir, would you like to make a draw? And it's a dead draw. Holmov starts thinking. Five minutes pass. And Tall says, and at this point, I'm starting to think, what am I missing here? 10 minutes pass, 15 minutes pass. He starts looking at the position more intensely. And he says, by the time 20 minutes pass, uh, he is so confident uh, that he has made a horrible, heinous blunder that he is thinking of resigning in order to save himself the embarrassment. And after 25 minutes, Holma finally stops the clocks and agrees to a draw. And Mikhail Tall looks over and says, Ratmir, I mean, you gave me a heart attack. You knew I needed a norm uh, draw for a norm. Why were you thinking for so long? And Holmov says, I wasn't thinking about this game. I was thinking of how to beat Bronstein with black in the final round. Uh, so <laughs> it's more or less a bygone conclusion as the rooks come off the board. But uh, time for us, I think, to move to some other uh, more exciting games. Perhaps that's Sicilian in Vidit Ferruja. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's uh, do just that. So let's zoom out. We're expecting a draw within. Uh, well, at least in the very near future uh, between Nepomnishi and Caruana. Um, yeah, I think we'll jump into that Sicilian on the top right of our screens uh, in a moment. But uh, just to mention Pragnananda Abasov, also very rich, very uh, complicated position strategically, uh, different pawn structures there. And uh, yeah, Kukesh against Nakamura, it's still uh, the American who is thinking in that game. So, okay, let's jump in. Uh, open Sicilian time. And... Uh, my mind is drawn to the fact that uh, just a few months ago in Vaikanze at the Tata Steel Masters, it was another open Sicilian between these two, Vidit against uh, Ferruja. That one was a night off, if I remember correctly, and uh, Ferruja very quickly sacrificed a piece, but then went wrong and Vidit with some uh, kind of nice gymnastics with his king, went on a bit of a walk, uh, cashed in his extra material a bit later on and won the game. So um, this position, very sharp, uh, I'm not the biggest Sicilian, uh, kind of open Sicilian expert at least, but to my eyes, it looks like both sides have reason to be happy. Um, the D6 pawn, though, does look very vulnerable in the near future, so I'm wondering if White can take advantage of that. Whoa. Um, Peter, Black's last move given a question mark as well. Well, I see Danya is having some questions. Danya, go ahead. Uh, I totally defer to you, Peter, but I just uh, got excited at this tactic. If White Castle's queenside... Um, you really don't want to play the move e6, e5. And maybe in this case, that's what Ferruja is relying on. But knight e5 is often the move that uh, is the preferable way uh, to protect the pawn because you're not afraid of the trade. But I just spotted this tactic, knight takes b5. Uh, maybe that's not the secret sauce, but I think it is. A takes b5, and now bishop takes e5, I think is a very important intermezzo. Pawn takes e5, and look at this. Bishop takes b5, check, king e7, queen b4, uh, period. Let's go home, checkmate in 17 moves. So why is e5 an undesirable move in the Sicilian? Because people in the chat might say, but in the knight or if I've seen this move played in almost every variation. But look at Black's light squared bishop. If you could shift it from b7 to e6, no problems. You could play e5, you'd be happy. But after e5, bishop g5, Peter, am I mistaken in thinking that this is not uh, my definition of a preferable Sicilian? I mean, you might end up just losing that d6 pawn Positionally, this looks awful. Well, it's uh, it's basically losing. Yeah, it's uh, almost designable territory. So it, it cannot be that he relies on the move e5. And then there is a very big question. So what happened here? How much time did he spend 
for the more Bishop B7 and maybe in order to understand how we reached here. By the way, look at, with it on the camera, he kind of senses that there is something happening in the position. Look at his body language. He's very deep in thought. And this is uh, usually an opening, uh, an indication that you think that there is something very special in the position. Yeah, and uh, you asked for a action replay, Peter, just to, to very quickly uh, talk about how we got here as Vidit plays the most natural move. Uh, he does castle queenside uh, in this position. It's the one we were expecting. Now maximum pressure on d6. Just to recap, uh, we did start with the classical Sicilian, uh, so not the knight off uh, that we saw a few months ago between them, uh, but bishop c4. Uh, actually, this move's come back into fashion recently, I've noticed. Uh, queen to b6, hitting the white knight in the center. The knight retreats. And uh, after a bit of dancing, the white bishop comes forward. The black queen goes back to d8. Uh, black losing two tempi, but arguing that the white knight on b3 isn't so well placed. Uh, here we see, um, okay, a3. I will mention that this move cost Vidit around 15, 16 minutes, pawn to a3. So clearly he's not exactly within his preparation anymore. Uh, a kind of rare variation. This is uh, prophylaxis against black ever playing the move b4. White covers the square. And uh, it feels like this is where Ferruja might have gone wrong, gone astray this early in the game. He played bishop b7 very, very quickly, almost instantly. And uh, after white castled, yeah, we're, I mean, we're slowly coming to the conclusion, or maybe very quickly coming to the conclusion that black's <laughs> in big trouble. Uh, what about queen b6, David, Peter? Queen okay. b6 here, is that an attempt? Tactics, hoping to meet. Well, it's Capture not. I, I think it's not a happy uh, choice, but it's uh, maybe the the, the move that is required. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Bishop d6, long castles. Yes. Yeah, I forgot that was legal for a second, but <laughs> yeah, much more powerful than. But uh, but after <laughs> queen b6, white can also just play a move like bishop e3. Isn't this some kind of a knight or fish? kind of structure then white is getting because where is this queen going if you go to c7 you are still stepping into some bishop takes b5 in the future so bishop e3 queen c7 f3 with the idea of bishop takes b5 is very much in the air then of course one has to think about this yeah bishop e7 bishop takes b5 i think this is uh, this is known to be simply nice for white takes takes queen moves away to b8 knight takes d6 and then we get this three pawns versus the piece, but it's not about the construction. This knight on beastly, bishop beastly, plus f3, e4 pawns together. Knight is going to c5. That's what makes uh, black's life uh, very difficult here. Yeah, this looks really nice for white. I'm also wondering if uh, after queen b6, because black's wasted so many moves. I mean, this is, what, three tempi wasted with the black queen? <laughs> Maybe you just motor on, g4, g5, uh, kind of kickstart your attack um, as quickly as possible. Looks like many tempting uh, moves. Your bishop e3 maybe first, Peter, and then just start pushing. Uh, it feels like white's way ahead compared to kind of uh, other branches, other kind of additions of this uh, this type of Sicilian. Um, wow, yeah, but sure. now even even it's difficult to talk about the position at the moment. I want to talk about Alida's situation. Yeah, this is a horrible, a total nightmare scenario. What what happens to Alida in the beginning of this uh, candy tournament? He came here with the big hope. Of, of winning it, going after the title, and now uh, he is minus two, and now he's playing with the black pieces. He clearly choosing the Rausen in order to try to fight, but seemingly backfiring, and now he's sitting there in a state of shock. The good news is that it's classical chess. Now he has time to try to, to find a solution, but maybe it's a bit too late. Yeah, I, I'm not liking his position at all. Hmm. Yeah. When it rains, it pours, right, Dania? It's uh, sometimes mm -hmm. tough when you're, uh, I mean, it's early in the tournament, but he knows he needs to kind of streak a few wins together and taking big risks to do so. But often that just often leads to kind of uh, more punishment if you're not in form, if you provoke the opponents at this level. Yeah, I mean, I personally have kind of a soft spot for Ali Reza because I think he, uh, he has dealt with some very harsh expectations and perhaps rightfully so, uh, you know, touted, for several years now is the by it's a foregone conclusion that you know he's the next world champion and you know some some chess fans really need to check themselves and understand that um not becoming a world champion does not automatically uh does not automatically consign your chess career to the dustbin of history it doesn't mean that you're a total failure it's kind of hard to become a world champion not a lot of people 
uh, in the last 10 years, not named Magnus Carlsen, have managed to do that. Uh, Ali Reza is 20 years old, for goodness sake. So uh, the idea that he's basically spending half the time in the doctor's office getting checked for arthritis. Okay, let's let's all take a step back and realize that uh, he's got many, many more years. But there's also no no question that you know the previous candidates, now this candidates, uh, you want to avoid getting into this here we go again mode, where you start associating a tournament as important as the candidates with uh, one of uh, the worst tournaments. Uh, you know, it's it's not a good feeling. And uh, right now, Ali Reza is dealing with all those emotions uh, and dealing with, as Peter pointed out, a very, very difficult tournament situation. Another loss here would put him at minus three. And uh, climbing out of that is just uh, going to take a Herculean effort. Uh, even getting back to 50% uh, is already going to be very, very difficult. So uh, you look at this position, you start wondering, is Ali Reza on a little bit of tilt here? And uh, one little line that I would like to discuss, yeah, and I think probably also for our audience, it's interesting because knight e5 is clearly the move in the spirit. Knight e5 and after knight x b5, if, yeah, wow, okay, queen b6 played, okay. It's kind of a desperado move. It's it's not a happy choice, but probably others are understood that there is nothing else. I just want to highlight that after knight e5, we talked about knight x b5, and we should at least be addressing the move knight x e4 because black can capture that pawn with a tempo, knight takes e4 hitting the queen on d2. I believe the problem is probably that white has the move queen b4. Yeah, putting more pressure on black's position. And that's why it backfires. Look at this pin along the d5, bishop takes e5 is a big threat. The knight on b5 is still taboo. So that's the problem, but I felt like, okay, we, we should at least highlight this. Yeah, too many loose pieces in Black's camp, no development, and uh, loose bishop as well, loose knight, as you say, Peter, this looks uh, beautiful for white, so rightly avoided by Ferusha, he finds a clever move, queen b6. Um, yeah, maybe we're being too fatalistic about this position, it's still early days, of course. Um, Vidit looking away, uh, we mentioned a few moves, bishop e3, g4, I'm sure any Sicilian you want to play the move king b1, but maybe there's something a bit more productive to do uh, in the meantime. Black's never really threatening, we should mention. Uh, to take this pawn on f2, it feels like that would backfire badly. Um, so, yeah, what what do you think is going through Vidit's mind? Is it just uh, kind of pure calculation? Is he getting excited by the fact that he knows Black's burned a bit of time? After all, the Black Queen was actually on this square six moves ago. Uh, <laughs> so she's done a bit of a dance between d8 and b6. Um, yeah, what's he thinking? How's he going to try and punish for here? My vote is g4, Peter. Bishop e3 also looks great, but I, I like the immediate g4 because it combines, it opens up a new theater of problems for black on the king's side. Well, let's just highlight one thing, and I think it's a very nice line that after g4, black would love to play knight e5 in order to meet g5 with knight fd7, but knight e5 runs into bishop takes e5. Yes, this would be <clears throat> kind of maybe doable, but bishop e5, d takes e5, g5 wins on the spot. Yeah, if the knight moves, then white checkmates on d7 with the queen. Um, yeah, tactically, it's just, it feels like everything we're looking at just about works in white's favor. And um, in such a sharp opening like the Sicilian, uh, often that's a bad sign. Um, often these small tactics, they add up and uh, eventually things will come to life. Someone will be forced to go down the concrete roads. And um, yeah, it just feels like white's slightly ahead in all of these races. So Good news for Vidit fans, at least for now, uh, but he is 25 minutes behind on the clock. It's been a bit of a theme throughout this candidate's tournament, especially the last three, four rounds for Vidit, big time trouble. And uh, that has resulted in some uh, maybe subpar decisions. Um, yeah, so it could come back to haunt him, especially uh, since it's so early, he just moved 12 now. But uh, yeah, maybe uh, a moment where he'll go into the tank again and maybe a moment for us to zoom out and check in on the only other game that we haven't explored so far. Um, that is the game on our bottom left, uh, on the bottom left of our screens between Pragnananda and Abbasov. Um, yeah, I think uh, all the other games we've gone into quite a lot of detail on, but that one, um, still early days, of course, but uh, very rich, uh, very kind of sharp uh, in terms of strategy here. So let's jump right in and see whether Pragnananda can bounce back from the disappointment <laughs> of not converting yesterday. Um, at first glance, I'm going to ask both of you, whose position do you think is easier to play? Uh, Pragnananda's or Abbasov's? 
Well, I'm a fan of White's position, yeah, because this knight on a4 with the pawn structure a3, b4, d4, uh, White is eyeing for that c5 square, yeah, beautifully highlighted by David. But in order to understand what really happened here, I think let's go back to the very start because we even missed out on the first move in this game. Let's take a move pen move approach. Let's do that. Uh, we started with d4, the only d4 of this round uh, in the candidates tournament. And okay, a queen's gambit, which was declined. And here we saw black aim for the tarash, the semi tarash. Uh, but white said, okay, no captures, no um, kind of clarification in the center. White plays e3. We see a symmetrical variation. And I must admit, one I'm not very familiar with. Uh, I know b3 um, is a move, but um, at the top level, at least most players, they kind of take on c5. Sometimes they take on d5. Uh, but b3 keeps maximum tension, which was finally broken by Abasov. And we see pawn to c5. And yeah, actually, when I first saw the middle game, I thought I just kind of assumed it had come from a Slav because we see very similar pawn structures appear there. Uh, I'm reminded of a game in the World Championship between Gelfand and Anand um, huh. where, <laughs> where we saw a similar wow. structure. But uh, ultimately, this is the position we're left with. Sorry, David, to cut you off. You mentioned Gelfand's name. It's crazy. We're on the same wavelength today. But the position after, sorry to make you rewind again, uh, instead of 10, queen takes b6. According to my uh, database, the actual novelty was 1194. But in the game, Gelf on Kramnik, um, 1994, candidates semifinal match. The irony of that. Uh, Kramnik played a, an interesting alternative to queen takes b6. He played the move knight to d7. And they got a completely different structure because Gelf on played bishop d3. And now Vladimir played a5 to prevent b4. In the end, Gelfand won a very nice positional game. Uh, so queen takes b6 is the more straightforward uh, approach. But clearly, Kramnik was precisely, I think, P Peter worried about this expansion on the queen side where white, uh, white develops the vice-like grip on uh, the c5 square. But uh, instead, Castle's king side was played once in a game between two IMs. And after 94, we're in completely fresh territory. <clears throat> I very much like how, David, you also had exactly the same thoughts like uh, myself and looking at this position. Also, immediately I had this deja vu feeling and probably Vichy is very angry with us that, come on, guys, forget that game that was wonderfully played uh, by Gelfand. <clears throat> but certainly, again, Vichy wants to erase from his memory. If, if any of you don't know what we are talking about, please check out that game. And that's where that World Championship match really got heated up. And then we saw some incredible fighting match there between these two extraordinary players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similar structure, that game back in uh, 2012. Wow, feels like a long time ago. Were these youngsters even born back then? <laughs> I think uh, most of them were. But um, yeah, at least uh, in that game as well, very similar structure, at least in the center. White does have an isolated pawn. Some viewers at home might be wondering, you know, why are we so excited about White's position? This is a very weak pawn long term. And yes, it is. But for now, it's kind of, uh, it's got ample uh, protection. And it's actually all about outposts. White has a bit more space. I'm not sure what to expect here. I'm assuming a white uh, bishop will land on e3 just to shore up the center. Uh, Rook will mm -hmm. come to c1. And yeah, at the right moment, the white will, the white knight will jump. I don't think you need to rush. Uh, Black does also possess a pretty bad piece, at least for now. Um, this bishop struggles to get into the game. Um, so yeah, it definitely feels like white has the ideas, the pawn breaks. I'm not sure exactly what black's next move is. Uh, black would love to break out, but e5 feels very double-edged, very risky. Tactically, it might never work. Um, so yeah, Pragnananda, uh, it feels like he's got what he wanted uh, in an imbalanced position against the lowest rated player in the field, uh, with white. He hasn't sacrificed a pawn. I'm used to Prag doing that every round in this candidates tournament, but, uh, why not get an imbalanced position, uh, with level material? Uh, it looks very nice for white to me. Um, Dania, I think uh, we're all preferring white here, but Abasov, um, he shouldn't be too stressed, I guess. Still early days. Oh, I mean, bishop e3 I like, and maybe knight e7, knight f5 can be tried, but even if the knight gets to f5, Peter, I think you have a thought on this position. I'm, I'm with both of you. B bishop e3, knight c5, bishop e2 to d3 at some point to evict the knight from e4. 
I think very clear ways for white to keep, uh, uh, keep increasing the pressure bit, uh, step by step. Yeah, I perfectly agree. I also feel like this Bishop EC in 97 is the critical move because black is then also trying to go knight f5, but also very importantly, some bishop d7, bishop fb5 ideas could be in the position because this bishop on c8 is such a headache for black. If black would be able to eliminate that bishop or trade the light square bishops, then immediately we would be uh, probably claiming that black is the one who can be better in long term. So yes, I'm very much enjoying white's position at the moment, but I also acknowledge that white has to be very precise in order to maintain that uh, edge. Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, I guess, not too much to calculate. Uh, just some of these forcing lines, maybe if uh, Bishop e3, knight e7 does happen. He's just trying to look into the future prag, trying to choose the best squares for his pieces. Um, we'd love to post this bishop up on f4, but unfortunately, moves like g3 look a bit odd. Um, yeah, I'm expecting maybe if bishop b2 has something to kind of say for it. The bishop doesn't normally look belong on b2, but um, at least it won't get hit when the black knight comes around. 2f5. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Prague, it does does feel like a must-win game, uh, actually, I would say for him in terms of the tournament standings, especially after yesterday where he let he kind of left uh, half a point on the board, especially against one of the uh, biggest rivals uh, for the candidate's crown. Um, so yeah, he's going to be putting a lot of pressure on himself, but um, important not to get too carried away. So yeah, looks like a, a nice kind of steady advantage for white, but yeah, early days, as I keep mentioning, <laughs> not sure uh, how happy Abasov is feeling, especially after yesterday, six and a half hours, I think it was, uh, defeat. How difficult is it, Peter, to come back from uh, a result like that? Yeah, very difficult. And also because he put up some heroic resistance, yeah, it looked like, uh, yes, okay, Queen Endgame's being pawned down, it's always total hell, yeah, because you know exactly that it might be throwish, but your opponent can play on forever. And uh, this kind of things, especially with this time control, yeah, with the 30 seconds increment and the players are finally running out of time, it's inevitable that you're going to make a mistake, yeah, and who, who makes the final mistake loses the game. That's the advantage when you are pawned up. Because if you make a mistake, then your opponent might survive the game. But if you are defending, you make a mistake that will cost you the game almost certainly. And uh, that was such a big win for Gukesh. It, it changes everything. And uh, of course, for Abasov, he's now minus two. In this regard, then also his tournament strategy looks uh, very unfortunate. Yeah, that with the white pieces, he was so far playing for safety making sure that uh, he's not losing the white pieces, but he did lose both of his black games. So this might also uh, force him to be more aggressive from the white side, which, however, will also give his opponent uh, opponents more chances than with the black pieces against him. So there's a certain dynamic that we are seeing now developing here in Abasov's games. That was a great insight, Peter. I think Abasov... Uh, has a difficult task as the lowest rated player. We'll keep following his progress as well as the progress uh, on all four boards of the 2024 candidates. All games still ongoing. Likely a draw uh, is imminent between Yana Pomnishi, one of the tournament leaders, and Fabiano Caruana, the top seed. But we will keep you abreast of all the action on all of the boards. It's time for a short break. When we come back, the second hour begins in round six of the 2024 candidates. Stay tuned.
I'm here with Magnus Carlsen, world number one and to many greatest chess player of all time. We're going to ask him a few questions. I'm going to name a sport. You have to tell me the greatest of all time. Mm -hmm. Sounds good? Yeah. Basketball. LeBron James. Soccer. Messi. I agree with both. Baseball. Barry Bonds. What did he say? <laughs> okay. <laughs> football like American football. Tom Brady, I guess. Okay, yeah, good one. Uh, tennis. Djokovic. Golf. Tiger. Fair. Poker. Doug Brunson. That's a unique one. Chess. Gary Kasparov. Are you allowed to say yourself? I don't know if I'm allowed, but I think Gary's the best of all time stuff. Chess boxing. <laughs> I'm on Hamilton. I agree. We're going to play this or that. Would you rather go on a cruise or a road trip? Road trip. Comedy or thriller? Comedy. Coffee or tea? Tea, but only slightly. Preferably neither. How do you get energized? The sun. Cats or dogs? Cats. But I like dogs too. It's like a, this or that is a little bit tough with you. You like everything. Shower or bath? Oh, shower for sure. Okay. I don't have the patience to take bath. Are you a morning person or a night owl? Night owl for sure. Would you rather get on a phone call or text message? Text probably. I feel like the answer for you is neither. I feel like it's just- Usually yes. <laughs> just, just go. Sunrise or sunset? Sunrise. Winter or summer? Summer. How many beers would it take for you to drink for me to beat you in a classical chess game? That's a very difficult question because uh, I'd probably sober up during the game, so I'd probably have to keep drinking. Probably start with 20 and take it from there. 20, okay. How, what's the size of the cup? Um, pints. Wow, okay, 20. Name your price if you have to chess box. Um, $10 million. Do you prefer to play chess on a computer, over the board, or on your phone? I rarely play on my phone. I, I would say I prefer to play on the computer. In your entire career, have you ever had a day where you went, I think this guy might be as good as me in chess? <laughs> no. Oh! Uh, well, I mean, not, 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 you know, since, not the last 10 years, for sure. Okay, has it ever been, this guy might be kind of close to me if I have a bad day? Yeah, uh, I would say Fabia at his best was um, very close in, in classical for sure. My other question was going to be, who do you think is the second best chess player in the world? So, I suppose... Yeah, I think Fabiano Corrano is the, is the second, second best player. Yeah. Thank you, Magnus, for sitting down with us and doing these rapid-fire questions. Now get out of here. Every chess player dreams of becoming world champion, but to even make it to the main stage, first they must win the candidates tournament, a grueling event played out over three weeks featuring some of the top players in the world. Eight competitors will face off in both the candidates and women's candidates. Each has qualified in a unique way, the runner-up in the previous world championship match, the top three finishers of the FIDE World Cup, the top two finishers of the FIDE Grand Swiss tournament, the winner of the FIDE circuit, or for the women's section, the top two finishers of the women's Grand Prix, and last but not least, the highest rated player in January that hasn't already qualified by other means. Both the candidates and women's candidates tournaments consist of a double round robin with classical time controls. This means there will be 14 rounds, with each player facing one another twice, once with the white pieces and once with the black. If two players are tied for first at the end of the 14 rounds, they must play a two-game tiebreaker with rapid time controls. And if more than two players are tied for first, a single round robin will be played, also with rapid time controls. Further ties will be broken by a repeat of this format with even faster time controls until there is a winner. Players will also earn prize money for their efforts, but make no mistake, they are all here for one thing and one thing only a shot at becoming part of history as the next FIDE World Champion.
nonstop action since the very first minutes of the sixth round of the 2024 FIDE candidates from Toronto, Ontario, in the country of Canada. We thank everybody for joining us on this lovely Wednesday afternoon. Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky alongside Grandmaster Peter Lecko and Grandmaster David Howell chopping it up for you uh, today in this very important round. Peter, my gosh, I'm kind of reeling at Ali Reza's game. Poor Faruja. Fidit has found G4, and it seems like Ali Reza has his back against the wall in the blink of an eye. Yes, it's a very scary position. White's moves are coming automatically, naturally, at G4, G5. The problem with the d6 pawn is still very much there because after g5, knight d7, then already the pawn can be captured on d6. Black's king is still in the center, so I don't know if I look at this position. It looks so horrible that I might even suggest the move long castle for black, which is absolutely not a happy move, but uh, it's better than to get checkmated right away. Hmm. David, any bright thoughts on how Faruja can save himself? I had this con this brief thought of playing h6 and only after h4 implementing uh, Peter's move knight e5, but maybe we should take a bit of a closer look and we have some status updates in the Gukeshi Karu game, but that one's moving a little bit more slowly. Uh, we've got the time to delve more deeply. How does Faruja generate the most practical chances in your opinion? Oof, this is very tough. And uh, I mean, on the bright side, he has a lot of time himself. I mean, we have time, he has time. He has one hour 42 uh, to try and figure out what to do next. But yeah, as uh, both of you are saying, it's just extremely difficult. Um, big threat, pawn to g5, just to put this on the board. If black kind of plays a kind of pointless move here, um, then just to show now d6 will hang because there won't be a pin along the d file and white would win a pawn, win the game. Um, so I just want to explore that one you mentioned, Daniel, really clever. Uh, pawn to h6, h4, and now. Um, the big question is whether this is a threat. So knight to e5, you're mentioning here. Um, yeah. I guess, just to show the idea, we say g5 here. Now this is no longer winning because after rook takes h1, um, there's no longer this queen d7 check. Uh, well, checkmate idea if the black knight moves, so knight d7. There is still queen d7 in. check. <laughs> it's not mate. <laughs> yeah, it's not mate. And uh, yeah, so a big, big difference, just the inclusion of these moves. It does feel like the knights are going to be hit with a lot of a kind of gain of tempo in the next few turns. I'm wondering whether you start with um, oof, bishop e3. I'm looking for some of Peter's ideas, bishop e3, and some taking on, G, uh, taking on b5 ideas. But Peter, it looks like this, at least kind of keeps black alive for now and fends off the immediate threats. Yes, exactly. H6 is a smart move. Yeah, just just tranquilo. Yeah, okay, the position looks bad, but the, in order to to be able to play the best moves, yeah, one needs to, to calm down. Yeah, that's the very first uh, thing that uh, actually I think everyone knows and has to relate to. Whenever you are in trouble, don't rush. Don't be impulsive because that will just uh, end up with more trouble. And this small little move, h7, h6, we also see in many lines, then the black look from h8 might be traded for white's look on h1. That's such a big relief for black, yeah, because then suddenly black's king will feel so much more safer. So for this reason, I'm feeling like after going h4, I would like to play the move look hg1, just to make sure that when I push g5, then, uh, so maybe, yeah, rook g one even here is, is kind of a possibility. And then try to go g5, bishop e3, f4. But at some point, maybe the e4 pawn can be hanging. Yeah, it's, of course, at the moment not. But, for example, if black plays the move rook c8, then already g5 would be met by takes takes. But here, bishop e5 takes, g5 would be winning. So rook c8 is kind of a blunder, probably, because takes takes, g5 wins on the spot. And wow, breaking news. Whoa. All Whoa. these are captured on F2. No way. I was Whoa. Oh, I was going to point this move out, David, kind of as a, <laughs> you know, the one move we know Aliraz is not going to play is queen takes F2. Wow. I, I mean, I said it earlier without calculating, just kind of a lazy offhand comment. I was like, queen takes F2, nobody's going to do that. It's just way too risky. And 
Here we see the appearance of the blue arrow. That's uh, the computer. That's not me. Uh, the computer saying that e5 now is extremely strong for white, probably the best move by a mile. But I mean, even if e5 didn't exist, it looks like uh, a move like bishop e3 would kind of kick this black queen to some terrible squares anyway. And it wouldn't be a surprise if uh, there were some knockout tactical blows where the queen uh, is unable to participate in the defense. Um, queen takes f2. Peter, not just the fact that it was played, but the fact it was played that quickly. Uh, how long did he spend? Six, seven minutes there, Faroujia, uh, on that last move. <gasps> we were talking about tilt, but I mean, this is, um, I'm going to say it, really, really reckless stuff. Um, Daniel, you've, <laughs> I heard the exclamation there. You've seen something. You've spotted a tactic. I'm, I'm so sorry, Peter. I, I want to have your take on this. I'm, I'm trying to figure out why E5 wins, and I think I might have just reached an insight, e5, de, and I think bishop e3. And the point is, again, this knight on f6 is overloaded. So if queen h4, then, of course, at a minimum, you have bishop g5, bishop takes f6, game is over. So black has to play, instead of queen h4, the move queen g2. And now I think, after queen g2, rook, ah, it's almost there, rook h, wait, rook dg1. Rook dg1, queen h3. Rogue g3, queen h4, bishop g5, queen is trapped, game is over. I think Vitted is one move away. And last thing, if e5, knight takes e5, there is bishop takes b5 check. Very important uh, detail with the discovery. Again, don't give me any credit. We see that e5 is the best move. That's the famous blue arrow by the computer. It makes it really easy. Peter? Wow, well, basically it, it just signals to me that Alyza has his nerves completely gone gone out of the way out of the way yeah he's he's not controlling his nerves at all queen takes f2 in a six seven minutes think total desperado it's like asking to be to be punished yeah e4 e5 breaking open the center and that king on e8 this knight on c6 bishop b7 combo is also famously a very scary scenario for black yeah imagine that knight being on d7 Instead of c6, there would be so much harmony in black's position. Yeah, it's uh, it's just crazy. And he opts for queen takes f2. Imagine Ali Daza would be sitting now from the white side. He says, "No way, black can play like this. I'm gonna crush him." It's it's just crazy. Oh my gosh, e5 knight d7 maybe David. I don't know what uh, is going through your head right now. Maybe that's that's a way to try to keep some intrigue on the board. Knight e4, queen b6. Yeah, I'm in love with black's position, I know. Yeah, I mean, at the minimum, white takes back on d6, actually, either way here, and probably has a big advantage. But yeah, damage control. Um, I mean, the optimism of youth is actually, as you say, like with white, I have no doubt Faroujia would play e5. Uh, he would find it, he would play it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a different kettle of fish, of course, when you're defending, and it's it's not pleasant to kind of sit and uh, have to kind of knuckle down um, just kind of play moves like h6 slowly kind of wriggle free but knight d7 you're mentioning um, I'm wondering if there's anything else in this position knight e4 bishop um, e3 also you can play again but queen h4 yeah. there and I'm struggling to find the you know the money move the move that uh, that makes the world go round can't quite figure it out it useful to play bishop e3, queen h4, bishop kind of put the bishop on g5, and I don't know, feels like some mating <laughs> ideas. Queen takes uh, d6 somewhere with the knight on e4, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, bishop takes b5 ideas in the air. Uh, I mean, it well, but the it, problem with knight d7 is that if this is the only move, and probably it is, then white gets all this attack for free. Yeah, because actually white can capture on d6 any moment when he wants the bishop from f8 can never be developed and uh, look at white's pieces all of them in the game rook hf1 will come with the tempo black's king on e8 is completely stuck if this is not losing then nothing yeah i think that's the best move peter <laughs> simplicity uh, there's a lot of beauty in it and uh, just e takes d6 i think it just e5 in general he's underestimated or kind of miscalculated uh, Faroujia, because, yeah, Dania, as you mentioned, that, that knockout blow, just bishop e3 kind of calmly dropping back, and g5 uh, ideas, queen trap ideas, everything's geez. wrong for black. Oh, brother. And I wouldn't be shocked if Vidit plays bishop e3 here. I, I, you know, I wouldn't freak out. Um, if you're a Vidit fan and we see bishop e3, I think that's the other reasonable move. 
I can't overemphasize when you know what the first move of the sequence is, how much easier it is to say, well, obviously, you know, it's, it's kind of like when I used to do uh, exam prep in college and I, I couldn't resist looking at the solution to the practice test problems. And I would look at the solution and the solution always makes perfect sense. Ah, of course I could reconstruct this if I didn't have it. But once you have data about the best move, everything becomes very clear. Vidit has a much harder task of actually uh, focusing his radar on the movie five, but it's a very findable move. I don't think there's any question that it probably is on his radar. Mm -hmm. Judging by the um, camera, Vid, Vid, it feels like there's something there. He knows there's something. He just needs to find it, Peter. Exactly. That's exactly what I wanted to say. Like, uh, Vid, it looking around a little bit uh, right and left, look at also his little bit shaking in, in his chair, signaling that he feels that, wait a second, <laughs> is it correct what I'm seeing? Am I winning? Yeah, this, the, these are the signals that we are really getting the way how Vidit is looking at the position. Mm -hmm. And his eyes, if I'm not mistaken, they're looking around the E5 square. They're looking in the center. Uh, it looks like he's calculating uh, around that area of the board. Uh, it's like you said, Dania, just uh, it's like mm -hmm. a puzzle rush phenomenon. If you know there's a tactic to find, I mean, uh, more often than not, no matter what the level, you'll find it. But uh, yeah, it's just that instincts are telling him now there's something in this position. Uh, often kind of mutual blindness where both players blunder or miss an opportunity. It's because they don't realize there's something you don't expect a 27, 2800 grandmaster to blunder. But uh, here, Quintets have to looks wrong, smells wrong. Um, so he's definitely going to spend um, a big chunk of his time with it. And uh, mm. whether he finds E5 or not, it still looks very promising for White. Yeah, Faruja sure. just uh, not his round, uh, not his tournament this far, uh, unfortunately. Uh, it's a big pity, but it looks that way. Queen takes F2. Just uh, reckless, reckless stuff. Yeah, well said, David. And just on tilt, you know, that game yesterday, we, we saw him at the end. He was inconsolable. Just, man, I can't catch a break. Uh, we were sure it was a draw. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, Hikaru unbalances the position. Alireza can't deal with his nerves. And today, you know, if Vidit had 10 minutes on his clock, okay, maybe you could make a case for this move. Vidit still has over an hour. His time management has been an issue this tournament, but an hour in this position for a super GM of Vidit's caliber. Not only should, be, should it be enough to find E5, but it should be enough to drive the point home. Shocking developments in round six, and this would be a huge win for Vidit after some frustrating results. Um, we definitely have some updates in the Gukeshi Karo game, so Peter, um, any reflections as we're watching something crazy unfold in this sixth round? Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, when David highlighted some 20, 20 minutes or 30 minutes ago that, yeah, Queen takes F2 is never a move in this type of positions, I felt like uh, David hit the nail. Yeah, it's, it just exactly explained that you just feel intuitively that Queen takes F2 can never be uh, working. And then seeing Queen takes F2 happen on the board. I, I almost have kind of tears in my eyes because I can relate to Ali Reza's mindset, yeah, that he has lost his nerves. Otherwise, just imagine what happened here. In the beginning, he played the move Queen B6, which is still theory. Then he went back Queen D8. I'm not sure if that is still theory. Then he goes Queen B6 out of desperation and he follows it up with Queen takes F2. All this together makes a very, very sad impression. It's, uh, it's, it's truly shocking. Yeah, the open Sicilian, it's all about tempo play. It's all about being dynamic. It's all about having your pieces ready for when the tactics uh, do begin. And like you say, Peter, this is his fourth move with his queen. And she's so far offside. She's also loose. Uh, hence those bishop takes b5 check ideas that Daniel was mentioning, uh, just kind of picking up the queen. Um, so yeah, everything, all of these things, they do add up. And uh, Vidit looks like a assassin right now, just pondering what to play. But his eyes are fixated on the center of the board, e5. I'm pretty sure it's on his radar. And once you see it, um, like it was for us, like we can't unsee it now. Um, mm -hmm. So if it's on his radar at all, I think he's going to find it. But uh, bishop e3, I think the fact that there are so many tempting moves might uh, be Farouche's best hope here. Uh, but I still can't get over the fact you play queen takes f2. Maybe you play it after 30 minutes of double checking variations, but to play it after six, seven minutes, yeah, that's uh, the biggest shock for me and the biggest telltale sign that. Uh, Faruja is just uh, kind of wanting to get 
out of this round. Um, didn't want to sit mm. passively defend. Um, wow. But yeah, maybe time to step away while Vidit inevitably dives deep and uh, ponders what to do next. Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on this one. I, the moment Vidit plays a move, we will update the chat. We can always come back to this game, but I think a lot of people want to have a status update on the Gukeshi Karu game where we have a lot of strategic developments. Let's start with the bird's eye view. Uh, no real updates in Anepo versus Caruana. Jan declined a rook trade earlier, but it's not because he believes he has serious winning chances, just kind of keeping his foot on the gas pedal a little bit. And uh, Prague versus Abasa, still a nice edge for white. So, Peter, um, unless I think there's any other interesting developments to reflect on, perhaps we can take a look at uh, the early middle game in Gukesh versus Nakamura. Gukesh's last move uh, was an interesting one uh, as well. C3, C4 is on the board. And Hikaru's knight is on c8. What's going on here? Well, basically, Hikaru wants to get your position, Danyad, with the knight on d7. Yeah, that knight is trying to reach uh, the d7 square. The knight moved from g8 to e7. Knight moved to c8 and is clearly aiming to get knight b6, knight d7. What did you say? White has to then babysit the e5 pawn <laughs> forever. Yeah, that, that, that was such a lovely uh, way of putting it. This is exactly what Hikaru wants to get. White is not trying to break with, with the c3, c4 move. But I do believe that black should be fine. The bishop is still also not yet developed from c1. I believe black should be able to complete development. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you rush here? I guess the debate is whether Hikaru castles, uh, or would you rush that knight over to b6 and fresher pastures like uh, d7? I'm just wondering if uh, black does for example, take the time out to castle now, whether uh, Gukesh tries to lock down that black knight. It's very risky playing a move like c5, especially while uh, black can challenge with a5, but um, at least you're arguing that this knight is misplaced. Otherwise, maybe he just castles and then kind of calculates later, depending on what uh, white does, where white places his bishop. I'm um, just trying to kind of figure out why Hikaru is thinking on what looks like a very natural, uh, kind of very straightforward move here. Well, I have to say that I'm a little bit puzzled because I was praising Gukesh's move queen e2 very much. And I thought like it's clear that he wants to get the knight to f3 as quickly as possible, develop the bishop to f4. And uh, all of a sudden he changed his mind and he started this operation on the queen side with b4, c4. And I feel like this, this, this was not the way to go. And Hikaru immediately, yeah, this is, this is Hikaru in his element. Yeah, he is spotting this regroupment of, of the knight. And I do believe that black has absolutely nothing to worry about. And if black has nothing to worry about, then actually it's a type of position where black can in long term be op optimistic here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Daniel, there's very rarely a middle ground. You mentioned this pawn structure, which comes from the French as well, and uh, various other lines, Sicilians. Um, yeah, this it's kind of white has some attack, some initiative, or black is just doing very well. Um, do you think it's going to be the latter case, uh, the way this game is going? Um, how kind of uh, how much do you think this is going to suit Hikaru, this type of position, uh, kind of contrasting to Gukesh? Well, my favorite lazy commentator phrase comes to mind here, dynamic equality, which nobody knows exactly what that means. It means like the position is not balanced, uh, but it's objectively equal. And I think that's it is objectively equal, uh, most likely. Um, and I mean, right now it's a pretty big decision for Hikaru, which, and when I say big decision, it might not be a big decision at all, but if you're in Hikaru's shoes, you don't know whether starting with knight b6 or starting with short castle is significant or not. And I personally don't like these types of decisions. I find them to be kind of annoying where I, you know, there's two moves that look very, very similar. I know that it might not matter the order in which I play them, but maybe it is very significant. And, you know, so you don't know whether it is significant or not. And you end up burning a lot of time on these types of decisions. So Hikaru's got plenty of time. Knight b6 would be kind of my initial inclination. At the same time, uh, leaving the king in the center, uh, even for one move longer than you need to, can be a little bit scary. I think, David, you made a very important point. Short castles c5. If white's bishop was already on b2, uh, sign me up. But after a5, white is unable to play a3. This is why... Uh, the common platitude tells you to, to uh, connect your rooks as quickly as you can. It's for reasons like this. And b5 here, just to highlight, is really bad. White's 
a center just falls apart. C takes B5, and uh, the babysitter leaves the kid at home. Bishop takes E5, uh, and white is starting to drop pawns on every move. So knight B6, I think Ukesh will put his bishop on B2. Um, if we kind of estimate how the game is likely to continue, castles kingside. I don't know. Rooks a c1. Uh, okay, apparently not. How could I have suggested such a terrible, unnatural looking move? Something like this queen c7 to b7 in the Tarash. You often see the queen moving to the b file and setting up a7, a5. And uh, both sides are kind of operating on the queen side. Uh, it's going to be kind of a large scale battle on the queen side in the center. Very, very complex uh, strategic battle, Peter, where there's going to be a lot of uh, seemingly minor decisions to make, but taken together, that's exactly how uh, top-level chess works. Yeah, and Hikaru made up his mind. He castles first. <laughs> now, the big question is, the big question in my mind is, what really happens after bishop b2? Because I really feel like you highlighted very nicely that after knight b6 white would play the move bishop b2 and i'm trying to understand is there some argument uh, for the short castle move order in order that black has a nice response against bishop b2 some timely a5 is that important or not those are the questions as you said yeah that they they might not really matter but over the board you never know if they matter or not and you want to make sure this is how you can end up burning 30 minutes on your clock without actually even finally getting your final answer to the question. E5 played by Vidit. David, go ahead. E5 is on the board in Vidit's game. We don't have to jump there immediately. Perhaps we should wait for Ali Reza's response. But um, just to add one thing, maybe bishop b2, queen b7, keeping the b-file clear could be an option that Hikaru wants to leave on the table. No, yeah, but uh, Danya, I think that we should jump there to have the camera. I want to see Ali Reza's reaction after e5. No objections Let's... at all. <laughs> Let's do just that. Let's switch over to the other game instantly. Uh, that's where the drama is happening. And... and look at this. There is the answer to everything what we have said. Uh, Ali is in a state of shock. This is, this is crazy stuff. Yeah, again, uh, our hearts go out to him. It's been a difficult tournament so far. Uh, one of the best players in the world, of course, but uh, yeah, it's uh, also a tough field. So just being slightly out of form can lead to disastrous results. And we've all been there. We've all felt exactly like Faruja is feeling right now. Um, yeah, we can call it a one-move blunder, but ultimately it was a series of small mistakes and uh, just a series of unfortunate uh, results. Uh, throughout the last few days and e5 from Vidit, impressive stuff we have to commend him spotting this uh, opportunistic blowing open of the center all the tactics working in white's favor due to the black king being stuck in the middle the black queen being undefended uh, maybe even trapped in the next few moves and yeah black just wishing that bishop were on e7 all of these lines if the bishop just were sitting on e7 they might just be working out in black's favor but Right now, it's uh, simply winning position for white. I think at the very minimum, white is going to pick up a piece. Um, or maybe if uh, black plays knight d7 here, damage control, then just e takes d6. It's a resignable um, almost either way. Um, Peter, I'm struggling to see any solace here, any uh, anything to uh, kind of get excited about for black. It just looks like one-way traffic and uh, maybe another defeat for Faruja. Yeah, absolutely. I'm such a big Vidit fan. Yeah, so from one side, I'm very happy for him to seeing him bounce back, but my heart is broken. Yeah, it's uh, when you know and you respect the incredible talent that Ali Reza has, and then you see what, what we see here over the board and also on our camera. This is just uh, heartbreaking. It's it just uh, really, I, I even cannot really put in my word, uh, in words. I just feel like some crazy heart pain because this should never happen. And I'm very sorry for him. And I hope that he recovers from this. Not, not in this game because I don't see him recovering here, but, but uh, that he will be able to show his true level in the tournament. Yeah. Um, we all hope Fruja gets back to his best, that he bounces back. Uh, but it's looking unlikely it will be in this game. We've already shown the key variations. Uh, Black cannot take the e5 form with his knight. There will be a discovered attack. Bishop takes b5 check, and the Black Queen will drop.
taking with the pawn as well. Um, doesn't lead anywhere good after bishop back to e3. So uh, yeah, we'll revisit the variations if and when they become relevant. But most importantly, right now, we know that Vidit mm -hmm. is winning and Faruja is in a lot of pain. Uh, we can see it just by looking at the camera right now, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, you, you feel for the guy. Uh, it's just a blow after blow. And, you know, it came out of nowhere. If he had drawn yesterday, we would have been, uh, it wouldn't have been an, a great tournament for him. But just losing that game with the white pieces, unable to recover emotionally, as is very, very clear. But to take nothing away from Vidit, who himself uh, is fighting off some uh, very difficult psychological demons and uh, clearly doing so very successfully, prosecuting this initiative. Um, and I think Peter's point uh, that knight d7 can be met with e takes d6 is a very important one. Um, by the way, it looks like we have a result in uh, Nepo versus Caruana. We catch the handshake there. Shocking. Shockingly, they have made a draw. I know that this is an unbelievable result, and the rooks came off the board. Uh, they made eye contact and shook hands. So uh, risk-free game for, by Jan Nepomnishi. And uh, for Fabiana Caruana, after surviving that scare, uh, doing a much better job of holding the fort um, and uh, avoiding giving his seconds another heart attack with uh, kind of an easy, quick draw and a de facto rest day for the players, Peter. Yes, and also let's not forget that Fabiano has now finished his double blacks, right? So we know exactly that he's such a force to reckon with when he has the white pieces. He's super ambitious. He has the, the incredible opening knowledge, uh, fantastic preparation to be able to pose problems to any opponent. And uh, I think the, uh, the, uh, for this reason, exactly this draw with the black pieces against Jan suits him perfectly well. The tournament situation indicates that Jan should be also very happy. He has the plus two score and he might feel like, okay, yeah, the game against Fabi is always tough. And uh, let me have a kind of half rest day because it's never exactly a rest day when you are preparing for a game normally the preparation for the game takes away so much more energy often so much more energy than the game itself uh, so that's why it cannot be called the rest but certainly it comes handy and young can go recharge for the second part well it's mm -hmm. not yet it's only the sixth one but we are almost reaching the half mark of the tournament yeah and I would hesitate to kind of Monday morning quarterback uh, this decision. It's easy to look at this from the side and say, he's got the white pieces. Why didn't he take more risk? But these strategies are thought out by the players and their teams very, very carefully. Um, well, it's time for another short break. We already have one result in the books. Uh, Jan Napomnishi, the co-leader, has drawn Fabiano Caruana, putting even more pressure on Gukesh to make his white pieces count against Dikaru. We will keep following Ali Reza's shocking game against Vidit, as well as the other two sharp strategic battles when we come back to the 2024 FIDE candidates coverage in just a few minutes. is an experience, the excitement, the joy, the devastation, the undeniable drive to play again and again. Chess is an experience that's meant to be shared. What if you could experience chess in a completely new way? on a real chessboard with the power of AI at your fingertips. This is Chess Up 2. Take everything you love about playing on chess.com and experience it on a real chessboard. Play a blitz match against a random online opponent.
conquer the bot you've been stuck on for months. Or challenge a friend halfway across the world. Chessup 2 is always ready and always connected with built-in Wi-Fi. Never miss a move with full piece recognition. And review all your games right on chess.com. Chessup 2 is more than a chess board. It's a chess trainer. If you're new to chess, Chessup will teach you. If you already know how to play, Chessup will teach you how to really play. With patented AI assistance, you can balance a match between players of any skill level or hone your skills against one of the built-in AI coaches. The makers of ChessUp 2 are the same team behind the original ChessUp. The best-selling smart chessboard in the world. So whether you're a beginner who wants to learn and improve while you play, or a chess pro who wants to go deeper into the world of chess, experience ChessUp 2 and level up your game. Chess.com is so excited to support the launch of ChessUp2, a revolutionary smart chessboard that will change how you learn and play the game. With technology such as touch sensitive pieces, which will trigger all legal moves to light up on the board when you pick up a piece, and optional AI assistance, ChessUp2 meets you at your skill level and supports training and growth. ChessUp2 even allows you to play Chess.com bots on the board. If you're ready to learn more about ChessUp2 and save $100 when you pre order on Kickstarter, Head over to go.chess.com slash chessup2 or use exclam chessup in chat. Exciting new product. Save $100 on your chess up purchase. Okay, we are back at the 2024 FIDE candidates in Toronto. It's round six and uh, some crazy action, unthinkable happenings across the board. Definitely on Ali Reza's board and he has dropped his knight back to d7, which uh, we sort of determined is the best of the worst, but the position is clearly beyond salvation. He needs a miracle uh, to avoid losing in uh, the next 10 moves or so. Peter, where do we go from here? Uh, we see Bishop B2 by Gukesh as we anticipated. So uh, very interesting positional battles on the top and bottom left of uh, your screen. Well, if you ask me, I would prefer not to go to Pragnananda's game against Abbasov because uh, there is some some really breaking news the, the breaking news is that Pragnananda plays like uh, i don't know like an incredible experienced uh grandmaster like you know someone the, the real strategist and it just drives me crazy he's 18 years old he's so universal look at this position he has given up his light square bishop and giving up the light square bishop for one of black's knights and we have to track back we have to see this i'm completely you know in in some total euphoria seeing this what a strategic decision brilliant stuff david take it away yeah uh, you're right peter i was equally surprised uh, kind of taken aback 
uh, by what happened. Bishop e3, we were all predicting very natural move, defending the pawn. I think the most natural move in the position. And after knight e7, uh, I was looking at ways to build up. Rook c1 was one we mentioned earlier, bishop to d3. But ultimately, uh, Prague, with his really well-trained positional strategic eye, realized that black does have a strategic threat. Bishop d7, uh, one you mentioned earlier, Peter, just to trade off these light squared bishops. And uh, he realized, yes, white's light squared bishop uh, might get traded, but he would rather it disappear for one of Black's knights than this sad block of wood stuck on c8. So knight c5 instead, controlling the key development square of this bishop, allowing knight c3, which uh, most people, myself included, would be reluctant to do. But uh, after queen d2, a trade, uh, knight f5 and rook b1, he's simply arguing that he's got a beautiful knight and Black has a terrible bishop. And um, I agree, it was really surprising. But if we forget about what's been traded off the board, uh, that beautiful light square Bishop of Whites, and if we focus on what's still on the board, it kind of justifies his decision. Like you say, it's kind of uh, it's reminiscent of uh, Petrosian and Carpa, all these great positional players. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've mentioned this before, but when I lost to Prague, when he was 12 years old, <laughs> back in the Isle of Man a few years ago, uh, he positionally outplayed me. And that kind of uh, rarely happens. I lose a lot of games tactically, <laughs> but positionally it's rare that I get outplayed and he was 12 at the time. So he definitely has that uh, positional instinct. And yeah, I mean, uh, like you say, this is a really good judgment, uh, I feel. Uh, even if we see a kind of a second bishop disappear, two knights versus two bishops in a block position, beautiful outpost. It's all about white. Uh, Dania, it looks like Prague's doing everything correct so far. I'm really impressed with uh, just the... Uh, control that Prague is exerting over this game. You mentioned Petrosian Karpov is another game that comes as another name that comes to mind. And another game that came to mind is uh, one of Karpov's positional classics against Vladimir Bagirov, uh, which uh, I made a big impression on me. I just quickly uh, searched up the game and indeed uh, that game came out of an Alakine, but they had a very, very similar pawn structure, exactly the same night on C5, a slightly different piece in balance, but uh, it, Prague's play is just suffused with such positional grace and attention to detail. And one of those details, um, which seems very easy when it's put on the board, but knight f5 to d6, if black could at least maybe get the knight to c4, okay, uh, you could make a case that um, some counterplay would be attained, but bishop b3 to f4 nips that in the bud. You could even then take the knight on d6 and drop the knight uh, from f3 into e5. The block of wood on c8, there's really no better way to put it. Uh, 0.5 by the eval bar is quite an optimistic assessment. I think that practically speaking, um, if Abbasov does not find a clear way to activate his pieces, maybe queen b8 to d6, perhaps uh, the key uh, to, to finding some way to resist this positional uh, boa constrictor-like pressure is to get that bishop out of c8, but it's much easier said than done. And Peter, I share your uh, amazement at, um, at the maturity and just general level of precision inherent in Prague's play this game and uh, at most spots in this tournament. Yeah, he's uh, showing such universal skills. Yes, yesterday we did see that he was unable to spot a computer-like finish, but uh, the overall picture is really wonderful. And he's only 18 years old. I mean, he's only 18 years. And uh, the same applies to Gukesh. Yeah, this, uh, this Indian kids are just incredible. I mean, what kind of kids? <laughs> they are already like playing on 2800 kind of level uh, chess. It's, it's just insane. Well, we've already had one result in the books. It's a uh, fairly quiet draw between Jan and Fabiano. So before we continue our discussion of this impressive positional effort, we have our Toronto correspondent, FIDE Master Mike Klein, doing yeoman's work and standing live uh, with Jan Nepomnishi to catch his thoughts on that quick draw. Let's go over to Mike with Jan Nepomnishi in Toronto. Thanks, guys. We're once again joined by Grandmaster Jan Nepomnishi, who had an early draw today. For the moment, he is up on Gukesh by half a point, but of course, Gukesh has a lot of chess left. Yesterday, both you and Fabiano had close shaves. Did that factor into any of your decision-making today? Well, I, I wouldn't say so. Uh... I mean, uh, I checked my lines after I returned in the case. It was basically out of all sensible moves, I found nearly the only way to get into trouble in this line, which is quite harmless. But okay, such as chess, yeah, when you like play without like 100% being sure, like uh, in, in 
and what you and then that you remember things correctly, then okay, something can happen. Uh, so today, I to be honest, I expected C5 because I mean Fabiano played C5 here twice, and uh, I mean he often goes for uh, uh, for the same line uh, like during all the tournament. Yeah, but uh, yeah, E5 is also of course one of his moves, but inside E5 he has a very wide uh, very wide choice. Like so. Uh, yeah, I've, I thought like okay, like tournament-wise, uh, draw is more or less fine. So I decided to play like a quiet game. Yeah, it seems like both of you respect each other so much that neither of you seem that disappointed by the result today. <clears throat> I don't know. Like uh, we will be disappointed or not, like after round 14. But for now, it's a normal game, yeah. Like so, uh, maybe less experiments from his side and also less experiments from my side in the opening. But um, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's still a very long tournament. So. Uh, you have an unexpected extra three or four hours today. What will you do in that time? Um, do some chess work, I guess, yeah, and, and also uh, have some rest. We don't usually get a player out here when there's so much chess left to be played, and I know you were taking a peek at the uh, Ali Reza Faruja game. What can you make of his play in the last couple of days, including this round? Uh, well, yesterday, I think, uh, in the very end of the game, he uh, blundered in a very unfortunate way, yeah, like this night fork. I mean, it can happen, but I think he sort of made this king 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 takes the free move in one second or something like this. Yes, so it was obviously a uh, combination of many factors. Uh, but today, I think he went quite aggressive in the opening, went for Rouser, and uh, I mean, as for me, I was very puzzled with his move, uh, a bit of queen d8 in uh, the Vilimirovich system, because as far as I know, like the the normal move was always knight e5, bishop e2, and like there is some major, like huge huge amount of theory. Maybe Queen D8 exists, but uh, I'll say when I was like like 16 or 17 years old, okay, I played a lot of Ilimirovich and uh, 95 was a problem, but Queen D8 was never a problem. And now it looks like he's, like after he captured on F2, it's uh, probably after E5 there is some, some trouble, but uh, yeah, let's see what happens. But yeah, of course, like uh, when you like have some minus score, because only only one place makes any sense here, yeah, he, you sometimes try, yeah, like to you know to push it. You know, and sometimes sometimes you push it a bit too hard. So I do that. Indeed, first place is all that matters. And in 33 games lifetime in the candidates, Jan Pomnishi has been in, in the lead or tied for the lead in all 33 games. So enjoy the extra couple hours off. And now back to you in the studio. Thank you, Mike, for your hard work, and thank you, Jan, for sharing. Your thoughts on that draw? I was going to say quick draw. It wasn't quick in terms of the number of moves played. Over 40 moves uh, they managed to blitz out. Did Jan Pomnishi and Fabiana Caruana. But nonetheless, uh, we wish Jan uh, to get maximum rest tonight and come back strong uh, tomorrow. In terms of coming back strong, it looks like Vidit well on the way to a miniature victory. Some interesting stats offered by our very hardworking team. There have been only four wins in under 20 moves at the candidates. The fastest game ever in history in the history of the candidates was Philip versus Laszlo Zabo uh, in 1956, which was a victory in 19 moves. And Vidit's fastest win in classical chess overall in the last 10 years uh, was an 18-move miniature against uh, Indian GM Kidambi uh, in the 2015 Qatar Masters. Peter. Um, we can obviously look at the course of the game as Ali Reza drops his queen back to b6. But I wanted to ask you, and David, you as well, we were talking about long games uh, before the broadcast started. Are there any quick miniatures from Super GM tournaments uh, that you either played or were witness to um, in your long uh, and extensive career at the very top? Tough question, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Man, putting you guys on the spot. I certainly don't. I do remember a couple of uh, Grunfeld games. I mean, we mentioned him earlier. <laughs> Sorry, Vichy. Um, we mentioned uh, Vichy Anand uh, losing a game to Gelfand. I think in, uh, mm -hmm. was it one of the, in that World Championship match, he lost uh, in relatively short order. Um, also, um, he lost a game in the Grunfeld um, in another variation, I believe, to Jan Nepomnishi. Um, or maybe I'm getting that mixed up. Maybe it was the other way around. But either way, yeah, it's uh, very rare to see a miniature at this level, uh, especially under 20 moves, Peter. 
Well, actually, you are referring to that game by Vichy against Gelfand. Well, that was exactly the opposite. That Vichy won that game against ah, Gelfand, and it bad. was the <laughs> and it was immediately after losing that game we talked about this structure that uh -huh. we see in the Prague Abbasov game. So it was Vichy's reaction to win in a miniature way. Clearly, uh, Boris was also very excited. He was playing a very double-edged uh, line in a very sharp manner, and Vichy outcalculated him in his true trademark, spotting every kind of tricky angle. And that queen on h1 got trapped in that game. I do believe it was some queen f2, quiet little queen f2 from Vichy that was missed by Boris. Uh, yeah, that, that was uh, clearly something to remember because it was also the turning point. After that uh, victory, Vichy was back. Yeah, I remember Queen F2, Peter, but then, uh, yeah, the names, uh, the colors, <laughs> blurry. <laughs> 12 years is uh, too long. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, how about you, Daniel? It's few and far between this type of thing happening. Uh, maybe this game will go on beyond 20 moves, but uh, it looks like it's almost objectively at least decided. Yeah, I mean, this was much more common in, you know, the 1800s when we had King's Gambits and uh, blunders were aplenty. I only have one story which comes to mind. Uh, the fastest game ever played at a U.S. championship. Um, when I first played the U.S. Closed Championship in 2011, my coach uh, reminded me of this game um, as kind of a word of caution. Do not uh, write your name in chess history. Do not replace Kamran Shirazi, um, an international master with quite a famous reputation. He had a cameo appearance in the famous movie Searching for Bobby Fischer. Uh, he's still very active. He's a strong player. But uh, that day in, I think, 1984, uh, was not his best. Can we perhaps show? Because it was also Sicilian, ironically enough. This will not take me long, I promise. This will take me exactly 10 seconds to show. B4, real game, two international masters. Shirazi always plays offbeat openings to this day. C takes B4, A3. Peters plays D5. This is the main line of the wing gambit. E takes D5, queen takes D5. And here, instead of uh, knight F3, uh, which is uh, the standard move, Kamran Shirazi decides on an improvement. A takes B4 is played. Real game, real happenings, Queen E5 check. And uh, uh, the international master from Los Angeles got a rest day, except he also got a victory. This is the shortest ever game uh, in a U.S. championship. But that's really the only story that came to my mind. Uh, like you said, David, I don't think that this game is going to end in the next five moves. But uh, perhaps we could delve deeper into the current position and try to figure out the most efficient path to victory. I would also point out Vidit is down to 40 minutes. So... As overwhelming as this position is, you don't want to just lazily burn time because we know uh, what players like Ali Reza are capable of. You chop off one head and another one uh, grows to take its place. Well, the move that I'm wondering about is what happens if I just play a very simple move in the most primitive way. Look, h1 to f1, Yeah, the only piece which is not yet participating in the attack. Uh, will be activated. The rook from f1 will be eyeing the f7 pawn. I'm also setting up some bishop f4 to e3 ideas, followed by knight c3 to e4, and then another knight lands on c5. That looks like a very sensible and effective way of making sure that I'm not risking anything, but actually I'm just crushing my opponent as well. Yeah, I like it, Peter. Um, I just want to show as well rook h f1. Black can barely move. Black would love to get the king to safety. Castle queenside, for example. But now uh, I like saving this kind of up your sleeve because the black queen would suddenly find herself trapped. Um, it would be kind of fitting yeah, <laughs> that uh, the queen finds herself trapped on b6, where she has now sat three different times in this game. Queen b6, queen d8, queen b6, queen takes f2, queen b6, and uh, <laughs> finally losing her life on that square. But uh, yeah, rook f1 looks very, very powerful. I'm also slightly oh. attracted to rook e1 just to set up knight d5 ideas potentially. Um, if the Black King cannot evacuate the e-file. Um, but I think it's just too much choice here, Danya. Too many tempting moves, um, and they all look beautiful for white. Yeah, and I mean, what's funny is after, let's say, Rook HF1 castles queenside, Bishop E3 uh, is going to end the Black Queen's uh, zigzag between D8 and B6. Uh, the Queen is trapped. The other, uh, it's funny, it, come, it evacuates from F2 and gets trapped on B6. The other important... Uh, pattern is that if black tries to play g6, which I think is the only way to try to get uh, the bishop out, there is again this pattern, bishop e3, queen d8, and bishop g5. And again, after queen b6, white opens up the path for the white queen to infiltrate uh, to f4. And I think we can probably 
stop our calculation here. The important thing for Vidit is again, to be practical with his clock management um, because I'm starting to get a little bit apprehensive. If the position wasn't so winning, um, I think I would be uh, reminding people of yesterday's game against Caruana, but even with 10 minutes on the clock, um, I think Vidit should be able to, to drive the point home, but crazier things have happened. Yeah, and uh, Daniel, just because, I mean, I'm tired of you get, seeing all the tactics. Finally, I saw one for the first time today. I just wanted to show one last variation quickly uh, in that G6, uh, just to finish off your line. Um, yeah, of course, Black can resign here after Queen F4 for many reasons, but I just wanted to say, like, in this position, Queen takes F5, and, <laughs> and oh, uh, wow. you can crash in with checkmate <laughs> uh, with the double bishops. But uh, yeah, this one, of course... Game over in many ways. White doesn't need to <laughs> involve himself in any flashy tactics. I think uh, you can win this win this rather prosaically. Um, Peter, I love your move for Rook F1. Just feels like that sets up all the incoming tactics. And uh, Vidit, 37 minutes. Normally we would be worried about that, right? With uh, only 15 moves on the board. But uh, 37 minutes in this type of position should be plenty. Yes, exactly. It's so difficult to see how Black will really put up resistance. I think that because Abasov has played the move e6, e5, and there is some development, change of structure, maybe it could be a chance for us to, to check out what happens in that game. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. Let's jump straight over um, to that uh, Abasov game where he's taken a very committal decision, but also very understandable, right, Peter? You mentioned it's a big moment, but maybe he had to do this rather than sit and suffer uh, in a bind uh, long term. And uh, just to recap for everyone, the last couple of moves, uh, we left it here after rook A to B1. We were saying white's plans are easy, going to kind of uh, put a rook on C, uh, C1, maybe push a pawn forward. Uh, Black is really stuck for ideas. E5 breaking out drastically and a capture. And... Okay, Black's pawn structure definitely inferior here, but at least he's active. At least this bishop is no longer the useless block of wood uh, that I was referring to. Maybe it'll come out someday to g4. Uh, but for now, what do we think Prague is going to be calculating? Is he going to take this bishop off the board? Is he going to just centralize his rook, target the um, isolated pawn? Maybe he's getting tactical. Maybe he's getting sharp. Hmm. What do we think? Yeah, Danya, what is your take on this position? Mm, my instinct is knight takes c5, queen takes c5. Ah, but also the I forgot that the knight on f5 can capture on e3 and open up the bishop on c8. So that uh, makes rook d1 a little bit more compelling. Um, I actually like Abasov's decision to play five. The common wisdom is to change the course of the game, change the structure when you're suffering uh, to the extent that he was. So yeah, actually, maybe rook d1 uh, is, is a compelling move, uh, just for starters, because, okay, bishop c8 to b7 will run into knight d7 with the fork. Uh, not that that's a desirable move in any case, but just to point out, uh, Peter, do you share uh, my uh, advocate, advocation for keeping the tension, or do you think knight takes c5 is uh, the, the clearer way to an advantage? Well... Honestly, my heart is also, my very first intention was, ah, e5 takes, uh, okay, of, of course, we take on e5, but uh, at closer inspection, clearly, I also don't want to allow black screen to be activated. Yeah, then suddenly black screen gets active on e5. The knight on f5 is kind of a nice piece, can support d5, d4. And one thing I don't want to allow black to get any kind of counterplay. Now, the big question is, how can we make sure that black does not get counterplay? And the question is, which rook to place on d1 rook fd1 or even there is some argument to move the rook from b1 not to step into some eventual bishop f5 tempo after black hits the hits the bishop on e3 and prague goes for rook he goes for rook fd1 yes okay it's the most natural move because the point is that after knight takes ec queen takes ec the bishop on e5 is still hanging so black is unable to use the tempo move with bishop f5 now there is one question that can black try to push d5, d5 d4 or not yeah this we have to calculate mm -hmm. that would be a big move uh trying to overload the white minor pieces because there is a bit of a battery on the h2 square 
I'm wondering whether white doesn't even indulge in uh, any captures here, whether white just moves away, maybe bishop g5. Um, mm -hmm. Not sure that's the best square. Attacking this bishop now. I guess the bishop moves. Or rook e8. It's getting sharp. Or even f6. I don't know, f6 oh, looks f6. horrible, yeah. but maybe it wins a tempo at least. Yeah. Never play f6, but maybe here. <laughs> maybe here it's okay. Yeah, it's, it's so ugly. <laughs> I hate such moves. No, it's not my style at all. Um, I'm not sure how to react to it, to be honest. Uh, maybe I just drop back with the bishop and pretend you've weakened your king. Uh, but like you say, black gains a tempo. Um, d4 in the current position, I mean, it looks like it's either that one or rook d8 feels a bit odd. Undefended square, but maybe... Ugh. Or, Bishop g5 tactics in the air there. Yes. What else? What else if not d4? That's yeah. the big question. Maybe it's got to be done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking bishop takes d4 as a con more concrete try. Knight takes d4. Knight takes d4. And bishop h2, king h1. I was trying to head around this position. It's a committal, very committal decision for white because you are essentially... Um, trading in your positional advantages uh, for uh, a direct initiative, but that initiative is very scary because it's not so clear where to evacuate this bishop. You're pointing out one of the key ideas, the knight jumping into c6, kind of wreaking havoc and setting up more exciting tactical prospects for that knight, which can continue on to e7. But after bishop 2, okay, queen f4 is bad because of, at the very least, g3, but uh, if black plays bishop to d6, I was trying to figure out a knockout blow, knight c6, queen c7 doesn't seem convincing at all. So I don't think white should rush in with knight c6. And instead, should find some beautiful, quiet move, which I cannot quite pinpoint. Maybe rook bc1, maybe like even knight c5 back to e4. But I'm not totally sure what the, the secret sauce would be in this position. Well, let me just jump in there with one thought, yeah, that... Actually, if black needs to retreat the bishop, uh, then I'm kind of happy. And we do see a move d5, d4 on the board. So all eyes on Prague, how we'll handle it. Uh, can we just bring up that position where we talked about queen f4? Because after queen f4, there's this very hidden threat of queen h6. And the move that you highlighted, g3, can maybe be met by queen h6. Ah, queen h5 maybe instead is an improvement. Yes, because oh. here actually white loses on the spot. Yeah, just uh, watch out for this bishop h2, queen f4, but queen h5 is the clear move. Uh, that's the reason why you always have to be very careful in chess. Yeah, and uh, this black bishop would end up trapped. And this is very difficult to evaluate, though. I mean, of course, we see the eval bar. We kind of uh, know that white is doing uh, pretty decently in a position like this. But, I mean, taking and kind of two knights versus two bishops it could go very very wrong for white uh if you're not able to capital uh, to kind of capitalize uh short term so yeah bishop d6 it could be a position like this that scares prague off if he doesn't find a knockout blow he'll be like ah uh what if this bishop somehow gets active someday i'm not sure how but uh what if black is able to wriggle out and get the black rooks out uh maybe someday um, okay knight c6 will come but maybe if the black rook somehow activates on the seventh rank this could turn white's king vulnerable as well. So, um, yeah, I think he'll be looking for other ways. Um, bishop takes d4, maybe the most forcing, what he might calculate first. And, uh, yeah, bishop d2, bishop g5, there's uh, kind of uh, there's a lot to say for those moves as well. So it feels like a critical moment, but in practical terms, I feel like Abbas, of, uh, he's made a good decision. He's complicated things. He's given choice to the opponent. Prague's moves are lo no longer as natural and as kind of straightforward and strong as... Uh, we were predicting them to be. Um, yeah, this one still a full fight ahead. And I really like Black's energetic uh, attempts at defense here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm going to make the prediction, Peter, maybe you disagree, but I think Bishop takes d4 is very Prague style. He, We've spotlighted his positional maturity, but at his core, um, I think particularly the younger players, they like concreteness and clarity in the position. And if he plays bishop takes d4, it doesn't necessarily mean he's seen all the details. This could be a combination of good calculation and also the application of, in, of a tactical intuition. I mean, with these, these beautiful knights in the center, 
the prospect of shifting the queen from e2 to f3 or e4, as you pointed out, David, it seems like bishop takes d4 is somewhat of a positional risk, but not such a big risk to where you must have calculated this to victory uh, in order to commit to it. I think we might see that move on the board. Yeah, I perfectly agree with you, Daniel. I, my first intention was also like after d5, I would like to capture on d4. And I started calculating exactly the same lines that you had in mind. That's why I had respect for queen f4. I did not see queen h5. I felt like it should be bad for black for some reason. Against knight fc, there was bishop g4. It was my uh, problems. Uh, and uh, but, but my instinct also tells me that it should be good for white. On the other hand, I perfectly agree with David as well that if you don't see move pen move exactly how you're going to get the maximum after bishop takes d4 and you see a quite little alternative with bishop d2 or bishop g5, you feel like, okay, I have the upper hand and I'm not risking anything. By the way, what is black's next move? Yeah, because this is also one of those questions, yeah, that I'm a strategist, I'm a positional player, so after bishop g5, if you ask me, I would say, no, 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 I never want to play a move like f7, f6, but it was the first instinct that came out of me. Yeah, that, and if suddenly I would be thinking from the white side and I spot that after bishop g5, f6, no, okay, come on, then I'm going to play bishop g5, give me this f6 move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much a matter of taste here for Prague. Um, I mean, I've sat in on some training sessions where he's been present, and you're right, Dania, um, his first mm -hmm. instinct is very much calculate the forcing moves first that's how we're all taught when we're young that's how we uh, it should be and uh, his coach Ramesh uh tells him but... to do that but okay there you the have it approach. David yeah the Hubble <laughs> approach Bishop G I'm loving it hats off David that was that was a great call and uh when this move is made on the board it, it makes perfect sense practical deci practical decision by Mr Pragnananda and immediately Abbasov says, I'm calling your bluff, bishop to d6. I still think bishop takes d4 should have been investigated more thoroughly by Prague, but uh, the next uh, couple of moves will tell us a lot about the direction of this game. Yeah, I'm uh, proud that he chose my move, but also probably it wasn't the best, so <laughs> I'm not too surprised about that. Uh, Peter, I did. I was trying to calculate there actually f6, uh, he, bishop d6, I think a very logical move, maybe the safer and better of the two, but f6. I'm wondering if I could have taken here on e5 um, and tried to take advantage. Me. Yes. Yeah, maybe a move. I'm not sure knight d3 now or rook e1, um, but to try and win this pawn. And if you try to defend it, then there's bishop pins galore four. with bishop f4. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, uh, as you as you highlighted. Yeah, th there is a reason why there is this saying that please connect your rooks, right? It's. Uh, it's just very unfortunate. No, bishop d6 is the professional move. Yeah, f6 was a total desperado. No, no, bishop d6 is fine. And black might be actually capturing this knight on c5 with bishop takes c5 at some point, even if it comes at the cost of sacrificing the pawn. But opposite colored bishop positions with some blockade in some kind of scenario could be a way for black to think about uh, surviving the game. By the way, let's just quickly highlight that knight takes d4 is a terrible blunder because then the pin along the b file proves decisive. Takes, takes, bishop takes c5. Oops. Uh, bishop takes c5, and at the very end, the white rook on b1, undefended. Yeah, that would be an easy one to blunder, uh, kind of assuming that black takes on h2, but no, black goes the other way, the other direction. Um, yeah, I agree, actually. Bishop takes c5 in some lines might be a threat because finally for the first time in the game the black bishop on c8 would uh, breathe a sigh of relief it would be able to taste fresh air on a square like e6 um so yeah Prague still with hard work to do maybe he should have played bishop takes d4 i'm regretting it now daniel yeah, <laughs> your move. i think <laughs> that, you know david's <laughs> advice is always safe we also have some uh moves being made in uh, gukash versus nakamura so maybe before our next break we can uh travel over there and uh, take a look at that complex positional battle where some tension is getting released uh, with a, a pair of rooks now off the board. Uh, so perhaps we can start with a quick status update. The last couple of moves uh, were quite telling, and we did see why Hikaru started by castling. Again, these small subtleties, uh, which don't necessarily seem all that significant, but 
uh, which dictate the course of the game. The reason Hikaru didn't commit his knight, it's still on c8. Because after Gukesh played bishop b2, we saw an immediate queenside strike, a7, a5. Uh, if we just uh, uh, travel over to that Hikaru game, we do see Vidit continuing to play accurately with rook hf1. We'll bring you that game as well momentarily, but uh, just perhaps the last couple of moves, we can quickly show how these trades happened. And I think they're kind of fizzling out uh, by and large. a5, a3, Gukesh responding with a kind of automatic a3, but that invites uh, some uh, major tension clearing trades. Tr trade four, trade on a1, trade on c4, going for the most consecutive captures in a row world record. And Peter, are we just seeing uh, a game that's increasingly looking like it's about to fizzle out? Yes and no. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> of course the, the position looks quite lowish. However, whenever there is this dynamic with the pawn e6 and e5, and there are dark square bishops on the board, then clearly there is something to play for with black. Yeah, look at that bishop on b2. Uh, that bishop on b2 is tied to the defense of the e5 pawn. Also, these c6, b4 pawns are still keeping some kind of dynamic in the position. Of course, it's a classical game. I believe that white should be able to, to navigate. But still, if you would ask me which side I would pick, clearly it would be black. Yeah, I feel like black can maybe try to pose some questions. And I have seen Magnus Carlsen win a hook and game against Ruslan Ponomayo 4 versus 4 on the king's side just because of the fact that white's pawn on e5 was kind of isolated it was i think in monaco tournament it was uh, blindfold or rapid i don't know exactly but uh, you should never underestimate this small little detail uh, magnus could literally win this position blindfolded that's a, <laughs> a sad uh, indictment a sad fact for the pawn on e5 mm -hmm. um but yeah i agree with peter it should be a draw of course with best play uh, Kukashi has plenty of time on the clock, but probably the easier side is Black's, um, just because of the slightly better bishop, the slightly more flexible or compact pawn structure. And uh, yeah, if the knights do disappear, if they get traded off, the Black Rook will occupy the d-file, maybe come to d5 later on once you've solved the back rank issues. Um, but ultimately, there must be a way, you would think, for Kukesh to trade off this set of knights and these pawns. And once that happens, surely just uh, drawing margins extremely high there. Um, Nakamura, he doesn't look too excited on the camera. Kukesh looks focused. Um, yeah, I mean, not much else to say. It should be level, but still some life left, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, now, uh, I did unpleasant decision for Gukesh. Some people in the chat were suggesting Rook A6. It's a very flashy looking move, but it invites the Black Knight to ensconce itself on D5. I think this is the nightmare scenario. On top of the weakness on D5, you have to deal with a with a voracious and beautifully situated knight on d5. So maybe just knight takes b6, queen takes b6, and I don't know, queen c4, bishop c3 can be considered. It's not going to win any brilliancy prizes, but um, it's very important in these situations to be accurate. We saw yesterday um, Ali Reza missing a couple opportunities toward the end of the game uh, to nip Hikaru's initiative in the bud. And the, more, the longer you let Hikaru uh, kind of sit on the position, uh, the higher the chance that uh, he's able to utilize his one of his greatest talents, which is uh, in this very Magnus-like fashion uh, to keep producing chances when it seems like the position might be dead. So Gukesh is aware uh, of the stakes here. That's why he's taking his time. And uh, likeliest outcome is a draw, but I'm totally with you and Peter that um, we shouldn't assume that they're going to sign the score sheets imminently. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I think it's time for a break on that note before we delve deeper into our remaining games. We already have a draw between uh, Nepomnishi and Caruana. The Vidit Faruja game continues to trundle forward with a winning position for the Indian Grandmaster, but quite a bit of work still left to do. So we'll provide a status update for you on that game and keep following our remaining exciting games in round six of the 2024 candidates when we return in just a couple of minutes.
I'm Gotham Chess, and I'm about to the extreme chess challenge I've ever done. I'm gonna be playing four games at the same time, and every kid is gonna be armed with a giant super soaker gun. Let's see if I can win all four games. Okay. Why did I sign up for this? This is like extreme sports. Oh my gosh, I can't even see. These two are like really brutal. I feel like I haven't even been attacked on that side. Why are you all defending your kings? Like, just let me win. Okay, all right, that's fair. I'm gonna be so excited when your water guns run out of water. I'm just gonna like <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, how about you all do it at the same time for like 30 seconds straight? Ready, go! <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 Yay! <laughs> I play this. It is mean, yes. <laughs> how does she still have water? Oh my god. <laughs> Checkmate. Good game. <laughs> For some reason? Well, that means he probably enjoys chess, right? For some reason. No? <laughs> <laughs> that was so fast. I'm down to two boards. Ah! We're ready. We're ready. How do you still have so much water? Okay, no problem. Okay, yay. Ah, I had a feeling she was lying. That's checkmate. Good game. I can sacrifice my queen. I'm just saying, I don't so mean. Ah! Good game. You lasted the longest. I'm trying to shake your hand. Woo! That was very fun. Thank you for volunteering. You know, actually, I feel like getting revenge. <laughs> Has this ever happened to you? Oh shoot, another mouse slip. What about this? Oh, well holy bishops on passant. I think I'm getting carpal tunnel. If only there was a way to play online chess with a real life board. What if I told you, you can with Chess Up 2. That's right, with Chess Up 2, you can now play over the board online. Wow. Simply connect your chess.com account to our state-of-the-art Chess Up 2 and get a game started. Every time you move, our revolutionary board will transmit the data online directly to your opponent. And as soon as they move, squares will light up, signifying which piece is going where. Well shucks, this Hikaru guy seems pretty good. With Chess Up 2, mm. mouse slips and sore wrists mm. are a thing of the past. My carpal tunnel is gone. Well this sure is fun. I'm playing online against my new friend, Hikaru. Who needs a family? But I sure do miss clicking on a piece and seeing all of my available moves like they have on chess.com. Well, Danny, you're in luck. This feature is totally available on the Chess Up 2 as well. Wow, well, I'm convinced. But hey, what if I don't just want to play an opponent online? What if I want to use one of chess.com's other great tools? I thought you'd never ask. With Chess Up 2, you can fully take advantage of the Chess.com integration by playing bots, analyzing your offline games, and even using our optional AI assistance to visualize the quality of moves with color-coded hints. Well, holy f Chess Up, you did it. You made IRL Chess cool again. You got it, Danny. And how do you know my name? Play chess today on the board of tomorrow.
back at the 2024 candidates. It is round six and some lovely footage of Vidit, for whom it is the first appearance at the candidates tournament. What an impressive run on the strength of an incredible performance at the Isle of Man tournament, which he won. The FIDE Grand Swiss propelled him into the candidates. And despite a good start, he's dealing with half a point out of the last three games. And it seems like he is knocking on the door of what would be a huge comeback victory over um, a reeling Ali Reza Perugia. Let's jump right in. We have some developments in that game. That its clock management has been an issue throughout the tournament. It is an issue once again this particular game. And they continue to blitz out their moves. Vidit's queen is on a7. So let's jump right in uh, and take a look at what's going on. 22 minutes on the clock for the Indian Grandmaster. But uh, what seems like a completely winning position. David, perhaps we could update everybody on uh, the last four or five moves. Uh, we saw the bishop dropping back to e3 a couple of moves ago. And uh, how did white's queen land on a7? Take it away. as well first the queen was hit black forced to retreat and uh, i've lost count of the times now that the black queen has gone back to d8 in this game uh, we see rook f1 uh, peter's move the knight lands on e5 i guess over defending over protecting the f7 square and after queen to d4 rook c8 leaving a vulnerable point um, in his own camp here Ferruja, and the white queen doesn't hesitate to jump in behind enemy lines hitting this bishop it's almost impossible to defend this bishop. Rook b8 would be a really sad move to have to play. Uh, I'm sure white has uh, many ways of breaking through there. Maybe knight c5 ideas. So Ferruja decides, okay, the bishop is not protected, has to move it. And uh, I'm firstly wondering, uh, well, actually, I'm wondering about several moves. I was about to blunder the queen. I'm not sure. Queen takes a6, if that's possible. No, but queen a6 is possible, no? Because rook a8, knight takes b5 Whoa. is very interesting. Uh... Mm -hmm. I think it wins. He's reaching for it. Hesitation there on the camera from Fidel. Oh. What a line. What a line. Knight takes b5. Rook takes a6. Knight c7 check. But that's not the cool part. The cool part is that after black gives up the queen and brings the rook back to a8, and maybe we're missing a detail. I'm surprised. Oh, bishop b7 here might be a nasty little move because rook a8 runs into bishop a6. But... Maybe even this position with knight takes g4, you know, black gets some imbalances, is obviously still winning. Uh, did we miss a better move at some point after rook a8? Let's pause there for a second uh, and make sure that we're not missing, like bishop a7 is very much on the table as well and is maybe uh, a way to avoid all the complications, Peter. Well spotted by you. Well, six, actually, six. yeah, my, my line was this knight takes b5 and I spotted bishop a6 after rook a8 and I was so happy. Bishop b7 would have been a cold shower, I have to reveal. Uh, but okay, I only spent like some five seconds in the position. But yeah, we have to ask the question, what happens if we just play bishop a7? Because the b5 pawn is not running away. And uh, if knight takes b5 comes, that's uh, automatic resignation. Mm -hmm. My dear. Yeah, I, I saw rook <laughs> yeah, a8, I stopped, I was like, <laughs> blunder, but no, this looks good. I agree with both of you. Yeah, so knight b8, how does the line continue? Minimum queen b6. <laughs> yeah, it's in your pocket. Yeah. Queen b6 is in your pocket. Mm -hmm. And and why not? Yeah, we are pawn up and the b5 pawn is weak. It's falling. It might just be primitive and exactly what the doctor ordered. Rook a8 played. Yeah, so this is the position in the game. Uh, not only is Vidit attacking, not only is Black struggling to develop pieces or mm. get cast or whatever, but White's also a pawn up. Normally you sacrifice I'm... a piece for this type of initiative, right, Daniel? I'm a little worried about knight takes b5, though. It's a tempting move, and it's easy to miss bishop b7, Peter. Yes, it's very easy. But look at Vidit, he's very nervous, he seems to know what he's doing because his body language signals that he's about to make a move. Look at the tension. Mm -hmm. He will play bishop a7, he is professional enough. Okay, what's your prediction, Danya? Peter thinks bishop a7? Yeah, I agree. I mean, you just got to realize knight takes b5, very flashy, but that's exactly how you, how you throw a game. 20 minutes on the clock. I mean, we keep gravitating to Vidit's clock. 
no increment until move forward. And we got to keep repeating that. Bishop a7, queen b8 also came to mind, but that's just another way to reach that completely lost endgame where white's going to have four pass pawns uh, on the queen side once b5 is eliminated. So Vidit knows this is the last critical moment, and we see the hesitation, we see the anxiety. This is a huge moment. The Karpov move, bishop a7, it needs to happen for the win yeah. to proceed smoothly. And he's reaching bishop. out for the bishop. Yes, you can see that he's reaching out for the bishop. He wants to make a long rage move. Will it be bishop a7? Uh, you mentioned that uh, Karpov move in a famous Roy Lopez game. But here, it looks like uh, the, just the easiest, the no calculation way of uh, maintaining the advantage. I takes b5 would take him longer if he were to play it. So I agree. I think he's going for bishop a7. But uh, you mentioned the clock, 19 minutes now to make 20 moves. Physically, that's going to be tough. There's one move per minute on average. Ferruccio just needs to throw one spanner in the works. But okay, bishop a7 is on the board. Looks like that might be one of the hardest moves he has to play in the remainder of this game, Vidit, and he has found it. Impressive. Oof. Vidit fans just breathe a huge sigh of relief, but it ain't over. Ferruja has over an hour on his clock, so Vidit has to convert this very cleanly, and really the clock is his biggest enemy at this point. Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, now that things clarified, yeah, so one can argue, and look at this, he gets up, I always like this very much it signals that he's confident enough he knows that yes this time will be enough just let me keep my nerves under control that's the only thing that matters over the board i'm already handling the things yeah i'm wondering if black can get castled now though uh, a move like g6 so i want to play bishop h6 check and just castle as quickly as possible i know i'll be two or three pawns down but <laughs> at least the black king will be safe and the game goes on for a while. Yeah, for hopefully. a while. <laughs> it's, it's correct. <laughs> By the way, also there is an idea for white uh, to maybe even include knight d4 next. Yeah, that not even just to rush uh, by capturing the pawn on b5, but if you are not putting any pressure on my queen and the bishop on, on this pin, then I might be even able to play knight d4. Yeah, that bishop's almost trapped. That's a good spot. Oof. Yeah, the more I look at it, the more I think it's just going to be, uh, well, actually a clinical conversion here. Just bag a couple of pawns at the very minimum. Black needs a trick here now, right, Dania? And I'm struggling to see one, I must admit. Someone in the chat was suggesting a very clever idea. Bishop takes d6 or takes d6, queen c7. But unfortunately, when you're so poorly developed, you know, none of these tactics are going to go your way. And I think at a minimum, there's rook takes c6, uh, among other things, probably, but uh, we can highlight queen c7, rook c6. Maybe not the most accurate, but definitely does the trick. And if knight takes c6, queen takes c6, you can just trade queens and you're completely winning. Here you have knight takes b5, and uh, the, c7, the queen on c7 hangs with a check. Uh, the f4 square is protected by white's rook, so everything is in the right place at the right time. And uh, you can't even go back to c8. You can't even defend the knight because of another fork. On d6, that's just what happens when uh, you've got Ferruccio's type of position. Nothing is going to work out for you, and his hour and ten minutes are essentially useless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he might invest quite a big uh, kind of chunk of his time here, but as you say, Daniel, it's just too late. Um, queen d4, queen a7, queen takes a6. I'm, <laughs> I must admit, it's not uh, what I would normally be doing, uh, despite the fact that I love grabbing pawns does feel like it's uh, very risky, but it's kind of the most straightforward, the most direct path to victory. So real credit to Vidit for uh, just spotting it, going for it uh, very confidently. Still with 19 minutes, it should be enough, Peter. Um, how confident are you he's going to pocket the full point here? Well, I'm super confident. The point is that uh, before, when we see that he's winning, yeah, we were kind of sure that he wins. But then there was this scary moment that, yeah, he's taking his time and uh, seemingly Ali does find this knight c5, rook c8 with some complication. His position is holding on. But this queen a7 followed by queen takes a6, bishop a7 sequence of moves was a game changer. Yeah, now we have clarification. Now White knows exactly 
I collected the pawn, not only that I collected the pawn, but Black's position is falling apart. And if I'm not losing on the spot, by the way, Alza did make a move. It's G6, mm -hmm. it's your move. It's your tricky move. Well, it's uh, <laughs> not much choice there, I guess, Daniel. Black at least wants no. the castle now. I mean, you need to get your bishop out, but knight d4, Peter's move, I think. Knight d4, bishop h6, king b1. You know, congratulations, you have managed to castle on move 23, but you just basically have the same situation with the queens on the board where the b5 pawn is going to fall. Uh, maybe that's the best practical option, um, but I find it very hard to believe that uh, there's anything realistic in that ensuing position. Knight d4, knight a5 maybe also a possibility. Yeah, knight a5 as well. Very nice. Hitting the bishop. Oof. Yeah, tough times for black. But you can tell his strategy now, maybe the most practical strategy, is to try and hustle on the clock. Uh, Faruja, he has to play play quick, play tricky, um, before Bidit can uh, really kind of calm his nerves and reach move 40. Still a long, long way away. We're just at move 21 now. Uh, but, okay. Shall we check in on some of the developments of the other games, the Prague game against Abasov, to my eyes, that's gone a bit crazy just in the last few moves. Yes, certainly we should. Yeah, because we have seen some G4 move by Prague. Things are escalating. And let's let's get an update. How did we reach this position? Yeah, the uh, Kukesh against Nakamura game still very much in the balance, but this one is dramatic, not just in terms of the pawn structure. Suddenly look at White's doubled F-pawns, but look at Black's double G-pawns, and uh, two bishops versus two knights as well. Um, we've only had three moves, Daniel, since we were last here, which actually just shocked me. Uh, Bishop D6 was played, and wow, pawn to G4, nerves are still really ambitious from Prague. <laughs> This knight is trapped, pretty much, after all. It doesn't want to go back to h6, where it will just be captured. And uh, I mean, maybe it will just stay on h6, actually, after a move like h3. But instead, counterattack from Abasov. Really clever um, strike there, counter blow. Queen e4. Wow, nerves are still just keeping the tension, uh, wanting to take back on his terms. And after a trade of minor pieces, rook to a7. Both sides just playing really well, I've got to say. Really nice resource. Trying to activate across the board here. And uh, first question that comes to my mind, knight takes g5 or rook takes d4? Surely one of these pawns has to be captured now. Which one? But be careful. Rook d4 runs into bishop takes c5. The deadly... Ah, oh, no, <laughs> it's not anymore a deadly pin. The queen from e4 <laughs> protects the b1 rook. Okay, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I almost got a heart attack. Like, okay, my God. What, mm -hmm. what is happening? The queen on e4 is such a lovely piece, yeah. Wow. But what if what if you start with G4? I just I really am so passionate about this idea. I don't want to abandon it. Can we deflect the queen somehow? Oh, maybe rookie seven is a better way to try to I mean rookie seven is the kind of standard move. That's what you're aiming for. But queen d3, I mean it looks very flimsy to me. I just want to say that Abasov is he's gotten exactly the kind of position that he wanted to get, uh, given how much he was suffering strategically. So he might be worse objectively, but now Prague is a very difficult decision. Knight takes g5, threatens queen h4 with it. Actually, doesn't even threaten queen h4 because if bishop takes f5, so ridiculously enough, rook e7 encourages it, and white is at a dead end. So some difficult tactical challenges uh, that Abbasov has managed to confront his young opponent with. And uh, yeah, it's uh, which pawn do you take and how do you take it? That's the big order of the day for Prague. Yep. Yeah, I also have this feeling. Yeah, let's not forget to mention that uh, who is there with Abasov? It is Shakri Amamedyarov. I feel like this is the very first moment during the tournament where Shakri says, this is chess. This is, uh, this is counterplay. There is life in the position. Yeah, so I can feel like uh, now Shakri is getting extra energy in his room. And this is exactly the type of position he loves to see because it's it's crazy, out of control, wild, with tons of complication. That's a really good shout, Peter. Shakira Mamajarov, uh, one of the most exciting players of his generation. And yeah, he'd be loving this. He'd be <laughs> kind of uh, running rings around most of his opponents, probably with white or with black <laughs> in this position, uh, Mamajarov. 
but yeah, in the meantime, it's Prague. He's uh, down a bit on, on the clock. He's uh, got around 15, 16 minutes less than Abasov. I think if Abasov's going to win a game uh, kind of with black in this tournament, this might be the best position he's going to get. Uh, just so crazy, so wild. And uh, Prague needs to regain control. If you compare this to actually that positional bind we were praising, that Karpovian uh, pawn structure and uh, kind of piece placement, then yeah, Abasov, he's worked miracles to get to this position. I've got to really, really credit him uh, for making this uh, a bit more chaotic. And uh, yeah, it's hard to evaluate, I've got to say. Uh, even the eval bar is uh, throwing me off here. Without it, I would say that actually Black's position might be easier to play. But uh, the fact that it's still roughly level, um, I mean, the players don't know that. They know that this could turn uh, any move, just any slip from either side. Prag looks a bit nervous. He's kind of rocking back and forth, playing with a piece. Yeah, I don't think he likes how this game has developed, Daniel. No, I mean, it, Abasov is a fighter, and maybe the, the Karawana game was the only one where he kind of got soundly outplayed. And even there, he had chances until the very end, until that final blunder yesterday against Gukesh. It was a heartbreaking result, but, you know, let's take off our hats for the way that he is able to stay in the game against uh, these these monsters. And once again, showing an unwillingness to just kind of buckle down and uh, and concede the point, saying, no, I'm going to keep finding ways to pose you with new challenges. And remember, the pressure is always on Abasov's opponents. Uh, because, especially when they've got the white pieces against him. So it's not easy to manage those expectations. And Abasov is uh, exploiting that to his benefit. Uh, and a big moment here for Prague, who's been thinking now for over 12 minutes uh, on this critical decision. Queen takes d4, knight takes d4, knight takes g5. Lots of candidate moves and uh, lots of nerves in the, in the room right now, not just for Prague, but for his compatriot Vidit, uh, who's under 15 minutes now. And uh, is a couple moves closer to the time control, but man, this is what we signed up for as commentators. Yeah, I also feel like I have never seen uh, Prague being so nervous. Yeah, normally he controls himself very nicely, but probably he feels that this is such a critical moment and he's about to make a movie. Aruk takes D4 on the board. Ooh, we got to look at the Vidic game. I think, I think. Ali Reza has a chance in that game. I'm so sorry to, to cut you guys off, but I saw the eval bar dropping a little bit and my eyes were immediately drawn to that game. Gukesh versus Hikaru is still dead equal, by the way, for people anxious for an update. It is still a completely equal position. This is where the action is happening. Yeah, so let's go over to that game. Uh, we now see the players on the camera. Wow. Yeah, we'll get the clocks uh, updated in a moment, but... Um, yeah, this one still, I mean, it still looks good to, uh, good to me for white, a couple of pawns up, but for Ruja, he is pressing the randomize button right now, knight takes g4, Ooh. suddenly black has a few pass pawns of his own, knight e3 coming in, anything could still happen here, uh, especially 13 minutes on the clock, we're just at move 25, so 15 moves to make, Vidit, he needs to put his skates on, he needs to hurry up. Wow. Yeah, he's about Either. to make a move. Yeah. Take the rook. So I think he has at least a clear idea what he, how he gonna handle Black's counterplay. Ah, but one of the issues is Queen takes a threatens not just knight e three but also bishop e three, is uh, looming over White's position. And well, I'm not optimistic. Two is Mm -hmm. Yeah, but okay, Queen e two is the kind of a professional way of getting out of this pin controlling things yeah just hitting the knight on g4 on the board really clever move there multi-purpose that pin was black's best hope maybe only hope and uh okay now the material count uh i've got to do a bit of counting myself but it is the exchange up white rook for bishop <laughs> white has an extra pawn it's four versus zero on the queen side on the left half uh, four versus one on the other flank what a weird pawn structure down here <laughs> Yeah, I apologize if I uh, overhyped the situation. I just saw um, a slight dip of the eval bar. I saw 13 minutes on Vidit's clock, and I figured a uh, status update would be nice. Bishop g7, still not over. I'll put it this way. If I had this against Faruja in any time control, I wouldn't be uh, you know, tooting my horn here and getting ready to sign the score sheet. I mean, still rook c8, 95. 
Uh, it's not impossible to imagine Black generating some counterplay. The only reason that this game would take a miraculous turn would be if Vidit uh, succumbs to his nerves, maybe lets his clock dip a little bit too low. But so far, he's proceeding at the right kind of pace. And another excellent move, queen c4. Look at that queen shuttling from side to side. It's working overtime and threatening to infiltrate uh, to that lovely, juicy c7 square. Posted the knight just a couple of moves ago. Now it's the queen's turn uh, to rush up to that square. Yeah, wonderful move, queen c4. By the way, if not queen c4, the move that my heart was screaming for was rook f1 to f4 just to bring the rook to the fourth rank uh, with very similar ideas yeah that's kind of a very typical way of rook b4 rook c4 making sure that everything is under control on the queen side this is a thematic kind huh. of night of night of idea but queen c4 with the idea of queen c7 is of course a very very direct approach and how is black reacting to this Not easy at all. I think Faruja will need to go into a long think here just to even keep the game going, uh, let alone pose any traps, any tricks. Uh, yeah, Vidic just doing everything right. Uh, yeah, all of his fans will be cheering right now. Uh, why doubt him? He's uh, shown great composure to navigate that tricky pin on the A file, uh, that kind of traffic jam of pieces, and now very straightforward plan for white and the extra material should be winning, even with 12 minutes on his clock. Dania, does action elsewhere Ugh. well now the other game every time we switch games the other game suddenly heats up again um hikaru continues to press in an equal position but i'm looking at once again prog versus abasov he did take on d4 with the rook and abasov did make that deflection attempt with g5 g4 so perhaps another turn at that game what do you guys think uh, david i'll put you on the spot as i like to do so often. I just derive great pleasure from that. <laughs> um, and I'll throw it to Peter. <laughs> no, I agree. Uh, let's jump into Abbasov. Uh, uh, his last move, G4. Wow, it's getting re really, really chaotic now. And Peter, your tactic at least is on the board. Um, if we jump over there, Prague needs to avoid falling for the temptation of grabbing this G1. We see it's given a question mark this last move, but very understandable, very human. Just to point out for everyone at home, as, as Peter mentioned in another line, queen takes g4 would lose a piece. The bishop takes c5 and a pin. But uh, what else comes to mind, Peter, if not uh, taking on g4? Where yeah, plug goes knight g5, I think that's kind of the thematic move. And it's on the board, yeah, knight g5, because let's not forget queen take g4 and eventually some queen h3 ideas with queen h7 combined. Is a checkmate idea so maybe this is exactly the line and it was not like uh, Prague was getting nervous because he got nervous he he might have sensed that wow you know what black is getting serious counterplay but in the most natural kind of way with g4 knight g5 i'm the one delivering the tactical blows so for example rook e7 can we fall for queen takes g4 Bishop takes e5, queen h3. Can we deliver a checkmate like this or it's too much? Wow. It wins, Peter. You're totally yes. right. Uh, because yeah, bishop takes f5, way. queen takes f5, g6, we have even queen takes e5. We are collecting the bishop. Rook e5, uh, rook d5. Rook d5. Yes. Or queen c1. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I was going to go back as a coward, but rook d5, as you both say, uh, winning for white extra knight. Wow, do you think this is what Abbasov might have missed? Uh, he's definitely relying on rookie seven now, right? But I think he might have missed queen h3. It's really difficult just uh, move to defend this pawn while simultaneously threatening the checkmate. It will be so easy to get into this position and see, okay, I'm winning a piece. Uh, I'm defending the threats, but suddenly no. Uh, white is the one delivering the, uh, well, going for the attack. Yes, so now what is bishop takes h2 check? Is that a move? And then try to activate the queen to f4, but the bishop on h2 will be trapped, kind of. Yeah, it's uh, maybe that's why king g2, just to stay close to the bishop and also rook h1 coming, opening up the h file. Oof, queen e5, maybe? this is yeah, queen e5. Uh -huh. Trying to get some counterplay. Looks, looks awful, but ah, rook h1, there's bishop takes f5, so maybe. Maybe by the skin of his teeth, 
somehow black is able to make this one work. It's crazy to me that this position is level or <laughs> nearly uh, that black is just about surviving. Looks so scary. But the ball but okay, the two threat bishops. Each threat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The, the two bishop. bishops, yeah, we, we told that in general, all these comp crazy complications, the two bishops should favor black, but we should not forget those incredible knights, knight on c5 and knight on g5, extremely powerful, and also white's centralized pieces, yeah, the look on d4, queen e4 are clearly perfectly placed. Mm -hmm. Not even sure what next, maybe a move like rook d5 to stop bishop f5, uh, maybe we see a queen trade, the black bishop survives, but... Material count, it is level, and white still has this kind of central domination. Um, yeah, I'm going to say anything can happen, though, but a Basov might have to find bishop takes h2 and queen e5 just to keep the game going. Wow, what a crazy game. It started so slowly positionally. My type of style, suddenly it's uh, <laughs> no longer that way. Uh, suddenly it's just uh, pure calculation. Take an h2, queen e5. What's he going to do? He's reaching out here, a Basov. Hesitation. He's up on time. He's got plenty of time on the clock. He needs to get the queens off before it's too late. Wow. <clears throat> I think it's a good uh, kind of... Uh, let me just quickly mention this. Yeah, that for the second time in the game, we are dealing with this bishop takes h2 possibility and, and followed by some queen f4. And then I realized that what kind of queen f4 am I losing my mind? Queen f4 is just impossible because the queen on e4 and look on d4 are, of course, taking away the f4 square and, and lovely uh, Danya that you spotted queen e5 instantly. It was the spirit that I wanted to do with queen f4, but that's the way to do it. And things are still murky. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I was thinking about the line that we just talked about, but yeah, Basov was about to make a move that this bishop takes stage 2, king g2. Queen e5, rook d5, yeah, the so-called professional line. Queen takes e4, knight takes bishop f4. That does white have the time to play rook h1, rook h4 to collect that g4 pawn? Is mm -hmm. that possible or you will have some rook e7, rook e5 again fighting for the f5 square? Or even rook e4 and bishop e7. Oh, rook e4. I was going to say... No, rook... then rook takes g4. Ah, no, because yeah. bishop d5, knight f6, I'm pinned. Oh my yeah, god, yeah, what what a crazy check. But this yeah. is checkmate. And unfortunately, unfortunately, bishop h6 blocks everything. And... But the game goes on. <laughs> White's a pawn up. <laughs> wow. Crazy. Oh my wow. gosh. The dance of the knights. I mean, this is really unique. Like on an open board, knights holding their own against a pair of bishops. This is yes. really, really rare, as you, uh, as you mentioned. Oh. Also, no, it doesn't work, but rook takes e4 instead of rook e5 also has to be considered. Maybe we're too deep into the forest where 2 plus 2 equals 5, but yeah, rook takes e4 and knight e4, bishop b7. If rook d4, maybe you have bishop e5. Mm -hmm. Black is winning suddenly, rook c4. And look <laughs> at, the again, the power of the bishops on full display. Incredible. But white does not have to cooperate, I'm sure. And yet, this is precisely what Abbasov wants. Uh, chances to complicate the game. I'm not sure what the move is here for white. Maybe rook takes g4. But yeah. that should be savable. That should be a savable position. You've got the, the good bishop. You can activate the rook to c8. And um, I'm sure Abbasov would, wouldn't mind something like this, comparatively speaking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But, but of course, we got carried away. Way. Yeah, we, we have to go back. And Abbasov is about to make his move. Let's zoom in. What is he going to do? Yeah, at least we've come to the conclusion that he needs to be accurate here and now. Uh, the margin for error is tiny. So whether or not that variation works out for Black, whether he needs to walk a tightrope uh, just to survive into that endgame that we were kind of analyzing, um, it all depends on this moment. Bishop takes h2 and queen e5. Otherwise, I fear for him. Otherwise, I think he might just get mated. So this might be the only way. But uh, great self-control to keep thinking when he was tempted to make a move earlier. Yeah, I don't focus. see another move, Peter. I mean, I literally, other than rookie seven, I don't see a single other candidate move that strikes me as remotely reasonable. Bishop e5, why would you do that? Then 
rook d5 and you don't have this queen e5 resource. So what could it be? What could be catching his eye? Could he be just double checking that uh, bishop h2 and queen e5 doesn't lose on the spot? Hard to say, always hard to say what's going through the player's mind. Yes, I think that we should highlight one more line. Yeah, in the rook e7, queen take g4, there is also this option for black to play rook e5, hitting the f5 pawn in order to get bishop takes f5, covering the h7 square. Yeah, but then white can switch to queen h5 or set up and deliver checkmate on h8, if I'm not mistaken. Beautiful. Wow. Two different checkmating squares, but this one, uh, queen, knight, and rook. The trio, the combo, this delivers checkmate. Um, wow, yeah, he has to avoid this. I was thinking, Daniel, you mentioned bishop e5, kind of why would you force the white rook to d5? Uh, at least now you get Peter's queen f4, but <laughs> I'm not sure if this changes much. Queen f4. Mm. Uh -huh. yeah. The damned bar doesn't like it, but <laughs> at least maybe something to kind of mull over. At least now you're hitting this knight. Yes, practically okay. speaking, all these kind of ideas uh -huh. make perfect sense. Oh, maybe f6, threatening mate. Oh, oh. this is crazy. <laughs> Oof. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, that's that's a stunner. <laughs> yeah. Getting the My kind of chess. And, yeah, better version for white. So. Okay, Abbasov, this is the key moment in uh, the game so far. Uh, understandably, spending nearly 10 minutes now. Um, yeah, this is the moment for him. In the meantime, just looking over, Faruja struggling on in his game. And uh, Kukesh against Nakamura. Still looks very level to me. Um, Peter, do you think any chances at all? We were kind of talking up potential chances for Nakamura, but... Um, on the top left of our screens, do you think uh, he can hope for more than a draw? Well, this queen e4, g3, king g2 structure is very solid for white. I feel like uh, Gukesh has reacted exactly the way how you have to react in this type of positions. Yeah, this g3, king g2, put the queen on e4, very instructive. Black's bishop on g7, yeah, he's trying to target the b4 pawn with bishop f8, but Okay, it should be easily manageable, but okay, Hikaru is Hikaru. And um, it's so funny that whenever he grinds something out, he always relates to Magnus, yeah? That, aha, you know, I have seen from Magnus doing this and that. And if I look at this position then and have Magnus in my mind, there is still a lot to play for. Peter, you were grinding out positions long before Magnus was uh, <laughs> a great chess player. He should be referencing you. <laughs> yeah, but people have forgotten already about those uh, those grinds, yeah? So I have to refer to Magnus. <laughs> yeah, I guess everyone learns from their peers, their contemporaries, right? And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Nakamura has had great influence on many players uh, of his generation, but Magnus has had a great influence on him. And uh, he needs to channel all of that uh, kind of grinding spirit because it looks so level right now. But uh, the game continues. 26 minutes for Gukesh. Actually, time trouble might play a small part here. Still 15 moves to make uh, in 26 minutes. <laughs> Black's plan, rook d5, h5. Help me out here, Danya. How to get optimistic about this. <laughs> I mean, I would be a little bit apprehensive uh to have this against Sicaro, of course, it should still be equal. Yeah, maybe h4, h5, finish the sort of uh, crossing your, your T's and dotting your I's. Peter Svidler had a funny quote uh, many years ago in a New and Chess magazine issue where he said something like, you know, when I was 15, um, 20 minutes for 10 moves would be seen as at most a minor inconvenience. Now, you know, I see it as terrible time pressure. Um, Gukesh is still in the sort of minor inconvenience phase. He's only 17. Um, but all it takes is kind of a 10 minute think to propel this into real time pressure territory. So maybe you can throw an h4, h5, maybe you can put a rook on a5, because I definitely think the d5 score will not remain unoccupied forever. Uh, that rook on d8 is just pining uh, to entrench itself on d5. Then maybe you could re fianchetto the bishop. So you could kind of pretend uh, that you're tickling white on e5 and on b4. Gukesh definitely is the side that has to remain vigilant. One way to blunder would be queen c4, uh, walking into c5 check. So also don't forget the alignment of the black queen and the white king. Uh, this is not just the players kind of 
trying to reach move 40. Hikaru is definitely uh, in the driver's seat here, and uh, Gukesh has to demonstrate some uh, major caution. Uh, Vidit, in the meantime, doing a great job still, completely winning. That game should be wrapping up um, pretty shortly. And Abasov has, in the meantime, went down the line. We were holding our breath. We can finally release it. He's taken on h2 and uh, slammed the queen onto e5. Good stuff from Nijada Basov. Yeah, but uh, one game you mentioned that might be concluding is that one between Vidit and uh, Faruja. Um, so that's where my eyes are drawn. Vidit, we talked about time trouble, but he's handled it so well. He still has nearly 10 minutes on his clock. Overwhelming advantage now. Um, we see next to the uh, board on the top right of your screens, the eval bar has gone through the roof. Uh, it's nearly turned all white there. Um, white does have a winning advantage. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be shocked at all if this game doesn't last uh, more than another three or four moves. Um, really important as well, I guess. Queen e5 threatens checkmate there. Uh, Ferusha still kicking and screaming, trying to uh, create counterplay, but bit it. And just shutting the door on every single black threat. Really impressive play from him, Peter. Yeah, the look is on the fourth rank. Yeah, look f4 has been also played against queen e5. Clearly, white simply plays look f4 to d4 and uh, stabilizes everything. The knight from d7 has nowhere to go because then white's d6 pawn will also decide the game. That knight needs to block the d6 pawn, but how do you keep the blockade? Uh, it seems like it's it's really over. I, I don't see any miracle happening here. And Vidit gets up, by the way, just to show the confident uh, confidence level. Yeah, that he feels that basically it's it's chess wise it's it's finished. Yeah, he just needs to get up a little bit to to shake up his nerves to to make sure that he controls everything, not to blunder something. Yeah, that's a real boss move, walking around when you've only got nine minutes to make eight moves. Shows uh, the opponent you know you're in control. And uh, yeah, a mark of real confidence from the top players. Uh, just to point out your variation, Peter. Queen e5, yeah, just don't fall for the checkmate on b2. Um, queen e5, rook to d4, and no counterplay. Unfortunately, any checks. It looks like you might pick some material back, but this can simply be blocked. Mm -hmm. Rook d1, and yeah, black resigns simply. But I'm even willing to give back the material. I'm even saying, <laughs> please take it. King A2, B4, Rook D4, total cemento. The knight from D7 has to move. And then I'm going to go D7, D8 and finish. Yeah. Oh, I was waiting for that to make an appearance today, Peter. I've missed <laughs> it. Cemento. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So. This deep one. Okay. On Daniel, the, the deep one. Daniel the deep on David the deep on I would I would say Queen E5 on the board, but Cemento, Memento Mori for Ali Reza Ferruja. Um and, and such a statement win of, of provided that we don't see something crazy. Knight F6 on the board. Okay, time for B7, perhaps. Such a oh, not yet. Uh, queen would hang. <laughs> <Be careful laughs> maybe, move the, maybe move the queen back first. Uh, but barring uh, barring something like Vidit listening to the commentator's advice, huge statement win. I'm very impressed with this technique here. Um, just so confident, uh, maybe not in his body language, but definitely in his moves, uh, taking on a seven, uh, then blocking with the bishop. I mean, th these are not moves that you play if you have no confidence in your technique. So Vidit, uh, doing the psychological work of pushing the results of the previous games away and, uh, you know, telling himself, yeah, you know what, uh, all that talk about me throwing all these games, forget about all of that. I'm back to 50%. And I'm very much uh, in serious contention, uh, despite that difficult stretch of the tournament. Okay, looks like Vidit putting the finishing touches on a lovely and big win that will propel him back to 50%. But we've got plenty of intrigue on this board and on the other boards to keep following. We will take a short break. When we return, three more games in round six of the 2024 FIDE candidates. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more action momentarily.
Looking for some cool merch or a gift for that person who loves chess? We've got you covered in our all new merch store, literally from head to toe. Whether it's a hot date or just hanging out, it's always chess time somewhere. Just ask Mittens. Okay, well, Mittens is just a stuffed toy, so maybe don't ask Mittens. But you can check it all out at chess.com slash shop right now. This is Grandmaster Daniel Narditsky. We are watching Valentina Gunina taking on Ju and Jun, the women's world champion at the 2023 World Blitz Championship in Uzbekistan. And the player is starting off with a pretty conventional opening, uh, a queen's gamut decline, and now a semi to rush as Ju and Jun brings her seapon up to the center. And a big exchange in the center. This is a very, very popular opening. Black takes on d4 and then takes on d5 and now gets an isolated queen pawn on d5. Okay, now the rook comes into d1 and now it's Gunana's turn to launch an offensive and chase the black pieces out of the center. Knight to e7. Ju and Jun has to oblige. And are there tactics? No. Back to home base goes the white queen. Bishop to d5, pinning the knight, forcing the weakening move. F3, Ju and Jun is playing an amazing game with only a couple of seconds on her clock. She's doing a terrific job of sort of keeping the status quo and continuing to induce weaknesses in white's position. But she is still down a queen, and white is still pressuring the king side. Bishop to a7, Gunina has plenty of time on her clock. Queen to d3 was another devilish move. It threatened two checkmates on h7, and actually there was a mate on d8 that was threatened, and so Ju and Jun has to make some luft but g6 is a very weakening move in four seconds as that knight it couldn't decide where to go knight to c6 knight to e4 gunana brings her knight into the game two seconds for jun jun rook to d8 chasing the white queen away oh but that's a pin that rook on d1 is undefended oh gunana blunder that move gunana blundered rook to d8 and now the white queen has nowhere to go she might have to sacrifice the queen back Oh, but that end game is going to be really bad news for white because while well, the E3 pawn is weak, the A2 pawn is weak and that black rook on C4 can infiltrate down to C1 or to the side down to A4. Gunina blundered rook to E8 and with only three seconds, the women's world champion was able to spot that the rook on D1 is undefended and I don't see a different move for white. She might have to play queen takes rook or maybe queen takes knight is a better version of that sacrifice. No, she's going to move back to F4. Gunan is going to keep her queen at all costs. Oh, with two seconds left, Ju and Jun just didn't have the time to capture white's rook on D1 and instead she went G5. She allowed a check. She allowed a trade. Oh, white's going to win. Queen D6 check. What a move. King G7. Another check on H5. That's forced mate. That's forced mate. Knight h5 is made in two. Knight h5 is made in two moves and she finds it. And Ju and Jun stops the clock and graciously extends her hand. She almost came all the way back down a queen, but just didn't quite have enough time to deliver the final blow. All credit to Valentina Gunina for keeping pressure on the board and on the clock. What a game. The playing hall at the 2024 candidates in Toronto, Canada. It is round six. We hope you've been enjoying our coverage. Grandmaster Peter Lecco, Grandmaster Daniel Naraditsky, and GM David Howell bringing you coverage of this important and exciting round where one game ended peacefully, but the other games are anything but Caruana and Nepo drawing their game that seems to have occurred on a different day in a different universe. Right now, uh, we are in Vidit's universe as he is moments away, seemingly, from delivering the final few touches in his game against Perugia. Winning this game will mean so much for his confidence, for his tournament standing. It will propel him to 50%. Let's jump right in. Move number 36. David, the only hope for Perugia, we thought, was Vidit's clock. It seems like Vidit is doing a fantastic job. But with five minutes, he's still 
needs to keep his seatbelt fastened and tied across his lap. And so do we. <laughs> That's right, Danya. My seatbelt's already tightened. I'm ready for this time scramble. But uh, Vidit, yeah, five moves to make in just under five minutes. He should be fine. It's so overwhelming, his advantage right now. But uh, as long as he doesn't blunder checkmate, as long as he doesn't move the white rook off d4, for example, then he should be able to wrap this up. Uh, Peter, what would you say is the most professional way to go about uh, getting to move 40 and winning this game? Well, I'm very tempted to play a move like c3, just blocking that long diagonal and eventually also play rook takes d5, just sacrifice the exchange, destroy black's pawn structure, e takes d5, queen takes d5, then push that pawn forward d7 and then the knight from c5, b7 or a5, c6, join the party and it's on the board c3. I don't see black putting up any resistance. Rook takes d5 will be just crushing. He heard you, Peter. <laughs> exactly what the doctor ordered. Um, yeah, rook to d8, for example, won't change that. You just take the knight. And now he's just inching closer to the time control. It looks like we won't see any surprises here, Daniel. No turnaround in this one. It's just been uh, one mistake in the opening, kind of uh, compounded by maybe a second greedy mistake. Queen takes f2. And Vidit's just given Alariza no chance here. No, I mean, I just, I'm not seeing even a single trick in this last move, C3. You know the word that comes to my mind, but I think Peter has trademarked it, so <laughs> I want to respect it, but it's the, really the best descriptor, right? That queen on F6 and the bishop on G7 just kind of drooping their shoulders collectively. Um, nothing to do on the long diagonal. Black's pawns still on their initial squares. White doesn't even need the services of all his past pawns on the queen side. All he needs is that d6 pawn. And will we see that exchange sack on d5? Um, not obligatory. He could push the rook up to d3. Black does have bishop e3 with a pin. Uh, so we could see an exchange sacrifice in a d slightly different iteration. Um, many roads lead to Rome uh, or to 50% in this case. Yeah, and Vidit about to make a move and he takes it. Of course you take it. Rook takes d5. Practically speaking, it's exactly what you want. You get perfect clarity. And look at those four pawns on the queen side. Look at that king, that wonderful king on a2. Perfectly safe. Not a single check. No ideas. And white's knight on b is ready to join the action uh, via a5, c6. And this d pawn will just decide the game. Yeah. Yeah, we make it sound simple because at this point it is simple. He's done the hard work already, Vidit. And uh, Bishop F4, you can tell uh, with a bunch of time on his clock, he doesn't want to sit here and suffer. Mm -hmm. He's uh, happy to race towards that move 40. I have a feeling once we get there, once Vidit gets that extra time on the clock, we might see a resignation. D7, one square away from touchdown. Yeah, I really like your knight A5 to C6, uh, Peter. Knight mm -hmm. D4 into C6 as well. This one's yeah, over. Queen takes Queen takes f8 was a was a threat that actually forces the rook to uh to its ultimate demise. And yeah, knight d4, I think, might be the last finesse. Every single piece joins the battle while the king watches from you know its air-conditioned castle on a2. <laughs> yeah, it's sitting pretty. That's probably the safest king we'll see throughout the rest of this candidates tournament. Uh, <laughs> impressive stuff from Vidit. Just so professional in everything he's been doing this game. He's reaching for that knight. This is move 39, so his next move should guide him to safety. He still has two and a, two minutes, 40 seconds luxury. That is oceans of time. <laughs> he is going to reach move 40, and he is going mm. to win this game. Knight d4, yeah. bishop e3, rook e5, by the way, and then bishop takes d4, there's rook e8 and queen f8 mate. Another nice touch, perhaps. Uh, that was what Vidit was calculating. Not the only win, but perhaps the most forcing. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. What do we think now? Uh, Perugia, he's well aware that his opponent's made time control. He'll see that extra time pop up on Vidit's clock any moment. Do you think he's going to play on? And if so, how long? Yeah, very, very big question and very difficult one. I assume that uh, the older generation actually prefer to design and get out of the misery as quickly as possible yeah because you are not really doing yourself any favor in a hopeless position to keep on moving around 
after let's not forget the players are sitting there all their emotions are in play of course if you feel like there is the slightest chance you play but there is the handshake clock is stopped uh, Arias resigns the game what a win what a power performance by Vidit Daniel, I think I'm running out of superlatives for him in this game. Uh, just especially on the kind of back of a few tough days, with it just the resolve, the strength of character to kind of uh, like a whirlwind win this game. Uh, just incredible. And he's back on track in the tournament. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gets out of the tailspin. And meanwhile, the tailspin merely intensifies for uh, his opponent, Ali Reza, now two consecutive losses. And uh, this was just, frankly, not a game that uh, you see often at the candidates. Bishop B7, that queen shuttling between B6 and D8. And it's just a debilitated, dejected Ali Reza, who uh, really just got crushed. And uh, great technique by Vidit. His time management has been a big storyline. But this time around, handling everything with the professionalism uh, and the precision that we're used to seeing from him. Vidit back to 50% and another blow for Ali Reza Farusha, but we don't have too much time uh, to summarize and to draw conclusions because two other games are heading potentially toward their conclusion. Uh, Gukesh versus Nakamura, still as level as it gets, maybe the tiniest of tiny pulls for Hikaru. And on the right side, they went down that line we described. Good job, David, spotting Rook to D5. The Queens are off the board, but uh, there's still plenty of intrigue on the board, and Black's King is not exactly dancing for joy uh even with the queens off wow pawn to f6 looks like a really strong move prague uh on that board on the right of our screens there he's going for that black king as you said um there's actually all sorts of mating nets in the air firstly f takes g7 is a big big threat uh followed by opening up the black king white's rook will swing to h1 the other rook might swing to h5 um suddenly those black bishops i know i kind of brag about my love for them uh, I often declare my undying kind of devotion towards the bishop pair, but Max bishops, despite being long range pieces, they're sat at home and dominated by white's knights. Um, Peter, it looks like Prague, at least dynamically, he's uh, more than holding his own here, maybe even uh, kind of forcing Abbasov to be accurate yet again to survive. Yes, well, honestly, I don't really understand this bishop b8, yeah, because we felt like this bishop on f4 was much more to the point for example also in this line yeah then the g5 square would be controlled i i don't really can we get an update on the last couple of moves that why did this bishop retreated to b8 instead of going forward to f4 yeah let's just recap the last few moves uh we left it uh after knight g5 we did predict bishop takes h2 check and uh correctly here abbasov finding the only way to stay in the game queen e5 forced move uh, rook d5 here, just indirectly defending the f5 pawn. And after a queen trade, you're right, Peter. Bishop b8 looks like a mistake. The computer does give it a question mark. Uh, it does look unnatural as well. I guess the only reason I can come up with is that he was scared of being hit by this rook h1, rook h4, rook takes g4. Maybe just tempo by tempo, he didn't want the bishop to be vulnerable, but uh, maybe just kind of uh, not concrete calculation there. And uh, instead, Bishop B8 just played maybe on a more general sense, has walked into F6. Danya. Well, and I see that Danya has some updates, no? Well, mm -hmm. I, this might be off, off the mark completely, but after G6, maybe uh, another contributing factor is there's this move Rook B to D1. And White might fake Black out entirely. Okay, it's uh, with the threat of Rook D8. If the Black Bishop was on F4, sometimes just direct comparison uh, can yield some insight. I think there is the additional defensive possibility of uh, evacuating the other bishop from the eighth rank, and then the rook from a7 can contest the oh. eighth rank. So, yeah, so rook d8, rook a8, and it looks like black has everything uh, more or less stabilized. So, on top of just the physical awkwardness of that bishop on b8 and the fact that it controls a lot less squares on the king side, um, there is the additional uh, fact of the battle potentially shifting to the d-file, but this position just looks absolutely atrocious for many reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if not g6, what else? Uh, I don't even see how you keep the game going. Uh, f takes g7 just looks so scary. 
Yeah, FG7 and then Rook G5 check, Rook H1 checkmate comes immediately, yeah? yeah. And then this. I guess I don't really want to play Rook E8, but could we play the Or I feel like I'm getting mated immediately somehow. <laughs> <laughs> At least I wanted to run to F8 uh, in this variation, but is it Rook H5 maybe? But also ah. at the end of the line, after King F8, Knight F6 seems to win on the spot, no? Because Rook G8 is coming. I'm not scared of King F8. Uh huh. Rook. Rook. Ah, <laughs> oh, Peter looks too strong. Unless. Well, it's easy mm. because <laughs> I got the, the chance to call out the white moves, yeah? So it's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> Can you take <laughs> on F6, David? Can you take on f6? A Ooh. forbidden question, like Ali Reza's queen takes f2. What exactly is the is the mating sequence there? How dare you be that brave, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Ebel Bar has the same problem, yeah. And knight <laughs> f6 and knight d7, even there's a million ways to win. Mm -hmm. Knight is oh, really no, nice. No, I guess not. That's uh, the million. Oh, rook takes d7. No, actually, <sighs> you can play knight c5 to e4 and then steal threaten rook g5, no? Ah, bishop yeah. f4, knight h5. Yes. Peter's on the money. This is really beautiful. Uh, yeah, bishop f4, knight h5. And just to show a mating pattern, um, this is a fork uh, winning the bishop. But just to show a mating pattern here, I wanted to move my rook, but actually I can't, don't even have a safe square. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to play rook d8 and I stopped halfway, but this one must be mate as well somehow. Oh, how about this? Rook h1. You take me. Oh, wait, I'll do it the other order. Rook G5 check first. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to really show this one. Rook oh, one. and that's gorgeous. gorgeous. Yes, exactly. <laughs> same word. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. We are on the same wave. Yeah, so, oof. I don't envy a Basov here. F6. How to even survive? Maybe he has to play Bishop F4 back just to stop all these Rook G5 ideas. <laughs> that would be an admission of uh, an error, and we all know, us humans, we hate to admit we've made a mistake. Yeah, also the question then still, Danya's rook bd1 followed by rook d8 might also be very unpleasant, because that bishop on c8, and we, we come back to this narrative that was hunting black throughout the game, this bishop on c8 has nowhere to go. That's true. I actually think uh, this might be a critical moment. Uh, a mistake would be very natural here. I just, ugh, I just think it's a really, really tough decision. And yes, he's got a bit, uh, kind of a bit of time on the clock here. He's got what thirty minutes more than uh, Prague here. But uh, that small consolation. Look at him on the camera. He looks like he knows he's in big trouble here, Abasov. Bishop B8. Mm -hmm. Yeah, retreating. That's the cause of uh, the trouble now. Well, the move F5, F6 was such a powerful move. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's. Uh, as long as it's not played, one might think like, okay, so what? F6. I have the two bishops. The position will open up, and then suddenly this pawn lands on the board, and it hits your heart. That <laughs> wait a second. Why did I underestimated this move? This is so strong. Attacking, even when queens are off the board. And these knights, so many games in the candidates tournament this year, it feels like the knights are jumping around. And... <laughs> You've called it. Yeah. I think process of elimination, that was maybe the only move, or one of the only moves uh, to survive. Do you mm -hmm. think in his mind? Do you think in his mind he's saying, "Oh, I provoked F6"? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I lost a tempo, yeah, but, but... <laughs> the back. weakening, the weakening, hor horrible looking F6. My coach would call this type of thing saying "sorry," where you make a move and then you basically retract it. And like you said, it's psychologically very, very difficult because uh, you have to show everybody uh, that you were kind of, you know, foolish on the previous move. So kudos actually to Nijat for, uh, you know. It, it takes some it takes some 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 guts to play a move like Bishop F4, but I think this is exactly what he had to do. Um, it doesn't mean Prague is going to be taking off his head. Prague is just going to say thank you for the tempo and maybe play Rook B to D1. 
but um, Abasov walking on hot coals here. But according to the eval bar, looks like he is still very much in the mix for the time being. And 12 minutes for Prague is not uh, definitely not luxurious. Not horrible time pressure, but uh, doesn't give him the time to properly um, to properly deep take a deep dive into this position. Yeah, my big question is that after rook bd1, how is black surviving? Because one of the drawbacks we have seen with this bishop on f4 that gf6, knight takes f6, king g7 will always be met by knight h5 fork. And with rook bd1, rook d8, I want to actually force black to react. He's played it. On, on the board. But can you, you cannot prevent rook d8. I mean, he's not going to play bishop f4 to c7. Can you protect the bishop? Rook c7. Yeah, rook c7. Such Rook a cold-blooded reaction and takes maybe in king h7. Wow. Oh, wow, like this. Jeez. Yeah, this is this is computer stuff. If if Abasov finds this, it will be super impressive because it's so easy to think like, okay, this is lost. Yeah, look at White's active pieces. By the way, Rook BD1 got a question mark by the computer. Okay, insane. Yeah. I mean, Rook BD1 is so natural, but apparently Rook C7 and Black is very much in the game. Critical moment. Abasov has left himself with 25 minutes. But uh, before we continue uh, monitoring this really interesting end game, we do have our correspondent from Toronto, Mike Klein, uh, standing live with one of the heroes of round six, Vidit, uh, on the strength of a crushing victory over Faruja, uh, is offering his thoughts live. Let's pan out to Toronto. Mike, standing live with Vidit. Go ahead. Thanks, guys. We're here with Grandmaster Vidit. The roller coaster continues, but this day it was a fun day for you. You had all these tactics on the D file, sacrifices on B5. Was this an enjoyable game to play? Yeah, for sure. Um, I got like a great position. Um, after the opening, he made this Queen F2 mistake. And after that, it was very apparent that I'm better. The only question was if I can convert it cleanly because I was low on time. Um, but regarding the position, I was like thrilled about it. Yeah, it was a fun one to watch too. Now, during the post-game press conference, you also showed this line where instead of bishop to a7, you would then play knight takes b5 and sack your queen. Was there a little part of you that really wanted to offer your queen? Um, yeah, I, 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 not because it's a queen sacrifice, but just because it felt like I'm exchanging queens and with less time it could be easy. But probably he gets more um, counterplay when I play knight b5. So I was not sure. Um, this bishop a7 is also very nice. It's like this scarp of Unzikar. Um, and he can't really attack my queen. And this felt like my moves are very easy after this. So that's why I went for it. Shockingly, I know that game. Um, you had two losses, but you seemed really disappointed with the draw yesterday. I saw Surya Ganguly comfort you. I know your parents comforted you. What did they say to get you in the right mindset for today? Yeah, the people around me um, showed the positive sign. Like I completely, I got out prepared by Fabi, and I was on my own. And then I managed to outplay him in the middle game. I played like almost all the top choices. So. That was the bright side and they made me uh, focus on that. So that gave me confidence that, you know, even world number two, I can uh, outplay if, despite getting out prepared. So, uh, but still, when I look at the scorecard, it was still disappointing, but uh, that's what this had told me. Well, there's many ways to get to 50%. You've done it the hard way, two wins, two losses. I think you're gaining some fans, but is all of this variance taking a toll on you? Yeah, for sure. Um, there are lots of ups and downs and you need to be mentally very strong. Um, it's not easy um, because every day it's like a lot of fluctuation of emotions. Uh, but that's something that I have to get a better hold on and uh, work on that. And finally, besides the advice of your second and your parents, what else do you do to uh, erase the memory from a bad loss? Because I imagine we have a lot of viewers at home that know all about the pain of this game. Yeah, it never really goes, I would say. Uh, but I went to the gym after the game, tried to burn it out and remove all my frustration there. Partially helps, uh, but then I was not able to sleep properly at, in the night. So it was still there, but it's okay. It's part of it, and um, now I can't really change it. I have to focus on the remaining eight games. All right, well, we'll see you in round seven tomorrow. We'll see you in the gym sometime soon. Now back to you in the studio, guys. 
All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jim Bro. Uh, Vidit with a crushing victory over Ali Reza Faruja. I think that's going to be the next big Twitter quote. It's just, I went to the gym, Vidit. So one way or the other, uh, he managed to put aside the memories of three consecutive disappointing results, two losses and then a draw, coming right back to 50%. Gotta feel happy for Vidit. He's a crowd favorite. Uh, he's so classy and it's gotta feel so good for him uh, to score such a confident point. He's right back into the mix. And in the meantime, perfect timing. Abbasov has found Rook C7. Peter, there, there's so much to talk about here. Uh, where do we go from here? Super impressive. Yeah, what a defense. Yeah, Rook C7, I have completely missed it. And the big question is, did Prague miss it? Because it seems like uh, he kind of felt like he has everything under control. Everything goes exactly according to the plans. And this is what you want to what you want to feel when you have only 12 minutes on your clock, yeah? So if suddenly some new challenges appear and this new motive that actually after Rook D8, Black can simply trade and that King gets to H7 and all of a sudden David will be super excited about the prospects of of the pair of bishops coming to life, yeah? This is, the, the game is getting completely out of control. Time trouble is becoming a factor here. David, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I'm in the same boat as you, Peter. I would have missed Rook C7 as well, I think. Uh, this really ice-cold, calm defensive move. Uh, Prague, I mean, he knows he must still have an advantage, but like you say as well, in the back of his mind, the longer it goes without him converting or kind of tra transforming his advantage into maybe an extra pawn, an extra material, um, or maybe trading off one set of knights for bishops and kind of maintaining a bind, the longer that goes, the more nervous he'll get. And 10 minutes for eight moves, mm. it might sound like a lot of time compared to Vidit earlier, but in this type of position, it's easy to panic, easy to kind of suddenly look at the clock, think, oh, I need to trade pieces and suddenly go into a bad end game with white. Uh, things would start turning, momentum turning. Mm -hmm. That being said, I'm wondering how black defends against like Rook H5, just going for checkmate type of ideas. Mm. Sure. I mean, <laughs> I'm assuming it's not checkmate because I see the eval bar, but uh, from a human point of view, still looks very good for white. Yeah. Black doesn't have time to celebrate. And Peter, I think I defer to you on Rook H5. Just to restate for maybe people who just came in, why is Rook C7 so good? It's a prophylactic move. Uh, and it's a prophylactic move that doesn't prevent uh, the intended move by Prague, but rather takes the sting out of it. So Rook D8 was such a strong threat uh, because it threatens rook takes f8 and rook takes d8 checkmate. But now black can actually simply take the rook. Earlier that was impossible. Now you can see the idea. The bishop on c8 is protected and uh, white's initiative fizzles out. This would be a dead end. And I agree, David. I think uh, the hard part now for Prague with his time pressure is readjusting, accepting, yes, I missed this move. I might have to kind of do what Abbasov did uh, on the previous move with bishop f4, sort of admit your mistake and maybe shift from the D file to the H file. Peter, what do you think is the best approach here for Prague? How do you maximize your chances after this disappointing turn of events? Well, now also Prague comes to terms that probably Rook BD1 was uh, a mistake, yeah? which we, we have seen that the computer highlighted immediately. I didn't understand yet why it was a mistake, but yes, Rook C7 stops all the action on the D file. And when David suddenly revealed that, okay, let's not forget that we can play against Black's King still with Rook H5, then I got once again excited for White's uh, prospects because how is Black really reacting to Rook H5? Yeah, maybe we just jump in briefly just to show how scary it is for Black. I'm still struggling to find a defense, I must admit. Um, big <laughs> threat of just <laughs> Rook H1 and mating ideas unless it's something to do with putting a bishop on h6 at some point but um that feels really flimsy um really kind of uh not a safe construction for black i do wonder whether black can also take on f6 ah, at some point but then knight f6 and knight d5 i was about to ask the same yeah. exact question and rook d8 at the end oh but then ah. the rook just moves oh just to Where? show but there's rook takes c5 and bishop no it doesn't work actually maybe it does Rook D8? <laughs> oh my god. Trying to calculate here, but oh, getting headaches. No, this is, this is losing. Yeah, Rook H1, I think, should be winning for white. Maybe maybe Rook C1 to be super 
Uh, yeah, Rook H1. And you wanted to Rook point H7. out this one. But, uh, yeah. Rook H7 in this position with a check. And either the Black King has to march forward and lose this bishop with a check, or it goes back and gets probably just mated somehow. Um, yeah, so, okay, it's still not over. Still, Rook H5. Unless it's something like hmm, Rook C6 to try and take this pawn. What is White's threat, I wonder, Peter? Go ahead. Does White actually have a clear threat here? Well, actually, it's a big spoiler, yeah, that the intended Rook DH1 delivering checkmate can be answered by Bishop H6, and I'm still struggling to find the mating construction, which is, <laughs> which is kind of very annoying. It seems like Black's position should fall apart, and all of a sudden, I don't see a mate. So Rook C6 might be an op option, yeah, just to play Rook C6. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So calm. Ridiculous. Rook H1, Bishop H6, come on. And he's played a move, Prague. I was just going to say, maybe even Pawn takes Pawn here, but Bishop H6 as a minimum. He's played Rook to D4. Wow. Creative. But we've got to ask ourselves the same question. What's the threat? Looks well, nice. but this bishop, this bishop on f4 is so shaky and it has nowhere to go. Yeah, actually, it's a very nice move by Prague. Yeah, that's what we're taught when we learn chess, right? Centralize. It's all about the <laughs> midfield. If you control the central <laughs> squares, you control the game. <laughs> Look at those pieces. Yeah, exactly. Beautifully highlighted. Yeah, this. Uh, I have. I think I have never seen this construction. Yeah, these four pieces like this lined up. It's a unique configuration. Yeah, he needs to relocate this knight later, d3 and into e5, just for aesthetic <laughs> value. But yeah, it's a nice move to play, hitting this bishop on f4. Um, mm. oof, it's so hard to even find moves as black. Yeah, rook e8 maybe, but okay, at first I was going to say that succumbs to rook d8, then I remembered, wait, <laughs> rook d8 is no longer dangerous. <laughs> so maybe, like, I guess that would help us clarify what white's next move is. And... Let's remember that Prague can play also positionally here. It's, we're looking for the knockout, but he could play at some point like f takes g7 and then try to move the knight away from e4. Because if he leaves himself with the knight on c5 against the bishop on c8, it might not be you know exactly what he wanted, but it would it would leave him with some practical chances in the end game. But terrifying position for a boss up. Yeah, there in that construction, I'm actually looking forward for black to take on d6 and play a6, a5 because of the hanging knight on c5. That that kind of saving construction I'm having in mind for the last couple of uh, minutes, yeah, that because eliminating that weakness from a6 would probably give me drawing chances. Mm -hmm. By the way, close to draw in Gukesh versus Nakamura, they might be repeating moves, but... No sense for us to get distracted. If that game ends, we'll bring you the, the results. But nothing happening there at all. It's still very, very level. And uh, Hikaru contemplating a repetition. Go ahead, David. We'll go to the bird's eye view for a second here. Yeah, I think a uh, good moment to call this. Uh, Daniel just feels like White's got the perfect construction, just full stability. Uh, I want to say the C word cemento again, but uh, <laughs> uh, Peter, I should have left it to you. Yeah, this looks like uh, he's very safe. Just too much pressure on black C6 pawn. No way for Nakamura to improve. Um, yeah, draw is the logical result. But again, the game might continue. You mentioned the repetition, Daniel. This is, uh, yeah, it does look like the players, they're just kind of going back and forth. Uh, Black's rook was previously on this square. And, oh, uh, and they're repeated again. Because the Ooh. rook was on b6. So if Gukesh plays rook c1, I think it might not be three time, though. It might be two time, and maybe Hikara will keep it going until the time control. Well, I would just uh, like to add one thing that I'm really impressed the way how Gukesh handled this position. Because now that things are completely under control, one could assume that, ah, it was easy. I had the feeling just one small inaccuracy, and Black would have really gotten some something to play with and uh, sometimes by making sure that you don't give your opponent the slightest of chances it shows some true mastery yeah and uh, we mentioned it earlier in the show uh, i mean he's just 17 years old and uh, even just 
five, 10 years ago, if you were playing a teenager, you'd say, okay, this is, this is the perfect type of position. You kind of take all the tactics out of it. You take the sting out, they get bored. They don't know where to put their piece and you just kind of grind them down, but not anymore. <laughs> this is the new age and yeah, so universal. Look at Nakamura peering over his shoulder there. I think maybe just checking out the other games, uh, the other results, but that's normally a sign when someone starts looking away that uh, they're ready for the game to end. And mm. Bishop e3, okay, another forcing way of trying to simplify. If Black plays rook takes b4, I guess just queen takes c6, and this should be a draw. Yeah. Ikaru giving it away now. I think you can <laughs> tell on his face he's uh, he knows this is just level. Yeah, that's it. Rook takes before queen c6 is one way to draw. Rook a6 probably also possible. I don't think Ukesh will get go to adventures, but we will get total liquidation and an imminent draw. Maybe a little bit of disappointment. I think Hikaru felt perhaps that he had a smidge of an advantage, but I don't think there was anything realistic. I think Peter nailed, uh, hit the nail on the head there. Uh, just really mature handling of uh, what at some point looked a little bit like an unpleasant position, but Gukesh. Uh, confidently holding his own and after the queen trade i think the score sheets will be signed once we hit move 40. yeah absolutely i also want to highlight that because the h4 h5 moves are included that's why black's idea sometimes which is connected by going some h6 g5 king h7 king g6 is not possible yeah because the structure is fixed on the king side this makes also all the more easier for white uh, not to worry at all and a handshake in the next couple of moves is very likely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still plenty of time on his clock. 14 minutes, Nakamura, but that won't change anything. Queen trade almost guaranteed here, or I guess the rooks uh, at the very minimum. And okay, it looked like he was, was he reaching for his bishop there? That would be <laughs> a bit of a surprise. Bishop e7, <laughs> yeah? Cemento. Cemento. <laughs> <laughs> but why? Why not just trade the queens? <laughs> I guess if White's Rook gets to the 8th rank, there might be some tactics. But uh, yeah, easily avoidable. Just checking his score sheet for move 40 there. Uh, Hikaru, they're at move 37 currently. Yeah. Dan, yeah, I think mm -hmm. we're feeling the same way Hikaru is right now. He knows it's a draw. It's just how to get there. Yeah, I mean, we've kind of exhausted the things to say about this position other than literally every move. Even queen b8 probably is a draw, though why would you leave the queens on the board here? I don't really know. But Hikaru sometimes likes to uh, elect the flashy continuation here. He's really thinking deeply about this position. I mean, queen takes c6 and rook b8, bishop e7. Uh, choose your pick, and either way, we're going to get a draw agreement, I think, on move 40. So this is purely a uh, kind of academic choice just to tell us what moves were played uh, to reach time control. <laughs> He's spending a while, though. He's been thinking for solid, you know, three, three and a half minutes. Uh, yeah, but on the other hand, his body language does not signal that he is thinking because he believes there is something. It's It's more like Look at this, he's flipping also with his fingers. Yeah, a little bit like, okay, I can do this, I can do that, but it does not change anything. The other game also getting really heated, by the way. But of course, I know everybody likes to, to see the handshake. And finally, we're going to get a move by Hikaru. And shockingly, he trades queens. <laughs> and and he goes, Cemento. Yeah. Back with the rook. Important <laughs> <laughs> to stop rook c8. And yeah, I think a draw off at any moment would be logical from either side. But sometimes a bit of pride from uh, the players. Uh, I don't know about the two of you, but I was always reluctant, even in positions like this, to be the one offering a draw. I would rather let my opponent get on their knees and beg and uh, <laughs> propose the draw. <laughs> well, actually, white can even play a construction like bishop to g5 and then push f to f4. And make sure that this bishop stays on the on, on f6 and then black's king is also in a mating net. That's why I can afford myself to weaken my structure. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let's uh, place a bet. Who do you think is going to offer the draw? <laughs> By the way, what are the rules? Uh, is it move 40 or when, when are the players allowed to offer? Yes, I'm pretty confident it's move 40. I, I don't know the technicality, like can White offer a draw once he's made his 40th, but we're both players. Yeah. Mm -hmm. F4, Bishop G5, I mean, riveting complications here in this end game. Really some imbalances that we haven't addressed yet in the pawn structure and in the pieces. <laughs> yeah, it's currently move 38, so uh, the next move 39. Um, yeah, two more moves from Gukash, and he might be the one to offer. Um, oh, okay, bishop oh. c5. <laughs> what a move. <laughs> Hikaru checking. Okay. Which move is it? When can we go home? Any moment now. King g7, King g7. draw offer. <laughs> yeah, looking for the arbiter. And there we go. We have a, another result. It is a draw between Gukesh and Hikaru Nakamura. Um, decent result, an expected result for a long time uh, for both of them. Uh, very balanced game, Peter. Yes, very balanced, but uh, one has to say that the opening choice worked to perfection. Yeah, Hikaru never had problems. He equalized quite easily. He even might have had the slightly preferable position, but uh, Gukesh did excellent job not giving any practical chances to Hikaru. And uh, that leaves us with one game remaining as these players discuss the nuances, the little details, um, as they hold a little post-mortem between each other. But okay, that means all eyes on Pragnananda against Abbasov. And uh, can the uh, other Indian teenager in this field score an important victory? It does look like centralization is the name of the game in that one. Uh, White still mm -hmm. holding a small advantage. He has for a long time. Sabasov defending really tenaciously. And so we see Gokesh set his pieces back to the starting squares for the next game. And uh, yeah, let's move over. Uh, this is the current position, knight d6. Peter, you mentioned that this was an idea, but after this knight uh, on d6 were captured, you wanted to get a5, and that might no longer be possible here. Yeah, well, can we just see the last two moves that in which move order did we reach this? So let's jump in as uh, we ah. approach the time control. Yeah, so it was rook 1, d4, and then black played the move rook c6, hitting the pawn on f6. That was the move order. And yeah. now knight d6. So big threat of rook takes bishop. I'm assuming there are some other threats, maybe knight takes c8 or f takes g7. I mean, two moves come to mind for me. One is to take the bishop, most forcing, but uh, also to take the knight with the bishop. Um, but yeah, this looks like a really sad endgame because white might get two versus zero on the queen side uh, in the near future. This looks really scary with the two pawns marching. The other move that comes to my mind, but <laughs> again, I'd be reluctant to calculate is bishop e6. Exactly. Super forcing. What a move. Knight e6, f e, f7, rook f7. What is the Super move here? Forcing. Oh, rook f7, knight f7 loses the bishop on f4, so you have to move the king. King h7, yes, you play king h7. Wow, I missed that detail, but <laughs> king h7, luckily. Uh... And what is white's move? Oh, yeah, I haven't five, seen maybe. the move Rook c5. Ah, okay. Wow. wow. But is this that great? I mean, it saves the knight, so big achievement there, but rook d7? And, oh, maybe this allows rook c6. So you want to make sure you keep the a pawn alive, especially in a rook end game. The worst thing to allow is the connected passers. But still, I think this would be a big step forward for Abasov. This is why he's been thinking for so long, spending almost half of his remaining time. Will we see bishop e6? Good spot, David. And I think that might be a big, big resource. He's survived the big test so far. Can he, can he find the critical move once again? Uh, process of elimination. I mean, what else? Maybe he can move this bishop, but it feels really odd to allow these knights to live um, just kind of dominating the whole board. Uh, so a move like bishop h6 just feels all wrong. At the very minimum, I guess white could... G5. Wow, G5 on Whoa. the board. 
Oh uh oh. Impressive. Um, yeah, but hmm. things are getting out of control. Takes <sighs> on C8, that blue arrow, not a good sign for Nijad. And then the knight from C5 can drop back to E4. And that's what worried me initially about this move, apart from its aesthetic, just looks terrifying to play. Um, knight takes C8, the blue arrow, so the computer's first choice by far. How easy do you think that is for Prague? Um, will he be looking at not, alternatives? Not easy at all. Yeah, but mm -hmm. also Black has the other king h7, king g6. Yeah, that's the human way of looking at things. Yeah, if Black gets this, then things are at least becoming very double-edged. And actually, bishop e6 might just be a threat now uh, compared to the other variation. Uh, because now this black bishop is defended on f4, so the tactics might just work in Black's favor. So actually, maybe knight takes c8, again, process of elimination, might be the only one. Uh, the only move, or at least by far the safest move uh, for Prague right now. Under five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes for six moves. I mean, major time pressure. Knight c8, knight e4, at least two quick moves you can rattle off and minimize the risk. But it's easier said than done to give up such a knight. Uh, it's the usual trap. Once you see the moves on the board, of course, it's the most logical thing you can do. But uh, I'm sure he's calculating other possibilities. The immediate knight e4, knight d4 is also on the table. Yeah, but yeah. practically speaking, I also like this g7, g5. It's it's a clever move, yeah? It, the opponent is in time trouble. You keep all the tension, not allow any liquidation into some worse... And Prague goes for it. Bravo. He does. Yeah. If I were Abbasov here, I would be sad to see that move. No bishop pair anymore, but uh, at least Black is holding things together for now. And rook d8, oh. exactly. Going after the a6 pawn. This was the move that also came to my mind how do you react because takes this king h7 rook a8 going after a6 wow okay the question mark appears but i think we can ignore that very human approach and uh it's a very ah. difficult position anyway it's just a race now it looks like white's going to go for the a6 pawn but black's king is going to come in and take the f6 pawn but i think that maybe even king h7 trying to give the the a6 pawn because if knight a, rook c8 rook c8 knight a6 then rook c2 with counterplay with g3 that would be my kind of take trying to create counterplay yeah and black rook if it ever gets active but he takes against the white king okay but by the way you can do the same thing rook a8 rook d6 can be tried and avasov has shown a propensity for choosing these more tactical defensive approaches after rook a8 though it just feels like it feels like black must have something because white is taking a while uh to eliminate those pawns even bishop c1 uh, i was trying to calculate bishop c1 a4 so hard to make sense of that with your time dwindling i'm really really not sure and first of all rook a8 not necessarily forced but he does play it and now a yeah, huge but... moment for abasov yeah, rook d6, your rook d6 move, and then rook entering to the second rank with rook d2, that king on g6 will stay perfectly safe. The knight on e4 is shaky, yes, yeah? so knight e4 tempo can be simply be met by rook e2 hitting that knight on e4. So things are becoming murky, a little bit like a Berlin type endgame. Definitely. And we've seen a lot of this actually in the last few days of the candidates in the last few rounds, Rook and Bishop versus Rook and Knight. Uh, normally you would tend to think that Rook and Bishop work better than Rook and Knight, but of course the added spice of the uh, outside pass pawns for White. Uh, so no Rook trades. He No. Ooh, no, he no. Rook F6 is wrong. This exactly Rushed plays it. into White's idea. Yeah, Rook A6. Now White wins. Oof. You saw the nerves as well. He dropped the pawn. He fumbled as he was taking on f6. Yeah, it's understandable, but it's a bit materialistic. It's not about pawns here. It's about speed. It's a race. Um, now mm -hmm. Black's king can't come to g6 easily. Oof. Uh, I'm not sold on the evaluation here, but Prague has one more move to make. I mean, th there's no sense trying to flag him. Take two, three more minutes. Uh, you never know what resources might appear. Yeah, Abasa, I think, getting a little bit impulsive there. But what is the Cemento move? Like here, it's always this scenario. Move 40 always turns out to be an important decision and you never have enough time for it. Peter, what is your instinct here? Uh, how does White eliminate the counterplay and prepare to push those passers on the queen side? 
yeah, it's not so trivial, yeah, because the first move would be like rook c6 preparing b5, but rook c6 is met by rook d5. And again, black activates the rook, uh, then this rook d2 idea appears. There is also this uh, question like knight d3, moving the knight back, but then also rook d5 comes and knight takes f4, g takes f4, what is this rook endgame? It's not so easy to evaluate it with, uh, with little time on the clock. Although there is rook f6 at the end there, which... Yes, but still, rook d4, yeah, and then king g7 is coming with uh, a tempo. I'm not so sure. Knight e4 mm -hmm. also would stop rook d5, but it does allow rook e... Ah, rook e5, yeah, knight f6 with the fork. Ah, wow, okay, then knight e4 is very interesting. Knight e4, does that force black to waste a tempo, an important move on king g7, just to stop any knight checks? Probably. What then? What then? then rook, is the problem? Rook a five there, maybe. Is that? Oh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's the reaction. Yeah, to rook a five. What Fantastic a move! Stuff. The rook is trapped, and that knight versus bishop endgame is lost. Does black have a move there? King g six. No. Maybe. Maybe. Oh. Knight e4 is yeah, hard to should spot, be though. lost, yeah? Then a4, you just keep on pushing. <laughs> yeah, Prague will find it. He has only one minute left, but he's already thinking for quite some time, and he will find it. He's so sharp. Okay, big moment. He might well just burn his clock down the whole way to three or four seconds, and then play the move. <laughs> might as well. He'll get extra time. That's a key moment. He wants to avoid any counterplay for black. Mm -hmm. Basov desperately calculating as well. Okay, what are seconds. your predictions? I don't think it's going to be 94. I think it's a tough move. I think it's difficult. It's a tough move, but he's a tough customer, yeah? So he can, <laughs> he tough can cookie. find it. Yes. 20 seconds. Here we go. And he does it. Knight. He does it. Yeah, he is moving towards the knight. What a badass. Oh. No, but knight d7. No, knight d7. Wow. Also the good. Same maybe. idea. Yes. Same idea. Wow. King g7, rook a5 from the other side. You're holding the f6 square. Wow. And you're holding b8. So he's really ensuring that black can't trade on a5. Look at the domination there of the knight over the bishop. All of the squares on the g1a7 diagonal will be covered. That's some crazy geometry. Yeah, and let's just highlight that the rook on f5 is trapped, yeah, because the only square is like d5, which is running into knight f6 fork. What a, what a vision, yeah, because actually Prague had to envision this uh, when going for all this uh, knight x8, rook d8 operation. And uh, our intuition was that rook takes f6 is the long imagine black would i mean white would have a pawn on f6 it would have black yeah because white would not have access to this f6 square for his knight i've got to say 97 is a mark of genius i mean yeah just to see that move when you have 20 seconds on your clock to evaluate it to choose it over several other tempting moves i mean it's not intuitive at all it's kind of going away from the center looks like you're hitting thin air but he clearly saw 94 and found a better Kind of better way of doing things big threat of winning a pawn big threat of trading sorry rook a5 trading rooks wow mm -hmm. just star quality from the youngster there and white pawns are also just rolling 97 it stops the black king ever getting to f8 or f6 or ever journeying over to the queen side if the rooks disappear just, just genius D david just uh, sorry that I interfere, but can you give the double X clamp to this knight design because this really deserves it if we can manually give it? Let's do it. Good call, Please, Peter. because yes, knight D7, amazing move, amazing <laughs> move. Wow. Yeah, I want to turn it into a a bomb as well. <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> Big done. surprise that move. And. Oh, yeah, Basov. Abasov now has three minutes to make his 40th move, and the irony is that he's left himself with so much time, but if only he'd spent it two moves earlier, that one automatic move, Rook takes F6, again, coming so close, maybe not completely lost. I mean, maybe King G7, 
rook a5, king g6, and he's hanging by a thread. So uh, let's not, um, you know, let's not bury him yet. But right now he's got to make, make one more move before time control. Yeah, but the point is that after this king g6, white has this extra move a4. And then already you are starting to trade the rooks and a5 and the pawn queens. Hmm. Oof, two minutes now Bad for news. Abasov. 97, yeah. One of the moves of the day for me. So subtle, but uh, so effective. So hidden. And also, how got... much how much Prague is enjoying his knight disarm move? Yeah, he's standing there in front of Abasov. He's so excited that, and so pleased, yes, I found this amazing move. Maybe black has to move the bishop just to avoid the rook trade. Rook a5 just looks like the biggest threat of all. Um, looks like a killer threat. Oh. Bishop d d2, c1, maybe bishop c1. Oh, but rook f6 is also sometimes a threat. Oof. Yeah, but also just a4, yeah? Then the pawns are queening. Black has no counterplay. Yeah. I initially wanted mm -hmm. bishop d2 to go bishop e1, but even after bishop e1 arrives, then rook f6. <gasps> At night. Or night f6. <laughs> Shut the door. That is a, a turbo Superman night right there. And Prague standing over the board. I, I'm glad that was highlighted, uh, Peter. It's like, you know, Picasso standing over his work. Like, yeah, I did that. And uh, now I'm going to watch you suffer. But, uh, of course, you will have to get back to work. But there's nothing wrong with a brief moment of enjoyment. Um, why else are we playing? The geometry just is stunning to me. Rook a, a6 back to a5. What a construction, and it's honestly just like study-like, uh, the way that white's pieces cooperate, the way that the bishop on f4 blocks the rook from evacuating forward. It can't go backward because of that knight on d7. It, knight d7 to me is more, much more aesthetically pleasing and maybe even just flat out stronger uh, than its cousin, knight back to e4. So amazing stuff, but right now, 45 seconds for Nijat has to make a move, and then... 30 minutes are added to his clock. Ooh, we see in his face, he's nervously peering over the clock. He, a little shake of the head. He's trying to hide it, but he, yeah, shocked to see that 97 move just as we were. And he's uh, struggling now, 20 something seconds. The urgency visible on the camera here. What to do? We don't see any move here that, uh, mm -hmm. that fights for black. King G7. King. Yeah, but he plays it like with the resignation. Yeah, you could see it on his face that he had no time. He had to make a move. But yeah, he knows exactly King G7, Rook A5, it's over. And A4, Peter, you pointed it out. A4 at the end just ends the game. Black is in Zugzwang. Yes. He's packaged away. And oh my gosh, it's this might just end in a couple of moves. Maybe we should show this on the board or maybe not because I think Prague uh, will not leave us waiting for too long. He's already... He's already calculated this win even before reaching the time control. Yeah, yeah look at this. It. He came, he came back to the board and he can hardly hardly wait to make this move. Yeah, he writes it down, but in in his mind, he already knows that look a five king g six a four is happening. Yeah, just so professional though, controlling that urge, that itch to play the move instantly, double checking his calculation, sipping the water, such maturity. But ultimately he set it up. Rook a5 is the logical continuation and he's going to win this game. Um, it's unthinkable that he'll play anything else. The black rook otherwise will get active via d5. And yeah, the rook trade leaves the white pawns to run on the queen side. I think we'll see it. Um, I don't think even we need to show it down yet, but uh, he's going to demonstrate it for us, the winning technique here. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. Poor Abasov. <sighs> Got a feel for him. Just coming up against genius and gameplay. But this is the candidates. Yeah, This is what we are expecting from the players, and that's why we always felt like, yes, Abasov is a very strong player, but he's up against the very very best in the world yeah and that's why we are so worried for him yeah it's just not easy to fight these monsters mm -hmm. yeah it's he's got a tough task and 
on the one hand, uh, you know, the pressure is off. Nobody's expecting him to, you know, to go 50%. But uh, once you start, once you enter the meat grinder and you start losing games, it can be so easy to lose whatever confidence you came in with. And he made some, some nice confident draws, um, held Jan, held Hikaru, but uh, just suffering with the black pieces, uh, suffering for what seems like the whole game. And even though he's got his chances, he just isn't always able to demonstrate the same level of precision in critical moments uh, that we've gotten so used to from all of his opponents and definitely from Pragnananda, who just continues to wow uh, with his maturity, his approach to chess, and uh, his ability to play a very wide variety of openings uh, and demonstrate filigree precision, even with the clock ticking down a4. I think that's the secret sauce. And that might trigger resignation because Rook takes f5 and a5 is, I think, to my eyes, unstoppable. Yes, yeah. I, I have the same feelings. And I do recall reading some very early interviews from Prague from a couple of years ago that his favorite chess book is the book by Dvoretsky and Pervakov, this endgame tactics. Yeah, and if we know exactly what kind of material you are witnessing in that book, and then you relate it to this uh, position with knight d7 and everything that is together, it's basically one of uh, one to include in a new edition. Yeah, it's just Prax's uh, answer to this book and what he has learned from it. Yeah, so impressive. You saw him tapping his head there, Prague. He's just calculating, he's just counting. And this construction, the white knight totally dominates the black bishop. Just literally, as you pointed out earlier, Daniel, just no way to stop the white a pawn just cruising, strolling down the board. White's going to make a new queen pretty much by force. That's why the eval bar on the left of uh, the board there has rocketed sky high. Yeah. Pass off. He's just got to pray that a4 won't happen, but uh, it's so logical. And... Prayers not answered. Yeah, there it is. And uh, he's got no answer for a for that a pawn. I mean, just I keep coming back to this line: rook takes a five, b takes a five, and even without uh, the supplementary pawn on a four, it would still be losing. Just like out of a study, I mean, it's a good visualization exercise for the viewers. Imagine rook a five, b a five, both the c five and b six and b eight squares are controlled by that knight on d seven. The f pawn controls the e three square. Literally everything is dominated, everything is controlled, and Abbasov trying one last desperate, desperate throw of the pawn. What is the most precise one here? Can you still take the rook and play a5, or does that blunder something? Uh, I think you can, <laughs> although the black king does get nearer. No, it wins. Takes an a5. G takes f2. a6. G takes f2. Okay, bishop e3. And knight, and knight c5, c5. I think. Whoa. Okay. The knight I, I know how Danya, uh, Danya's <laughs> mind is working. Yes, I spotted <laughs> immediately knight c5. Thanks that you were confident enough to go for the line. And mm -hmm. Most importantly, Prague is confident enough to go for the line. <laughs> it's always easy from the side. I think we'll see that variation we mentioned play out. Knight c5, the killer touch at the end, but very forcing, very linear, very direct. And... Vasov, he's going to capture white's pawn on f2. He needs to create a square for the black bishop to try and defend, but not enough. Yeah. Ignore. I think I'll, yeah. After knight c5, we'll see the handshake. Wow. Here we go. A new queen, soon to be born. The pawn on b4 plays the auxiliary role. It's like Oscar for supporting actress. Without that pawn, the knight would not have been able to intercept the bishop. Perhaps bishop e3, b5 is also winning, but far less aesthetically pleasing than just the, retre the retreating knight move. Having done its job on d7, and what a job it did on d7, the knight moves back triumphantly uh, to deliver one last crushing blow uh, to Abbasov's hopes of a good candidate's tournament. Yeah. Resignation here, resignation on the next move. The result is not in question. And Pragnananda continues just to impress. Big, big win right here in round six.
Yeah, he will be back to plus score, yeah, because uh, let's not forget he started with this very unfortunate loss being too aggressive against Gukesh in the second round or when it was. And then he bounced back with two victories and he will be plus one, just half a point behind the leaders, all to play for. Yeah, and uh, he just needs to look ahead. Today has been a great display of uh, calmness from Prague, but uh, he shouldn't look to the past. Missed opportunity yesterday. Imagine if he'd beaten Jan Nepomnishi uh, after that opening prep from a dominant position. He would be the sole leader right now. Um, yeah, just incredible. Or at least he'd be joint leader uh, with Gugash. But uh, yeah, it looks like in the meantime, Abasov coming to terms with things. Yeah, just tough, tough scenario for him. Again, with Black, unfortunately, it's tough against the top players in the world. Yeah. And there we go. Yeah. Resignation by Abbasov. What a performance by Pragnananda. And he's up there with a plus one score, half a point behind the leaders. Wow. Just a tour de force, particularly the, the final few moves are going to be replayed. Uh, they're going to be in the recap articles and uh, just another feather in uh, the cap that ha now has many, many feathers. Pragnananda's wins. Um, this definitely might go into his best wins collection. Move of the day, as David pointed out, move 40, knight d7. Another statement win, two statement wins today by uh, the Indian players. Uh, Vidit crushing Farusha and now a clinical positional effort as Pragnananda defeats Nijat Abbasov. That concludes the games from the open section. We've got two draws, two decisive games, but you are not going anywhere because our coverage is not concluded. We'll have uh, some summaries of the proceedings. We'll have a game recap and other great stuff. But uh, before we go on a break and get that ready, we wanted to remind you that if you're watching the stream without subscribing on Twitch, that means you're missing out on all the emote action that takes chat to another level with sub-only emotes updating for every event. Your subscription unlocks reactions of players like Bobby, Takaru, and hosts like me. You can even use your Prime uh, to claim a free subscription. So use exclam subscribe in chat now to level up. And on that note, folks, don't go anywhere. We'll be back with our summary of the round and the conclusion of our broadcast in just a couple of minutes. to enjoy chess? Check out our schedule of chess.com community events today. Mondays, play rapid opening roulette and expand your opening repertoire with a new opening each month. Tuesdays, compete against other untitled players in Untitled Tuesday. Battle your way to the top in Arena Kings on Wednesdays. Join the crazy fun of the Variance Community Series each Thursday and finish the week off each Saturday with the blistering Community Bullet Brawl. All happening in the Community Club on Chess.com. Welcome, everyone. We are here with Judith Polgar, the legendary chess player, one of the greatest chess players of all time. And I went my next move. I said, no, I'm not moving my queen. I'm not moving my bishop. But actually, I'm going to give checkmate or winning great material. And I went 93. It works only that way. If you are an attacker, you sacrifice something, go all the way until the end. Don't chicken out in the meantime. 
at some point because many times there is a point there is no way back it's only forward how is it to play with Kasparov when you saw him personally he really had this incredible energy Judith thank you so much for being with us and I hope you're hope you're ready to to dive into the past with us oh absolutely I'm very happy to share with you some of my most memorable games Hello everyone and welcome back to round six of the 2024 FIDE candidates out in Toronto. We've just finished a really exciting round, some blistering games as we're becoming used to at this point. And one of the highlights was a victory for Vidit with White against Alareza Ferruja. So let's jump in, do a bit of a deep dive on that game. And uh, it did start with one of the most exciting openings in chess, at least from a spectator's point of view, the Open Sicilian. Uh, we saw this actually a few months ago when Vidit defeated Ferruja in the Tata Steel Masters. And in that game, uh, it was a slightly different branch, but here Ferruja tried to surprise Vidit with the classical variation. But uh, of course, Vidit, one of the best prepared players out there in the world, uh, he knew what to do. Bishop c4, a very trendy move, an old move that's come back into fashion lately. And Queen to b6, an attempt to destabilize White's knight in the center. In the open Sicilian, often you don't want to take a step back. You don't necessarily want to retreat, but here Vidit does make an exception. And due to the fact that the Black Queen is vulnerable, uh, Black will have to lose some time with her, as we'll shortly see. So uh, after pawn to e6, white develops not to attack the Black Queen, instead attacking another weakness, the d6 pawn, which really comes back to haunt Black. Uh, later, queen to d8 now. This move was questioned by various players uh, in the aftermath of this game. Uh, perhaps instead, Black should have considered the move knight to e5, where I uh, I think there is a lot of theory, but perhaps wanting to surprise his opponent yet again, Alareza went his own way. A really uh, creative move, queen d8, but unfortunately, just losing a bit of time. This queen's already moved twice, and she will soon move again. So white uses that time to develop. We see uh, pawn to a3, a move that really impressed me. It made a big impression here. This is prophylaxis, looking into the future, knowing what your opponent wants and stopping it in advance. Uh, if white, for example, had castled the king, then after pawn to b5, the bishop moves, 
pawn to b4 would have been a really annoying blow, kicking the white knight away and uh, potentially uh, snacking on this pawn next. So Vidit, he saw this in advance, of course, and uh, pawn to a3, even before he gets attacked, he prevents this advance. So uh, covering the b4 square. Uh, bishop to b7 now was given a question mark by the computer, and uh, I think rightfully so. Sometimes we question the computer evaluation or uh, we think, okay, at least it's a very human move. And yes, bishop b7 develops, but it uh, neglects the most important feature in black's position, the fact that the d6 pawn is vulnerable. Ferruja was blitzing still at the stage, despite the fact his position is already uh, kind of teetering on a precipice here. Uh, instead, perhaps again, just uh, developing bishop e7, getting ready to block with knight to e5, just uh, uh, relieving some of the pressure on this d6 pawn was necessary. Instead, after bishop to b7, white castles kingside, we did see that the tactics started working in white's favor. A really nice variation pointed out by our very own Daniel Naroditsky was that uh, knight e5 now, the desirable move, uh, blocking this bishop, fails to knight takes b5, a really nice blow if this knight is captured. Then the black knight is captured, a deadly check arrives on b5, and if the black king moves, a uh, second deadly check. This actually leads to checkmate on the next turn. So unfortunately for black, no natural way to defend if we go back to the game position. Instead, Ferruja had to perform some gymnastics with his queen. Uh, the queen sliding out to b6. Don't take this pawn now, it is poisoned. After bishop takes d6, black could have castled uh, with a nasty pin on the d-file, and suddenly black is right back in the game. But of course, Vidit spotted this, instead very calmly throwing his pawn forward to g4. Remember, this is a Sicilian defense, an open Sicilian. It's all about speed. It's a race of attacks. And here, white's king, super safe, guarded by its knights. White's pawns, meanwhile, are about to destabilize the black knights. And once this black knight, for example, is kicked back to d7, then white will be safely able to capture on d6. And here, Ferruja perhaps flustered by his uh, subpar opening, knowing he was already on the back foot, facing a scary attack. He got a bit impatient, and after just a few minutes of thought, he played the incredible queen takes f2. A mistake, very brave, but unfortunately, it does miss some tactics. Instead, perhaps he should have uh, essayed the karma, uh, pawn to h6, just slowing down white's attack slightly, and uh, Vidit here would still have to show great technique to prove his advantage. Instead, queen takes f2, um, if we go back to the game, was played and he was punished instantly. Vidit, a man on form here, found e5. We tell, uh, we tell players, especially when they're starting the game, always look for forcing moves first. e5 is a very forcing move, it's a threat. It attacks not just the knight on f6, it, uh, also the pawn on d6. And unfortunately, black is just underdeveloped. The black king is stuck in the center and uh, this is highlighted in two key variations. Firstly, if knight takes pawn on e5, boom, bishop takes b5 is a check. Uh, not just a check, but next move, once the bishop is captured, white will win the black queen. Loose pieces drop off, as they say, the black queen is undefended, stuck behind enemy lines. If instead pawn takes e5, then the white bishop saves itself with gain of time, with gain of tempo, hitting the black queen. No matter where she goes now, uh, there is disaster in black's future. Queen to g2 would see the queen getting trapped. Uh, on the edge of the board, we see the white rook chase her uh, into oblivion here, and she falls prey to the white bishop. Uh, black would lose material, and uh, likewise, if she had chosen uh, the h4 square in this position, disaster in a different direction. Bishop to g5, hitting the queen, and the simple bishop takes f6, showing why castling the king is so important in any opening. Suddenly, checkmate on the board. So uh, Ferruja, unfortunately, realizing the damage he'd done to his own position here, he had to retreat. And after the simple pawn takes d6, a very classy calm move from Vidit, I think Ferruja here realized the uh, damage that had been done. Black simply cannot move his bishop out. If he cannot move his bishop out, he cannot castle his king. The black queen as well, at risk of being trapped. Uh, so she retreated back to b6, not for the first time in this game. And uh, after bishop e3, Again, retreating back to d8, not for the first time in this game. Suddenly, all the black pieces asleep on the back rank. It's unsurprising that the tactics work in white's favor. Rook f1, improving the pieces, uh, bringing all the pieces to the party. Look at white's nice centralization. Um, here, Ferruja defended very well. He centralized his knight, and he played the move rook to c8. And Vidit jumped on the opportunity to uh, leap into the black position. Queen a7, hitting this black bishop. Uh, potentially as well, eyeing up some of the black pawns. 
Perhaps Ferruccio could have defended more resolutely here. He still had a lot of time on his clock, but bishop to c6 was refuted by the very nice queen takes pawn. Simply greed being good in this scenario. The queen not trapped, as we saw on the next move. Rook to a8, and uh, Vidit at a crossroads found the best move. He likened this to a move Karpov once played against Unzika uh, in a totally different type of position, but uh, effective nonetheless. This attack on the queen, the queen is trapped, but it was blocked with bishop to a7. If instead white had played knight takes b5, we would have seen a far murkier position. Uh, yes, white wins the queen back. It's only a temporary sacrifice, but uh, bishop b7 here or rook to a8 would have defended the rook and prevented white from promoting. And uh, this position is a bit irrational. Instead, uh, if we go back, bishop to a7 keeps everything covered, white's queen safe, and the black b pawn the next to fall. Not only is white attacking, white has two extra pawns now. Finally, Ferruja able to deliver a check and able to, ooh, me and my arrows, <laughs> first a check. Uh, next, he was able to castle his king, but uh, it, unfortunately, it wasn't enough. Vidit now, with a two-pawn advantage, was able to consolidate knight c7, hitting this rook. The rook didn't move. Instead, playing for tricks here, Ferruja, he tried to take a pawn, coming in with his knight, but another really classy moment from Vidit after taking this rook in the corner. Some issues potentially with a pin. Uh, the white bishop looks like it's immobilized. The white queen looks like she's stuck defending that bishop. But queen to e2, I think this was the move that really secured the victory, uh, counterattacking against the black knight. And uh, as we saw a few moves later, white is simply a rook for bishop up. And look at these four pass pawns in conjunction. White's king, super safe as well. Um, just no hope for Ferruja. Let's fast forward towards the end. Queen c4, another uh, kind of nail in the coffin here, queen c7 coming in, kicking away the blockader of white's past d pawn. And uh, after queen to b7, the queen did enter. Ferruja tried to put up some resistance, tried to create some threats, but Vidit, again, calm defense, putting his rook on a safe defended square. The white king has a safe haven hiding on a2 and uh, not falling for the last trick. This threat of checkmate, the last move that uh, really secured the victory was at this moment. Firstly, king a2. And then Cemento, pawn to c3, blocking the diagonal, uh, securing the king, stopping any tricks. And often in chess, we need to find the clearest way to uh, victory. We need to avoid all counterplay from the opponent. Why not simplify? You're already up. It's a mathematical equation here. You're up a material. Why not get rid of Black's strongest piece, the knight? And uh, it was at this point, as they reach move 40, after knight to d4, that Ferruja finally resigned. Vidit had been in time trouble, but he negotiated it well. Knight c6 is coming in. Ideas of queen to c8. Black's blockade will not last. A great win for Vidit, who moves up to 50%, three points out of six. Meanwhile, a disappointing game and a continuation of a disappointing tournament for Alareza Ferruja. But uh, that was one of the highlights of round six. Wow, David, I'm speechless. That was so well done especially after a long broadcast. Uh, amazing summary of the game of the day, one of two decisive results as we look at the results of today's bloodbath, Pragnananda, the other hero, and a great day for Indian fans. Uh, the third Indian contender, Gukesh, drawing Hikaru Nakamura, who demonstrates some really nice opening preparation, drawing from a position of strength, and really the only snooze fest of the day, if one can call it that, was the quick draw between Fabiano and Jan Nepomnishi. Jan choosing a strategy of not pressing his luck, maintaining his hold on the tournament leadership role for the time being. Uh, and Gukesh, stride for stride with a draw, also tied for the lead as we look at the standings. Nobody joining them just yet, but Pragnananda, Peter, moving up in the standings. So exciting to watch him go. Absolutely. Yeah, this is... Uh... This whole tournament shows that why we are so excited about Pragnanda, yeah? that he shows some incredible preparation, he shows some crazy tactical vision, then today he plays a strategical masterpiece at the end, in time table he shows some incredible uh, kind of tactical vision, all this geometry, everything with Knight D7, that was true art, it was so nice to see, and He's up there. He's just half a point behind the leaders. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. Those are wise words indeed. Well, let's take a look at what will happen uh, tomorrow. Here are the pairings. No rest for the weary. We've got Hikaru versus Nepo, um, another matchup that has been very close uh, through the years. You can see their head-to-head -head is all tied up. 
It'll be Fabiano versus Prognananda. We might see more exciting prep uh, with the black pieces. What will we see, especially if Fabi starts the game with one E4? Abasa has the white pieces against Vidit and Perugia trying to get out of a tailspin and he better do it fast because his game against Gukesh is very high stakes, David, not just for his emotional mental state, but also for the tournament standings. Gukesh is tied for the lead. Yeah, some uh, massive games for tomorrow. You would think that Hikaru has big ambitions. He does face one of the leaders. He can catch up with Yanda Pomnishi with a victory. And uh, there has been some blood spilled in their encounters before. Uh, I want to point out we're reaching the halfway stage tomorrow. So uh, this is the final kind of new set of encounters where everyone will have faced everyone. Um, so definitely they want to set out some statements, put down some markers. I want to point out one final quirk. Nijat Abasov, um, he's struggling at the moment. He is the lowest seed, but he does have a 2-0 to zero lifetime score against Vidit. Um, I think those games were a long time ago. Uh, they're roughly similar age, but uh, at least reason for optimism for Abasov. Indeed. Round seven comes your way tomorrow uh, at the same time, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. After that, there is a rest day to mark the halfway point of this marathon event. And as David pointed out, everything begins again on April the 13th round. Is that Friday the 13th? No, it's Saturday the 13th. So perhaps a lucky day for some players, an unlucky day for others, but that is far into the future right now. It's time for some players to rest and recuperate, try to get back into that positive mindset. And for players like Pragnananda and Nakamura, try to keep riding that momentum going into the halfway point of the event. Peter, before we wrap up the show for good, I'll throw the mic to you one more time. What are you looking forward to tomorrow? Uh, what should the diligent chess fan be aware of? What are the big storylines we should keep track of going into the halfway point of this 2024 candidates tournament? Well, it is the candidates. We see every single day the incredible fighting spirit, the will to go for the maximum. And uh, we have just seen the pairings for tomorrow. Honestly, I can't wait. Why do we have to wait almost 24 hours to, for the action to continue? Because I, I really can't really wait. So many storylines everywhere. Of course, now also Ali Reza, he needs to calm down. He needs to forget. He needs to put everything behind him because uh, he can start playing spoilers. Yeah, And if he starts to, to spoil tournaments of the others, he might actually get this mental state that he requires to, to mount an epic comeback. Of course, minus three is, is tragic. Uh, Jan Yapomnashi with plus two and Gukesh sitting very comfortably, but just one loss and all the other guys are catching up. Uh, Pragnananda uh, is there with uh, plus one and Fabiano facing each other. I mean, what kind of storylines uh, story can we even ask for? It's just fantastic. Just amazing, amazing stuff. And we will have to wait, but not for too long because the next round comes your way at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow, Thursday. And on that note, folks, it's been a great pleasure covering round six. We congratulate the winners and wish a quick emotional recovery to the losers. Thank you to our amazing team at chess.com and everybody who tuned in on a busy workday to watch these proceedings. Above all else, thank you to my fellow commentators for Grandmaster David Howell. Again, that was a legendary recap. Um, I'm sure both of you, it's later for you than it is for me. And Grandmaster Peter Leko, I am GM Daniel Naraditsky. It's been a pleasure. We will see you tomorrow at 2.30 for round seven. And on that note, have a great rest of your Wednesday. The candidates returns with round seven, manana. So long.